Good morning. Um, I would like to welcome everyone um, who is here in person and also for those who are joining us um, on the webcast um, to our public workshop, Medication Adherence, Landscape, Strategies and Evaluation Methods. This workshop is convened uh, by the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy under a cooperative agreement with the FDA. My name is Marta Voshinska, and I'm the Deputy Director for Policy at the Duke Margolis Center. Um, I have recently stepped into the large shoes uh, of Greg Daniel, um, many of whom you may know. So in today's discussion, we're going to tackle a very important topic for the FDA, medication adherence, and the extent to which patients are taking medications as prescribed by their provider. Medication adherence is an essential part of ensuring the safe and effective use of uh, drugs. Medication adherence is not only important for individual patient health, but also because of drug resistance for population health. While the public health benefits of medication adherence are clear, identifying non-adherence and improving adherence to medications um, can be very challenging given the wide range of medication taking behaviors and factors that influence uh, these behaviors. Throughout the discussion today, we are exploring key barriers and interventions, uh, many of which are technological. We will also take a deeper dive into metrics that are used to track or monitor adherence and to study designs to evaluate their impact on interventions. So what is an appropriate level of adherence? Is there a standard threshold that can be applied or does it depend on the therapeutic context? How can we evaluate whether there has been an improvement with adherence? Can we determine if improved adherence has had an impact on clinical outcomes? All of today's sessions uh, will be moderated by Hayden Bosworth. Hayden is a healthcare, um, health services researcher. He's a professor of population health sciences, medicine, psychiatry, and nursing at Duke University Medical Center. He's vice chair of education in the Department of Population Health Sciences. He's also the deputy director of the Center for Health Service, uh, health Service Research in Primary Care Center of Innovation, COIN, at the Durham VA Medical Center. And he's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Health Policy Administration in the School of Public Policy at UNC. Many of you in this room have previously worked with Hayden um, or heard him speak at other conferences on medication adherence, and so we're very excited to have him uh, join us here. So first, uh, a little bit of an overview for the agenda and a few house housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, we will start the day with remarks from Jacqueline Corgan Curry, who will provide FDA's perspective on the topic that we're tackling today. Jacqueline will be followed by Andrew Peterson of University of the Sciences in Philadelphia. Andrew will tee up the key questions and discussion topics for our panels um, throughout the day. We will lead into our first break at 1030. We will then be back for a second panel discussion at 1045 to discuss interventions to track and improve adherence. We will then break for lunch and lunch will be on your own. We will reconvene at one for our third session where we will um, dive into the challenges of measuring and evaluating medication adherence. We will take our final break at 2.30. At 2.45, our final session will address study designs that can help evaluate tracking of medication adherence, improvements in adherence, and impact on clinical outcomes. And then we will adjourn at 4.30 p.m. And uh, last, a couple of um, housekeeping items. I want to remind everyone that this is a public meeting that is also being webcast online. The record of the webcast will be available on the Duke Margolis website following the event. We will also be tweeting uh, the event throughout the day and please feel free to follow along on the Twitter handle at Duke Margolis and hashtag medication, med, I'm sorry, medadherence2019. This meeting is intended to spur discussion and we're not looking to achieve consensus today, but rather to hear a variety of perspectives. To this end, we have reserved time throughout the day for participants in the audience uh, to make comments and ask questions um, during the moderated discussion. And as a heads up to speakers and panelists, Haley Sullivan will be keeping us on track um, with signs to indicate how much time is left in your presentation. And feel free to help yourself to coffee and beverage throughout the day. 
Uh, they're located right outside the room and a reminder lunch will be on your own but uh, staff event staff at the registration desk can help you find some good options nearby and we will be promptly starting at 1 p.m so uh, uh, so with that um, i am very uh, pleased to introduce jacqueline corrigan Karai. Uh, who is the director of the Office of Medical Policy at uh, CEDAR FDA, and she will provide opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Marta, for that kind introduction, and thank everyone for being here. I really want to thank all our invited speakers and panelists. I know you've done a lot of preparation leading up to this, and we're looking forward to hearing from you today, everyone who's in the room, those online, and especially the patient and patient representatives for your interest in this topic that we're very excited to have a good discussion about. You know, we're defining medication adherence as the extent to which patients take their medication prescribed in agreement with their health care provider. And of course, as we all realize, it's an important and ongoing public health priority. You know, it's essential to really ensuring safe and effective use. That's how we test our medications when patients take them in a certain way. And to quote our former Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Koop, drugs don't work and people don't take them. But it's not easy. You know, we're sort of caught in this wonderful time when we have all these new medications that are so effective and really are helping us control diseases and even prevent diseases. But what does that mean for the average patient? So take a, let's say you're a man. Let's say you have a little bit of diabetes. Let's say you've had that diabetes for 10 years. So maybe I started you on one medication 10 years ago. Now it's a little less controlled, so you're on a second diabetes med because it also might control your cardiovascular risk. Maybe you've got some blood pressure with that, so I've started you on an ACE inhibitor, but that's not quite enough, so we've added maybe a diuretic, so we're now up to four, right? You're a diabetic over 40, maybe you're on a statin. Maybe we decide to put you on an aspirin for primary prevention. Maybe you're lactose intolerance and you're on vitamin D. Maybe you've got cranky knees after your football injury and you're on Tylenol. So you can see just two medical conditions or three, it gets incredibly complex for patients. So it's important to the patients, but it's also difficult. But it's also a concern to their providers. It's a concern to our healthcare systems, and it has a major impact on health-related outcomes. So there's now, there's always been considerable interest in this issue, but now we have new tools. We all carry around the ubiquitous computer we call our cell phone. And people are thinking about now how do we create and get more creative about medication adherence. We can add sensors. We've seen sensors added to the devices that deliver medications. We've seen sensors ingested with medications as a way to track how patients are taking their meds. So as we think about how we're going to improve adherence, we also need to understand there's a lot of different approaches. How do we evaluate these approaches? How, which ones are effective? Which ones are meaningful? We don't want to add more complexity without any benefit. And there are methodological challenges, and Marta sort of alluded to those, and I know we're going to get into those today. They include which populations do we do? How do we look at a control group that isn't, we're not intervening and measure their adherence if we're not really intervening with that group? How do we look at short-term versus long-term? What's meaningful when you have a chronic medicine that we hope to take for the rest of your life? So today we're here to really learn and leverage our experiences to better understand the opportunities and challenges of implementing and evaluating interventions intended to track medication adherence improve it, and improve clinical outcomes, which is ultimately what we would like to get to. Today's workshop is timely. It really aligns with a convergence of interests and capabilities for evaluating and enhancing medication adherence. We are happy that all of you really bring a distinctive set of knowledge and experiences to the table, and we're really looking forward to understanding all these different perspectives. And we hope to leave here today that this public meeting will really serve as a source of innovation towards improving medication adherence, public health, and ultimately patients' lives, because that's why we're all here today. So I'm not going to take any more time because I want to hear from everyone else. Um, so I will turn the uh, table over to our first speaker. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am not the first speaker. 
um, but I am Hayden Bosworth. I'll be with you throughout the day, uh, your moderator. So, um, but thank you, Jacqueline, for the introduction and discussion. Um, and I think uh, I'll help try to facilitate uh, conversation throughout the day. I think this is a really extremely important topic. I think it's probably one of the largest public health issues uh, when you frame it within terms of safety, costs, implications. Uh, so very excited to be here with you all, um, but I um, want to hear more from you. So before uh, I'll keep my comments minimal, but I'd like to introduce Andrew Peterson. Andrew is the Executive Director of the Substance Use Disorders Institute and the John Wyeth Dean Emer Emeritus at the University of Science in Philadelphia. He's also a Professor of Clinical Pharmacy and Professor of Health Policy and previously served as a Dean of the Mays College of Healthcare Business and Policy. Um, I've known Andrew and his work, particularly with ISPOR and defining medication here, and so it's great to have him start uh, the conversation and level the field and have us start with a, a certain level of foundation. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Andrew and have him come up. Thanks. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Hayden. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see a lot of my colleagues here in the uh, audience again. And I'm uh, very grateful and honored to be here to kind of begin to uh, set the stage. So let me see if I can do this right. Yeah, I can click it. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so my job today is begin to kind of set the stage for the conversations that we have about medication adherence today. Uh, they asked me to do an overview of medication adherence in about uh, 15 minutes. That's probably impossible. <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to do the best to make sure that we actually have a, a common language that we begin to talk about and then begin to uh, tee up some of the questions and discussions that we're going to have uh, during the course of the day. So um, I want to start off pretty briefly with some definitions of medication adherence. We've heard one of them already, adherence, the extent to which a person's behavior, uh, and this is a broader one, taking medication, following a diet or uh, executing lifestyle changes corresponds with agreed upon recommendations from a healthcare provider. Adherence is the common language that we talk about now, but it started out with years ago as medication compliance. Uh, and it's, uh, compliance has gone out of favor because people would consider that to be a little bit demeaning when we ask people to comply or be obedient with a, a healthcare uh, provider's uh, recommendations or orders in that respect. So uh, we will use, and people use medication adherence and compliance uh, interchangeably, uh, but the a little bit more nicer term is uh, medication adherence. But when we talk about adherence, we also talk about a few other terms. You'll hear things like uh, persistence and concordance. Persistence actually introduces an, an element of time, the length of treatment as a factor. And I want to give you an example. A, a person who is persistent with their medication really has a, a strong intent to make sure that they adhere or comply with the recommendations, but don't always meet them. And an example is somebody who is uh, taking medications, one of those seven or eight medications that our uh, FDA colleague had talked about, uh, and maybe they can't afford that one. Uh, and they start taking it, uh, it was prescribed every single day, but because it's so expensive, they start taking it every other day. And for a statin, it might be a little bit more forgiving so that they, uh, it's not going to affect them too much, but it still might. But their adherence is only about half now but they are still persistent. There is an intention that they want to be able to adhere or to comply. And that's a very important concept that we need to consider because that person's uh, behavior is uh, Im important, is key to his or her success. And we, as healthcare practitioners and policymakers, have to understand what are some of those barriers that are uh, preventing that person from taking that medication as originally prescribed. They have that intention, so that's a good thing, but they may not be able to comply with it. Concordance is uh, a term that is a little bit broader, uh, it implies trust, agreement, harmony, uh, puts the patient as a decision maker. It's not as popular, but you will see, uh, particularly with some of the older uh, European literature and other literature, uh, the concordance with a, an agreement or a medication regimen uh, is an important one. So those are kind of four terms that we will talk about, or people might talk about. There's other terminologies, uh, abandonment, discontinuation, implementation, initial adherence. There are so many different terms that are out there, and we're going to kind of talk a little bit about them, and my colleague uh, Bernard Virgen probably is going to address some of those later on today. 
But I want us to understand that abandonment and uh, initial medication adherence or therapeutic alliance all refer to that medication taken behavior that a person has, and they are just nuanced or different aspects of it. So as we think about this, we just need to understand that when we are talking about patients, we're, we're talking about these terms, we're talking about patients. Um, Bernard will probably go a little bit more into this later, but the ABC taxonomy, the ABC is ascertaining barriers for compliance. This group uh, of individuals um, put together a nice taxonomy of uh, all of these terms, or m many of these terms. So um, uh, adherence to medication is across the top. We have persistence and non-persistence, but they introduce terms like initiation, uh, implementation and discontinuation of therapy. So uh, there are different behaviors that go with initiation, different behaviors that go with implementation, different behaviors that go with uh, discontinuation of therapy. And there are also other behaviors where people uh, take their medication to begin with, that initial medication compliance or primary uh, adherence, so getting that prescription to the pharmacy. So all of these uh, kind of combined together to bigger picture of what the patient is actually doing, that medication taking behavior. So the big thing I want us to think about is all of these words and terms. We are looking at uh, metrics, we're looking at terminology, we're really talking about a patient and a patient's behavior. So as I don't want us to get lost in that, as we are hearing some of the discussions today, I want us to realize that whatever we're talking about this, we are talking about an individual patient, and then that individual patient is part of a population of people. And as an individual, they behave one way, and then as a population, they may actually behave in a different way. And we have to understand the differences and the impact of systems that would, uh, systems changes that have on a population may or may not impact the individual patient the same way. So, uh, as we go through the day, there are four panels uh, coming up. We've got the barriers panel, the interventions panel, the measurement panel and the study designs panel. The document that you have here, the discussion guide, is a really nice overview of some of the concepts that I just talked about today, but it also has those uh, discussion questions and a little summary of what each of those panels is going to go through. So when you get a chance, if you're a, a reader, take a look through those, but I'm going to kind of address a couple of those as we go through now. I hope everybody did get a copy. If you didn't, they're out there. Okay. Um, the barriers panel, which I'm a uh, part of, which I'm very uh, glad to be, is going to talk about uh, barriers to medication adherence. When I think of barriers, I start thinking about money. I think people not being able to pay for it, or that they don't have the insurance to be able to pay for it, or they don't have access to it. They can't get to the pharmacy, they can't get to their uh, prescriber, or they can't get that refill, whatever it might be. But we also need to think about their ability to take that medication. Do they have the health literacy to be able to understand the directions? Do they have the ability to understand how to integrate those things within their lives? So those are some uh, barriers. So as we think about this, your the colleagues or the panel is going to talk about care coordination, about people who are getting medications from cardiologists, from pulmonologists, uh, from primary care specialists, people who are getting it from when they're being discharged from a hospital, when they're going home. So all of those care coordination pieces are part of those barriers. Medication synchronization, how do we align people's medications so that they can take them and get them refilled on a routine basis? What about pharmacy deserts, or places where there are no pharmacies or very few pharmacies around? What about the, the polypharmacy, that person with those two different diseases who are taking six or seven different medications. And then also we need to think about the symptom impact. Those people who may be in pain, who are depressed, or otherwise have other conditions that may have an impact on their willingness or ability to take medication. So we need to consider those barriers too. Come on. When we go on to the interventions, once we have identified some of those barriers, we need to think about interventions. Again, when I think about interventions, I think about reminder calls, and I think of apps, and I think of pill boxes, and I think of different packaging and switching drugs and things like that. But the interventions group is going to get a little bit more deeper and talk about some of those uh, thresholds and the analytics and the bigger concepts of behavioral economics and, and how does money influence behavior and how do behavior influence money. 
biosensors and what the, how they can be integrated into it. Comparative effectiveness in the research that we are doing along those lines and how do we use those real world data uh, to be able to do it. And then tailored interventions. How do we identify a specific intervention for a given patient? And remember that that patient intervention, what they needed today, may very well be different than what they need six or eight months from now because their life or their situation may have changed. So we need to think about all of those things. When we talk about the measurement panel, that measurement panel is going to uh, talk about claims data and sources of data. They're going to talk about subjective measures and objective measures. And they're going to talk about electronic monitoring and terminologies like NPR, PDC, et cetera. Again, some of those are defined within that document, but you're going to hear some of this language today that is going to talk about medication adherence. Our clinical trials panelists, they're going to talk about uh, optimal study designs. And this, uh, diagram here really just kind of gives you an idea of you know, high level evidence like clinical trials and lower level evidence of case reports. But I want to remind people that a case report is again about an individual patient. And sometimes when a, you're a practitioner, you're talking about an individual patient and how do you get that person to adhere to their medication. Mm -hmm. They're going to talk about implementation science, the idea of adopting uh, evidence-based practices to, in routine health care. That are going to talk about PRECI2, the Pragmatic Explanatory Continuum Indicator Summary, a scoring tool to kind of give an idea of what the... Uh, where the study lies on that pragmatic scale. We're going to talk about chronic disease states versus acute diseases. Medication adherence is different for people who have to take it for long term versus a short term. So we need to think about some of those things. But as we're going through all of those, I want us to remember what are we really looking for? To me, medication adherence in any of those measures is just an intermediate indicator. The purpose of improving somebody's medication adherence is that, that we improve their outcome. We lower their blood pressure, we give them less pain, they give them, we get them more morbidity, more better vision, no heart attacks or things like that. Those are the things that we're really looking for. I don't want us to kind of get lost in medication adherence only as the outcome. It is just a measure, an intermediate measure for what the real outcome is when we talk about it. When we're thinking about uh, issues during the day, to me, non-adherence is a sign of a bigger problem. The current measures only measures, uh, take a look at the symptoms of what that problem is. If somebody has gaps in their refills, if they're not refilling their medication every month and they're waiting six or seven days, maybe it's a money issue. Maybe it's an access issue. They can't get to it because they had to work a week of nights and they can't get to the pharmacy. Whatever it might be, those are just indicators. If somebody is discontinuing their medication, are they discontinued because of a side effect? Are they discontinued because there's no effect? Are they discontinued because their insurance stopped paying for it? So these indicators of medication non-adherence are really just signs of a bigger problem that's going on. And sometimes the current interventions that we have only address the symptom that is being measured. And I'll give you drug recalls uh, as another example. We had some uh, drug recalls and problems with uh, Zantac a couple of months ago. People kept calling pharmacies and said, do I keep taking them? And some people just stopped taking their medications because of it. And that was a system-wide problem that really stopped people from getting better. Other things to really think about as we do it, in the, that medication adherence is a very complex disease uh, state, if you want to call it a disease state. It, we're talking about people with multiple diseases, treated with multiple drugs, who have to take it multiple times a day. They each have varying behaviors and then varying health, uh, underlying health beliefs. And to me, one single measure of medication adherence cannot address the complexity of medication adherence. So do we need multiple measures for different things? Do we need a, a broader way of looking at those patients? So I want us to think about that as we talk about medication adherence today. Other things to think about are artificial intelligence and machine learning. Many of us wear Fitbits, we have uh, Google on our phones or uh, Siri or things like that, and, and people are collecting data about us all the time. And when I walk into Target or I go into uh, Amazon to buy something, uh, there are ads and things that are popping up on my phone or my computer predicting what I want based on my past behavior. Are we or should we be using 
not just the health information, but other information to be able to help predict when a person is going to be non-adherent and is there a way for us to intervene before they drop uh, into that non-adherent uh, vacuum. I also want us to think about something that's very dear, near and dear to my heart, and that's opioids. We have some really good treatment out there, methadone, buprenorphine, that helps to treat patients who are recovering from an opioid addiction. And they need this medication-based treatment so that they don't revert back to using heroin and taking an overdose and dying. But because of some of the systems and the policies that we have in place, people cannot get access to it or they have been limited in their access. And we have people who are taking buprenorphine for six weeks or 12 weeks, and then they are no longer eligible for it, or their healthcare provider says, nope, you're done, you should be off of it by now, and they want to take them off, and within weeks, they are now back to using heroin at their original dose, and many cases are dying. Medication adherence related to this, we don't focus on it, but medication adherence is potentially one of the solutions to the opioid crisis that we're experiencing. And I'm not sure if we can get this uh, pill pack, this video. There's, there's a video connected to that link. If, if not, that's okay. Uh, Amazon and pill pack. About a year and a half ago or so, uh, Amazon bought pill pack for $750 million. It is, medication adherence is a business. People know that it, it is worthwhile investing in. Pill pack is a company that can take those seven or eight medications and package them into, here you take it a Monday at eight o'clock, these are the three medications you need at 12 o'clock or one o'clock on uh, Tuesday, these are the four or five medications, and they package them up into little packages and deliver them to a patient's home. So we take away the multiple bottles that are in front of the person, we take away some of those other barriers that are there. I don't know, it may create other new problems that are going with it, but uh, the other pieces, we're giving uh, Amazon a lot of business, and they see this is a huge money maker. But there, we are moving and changing how we are delivering medications to patients. So as we think about medication adherence and our measurements and our studies and our trials, we need to think about not how we're doing it now, but how will medications be delivered to those patients in the future. So. We've got a lot of things that we're gonna uh, do today. We've got a lot of learning to do. So I'm hoping that we get the opportunity to today so that we can learn together how we can improve medication adherence in our patients. So thanks very much for your time. Okay, thanks Andrew. Uh, those in the back of the room, uh, feel free to come forward. Uh, we won't embarrass you because you came late or anything, but just uh, find space wherever. Um, so we're going to move on to session one, key barriers, uh, as uh, Andrew said. Just a couple quick comments, though, for us to think a little bit about. Are we going to, is there one solution to this probably huge public health problem? That's a question for you all, to make sure everyone's awake. There isn't going to be one solution, right? And so I think we need to understand that at some day we're going to, what we're looking at is maybe a toolbox. And I think part of that is, as we'll talk about barriers, multi-level, right? There's the patient, the family, the healthcare system, policy. All those are leverage points that we have to think about. The other point I just want to make is, is that uh, we've identified over 100 factors that are barriers to not adherence. So if we already know that there's a lot of problems there, uh, and each individual has their own issues. We need to think a little bit about how we tailor and personalize. We need to think about how our solutions fit into the system. Just because we can build something doesn't mean it's the right thing. And I have a slide that I usually use, which is the cart before the horse. And really thinking about using implementation science as we get into some of the methodology. How can we do this more effectively, more efficiently, and think of the context of how we put this in place? So um, I, I believe this is, again, as I said before, one of the largest, biggest public health issues. I also think uh, one thing for us perhaps to level the field, I think most of what we'll be talking about is um, chronic medication, but I think as Andrew mentioned, uh, when we talk about adherence, that also may be de-implementing, de-prescribing, taking away. So there's a lot more we can talk about, but I think for most of what we uh, will be talking today, it's the assumption that we're on 
uh, medications for chronic disease for a longer period of time. But I think in the back of your mind, think that there's also other examples that we should be thinking about. Okay, so let me, uh, very excited to introduce our panel. Um, I have a script. I feel like a, a mo real true moderator with this, so uh, I'll try to stick to this. Um, so um, we have uh, Michael Wolf, who's the James Webster Jr. Professor of Medicine and Director of the Center for Applied Health Research on Aging within the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. One thing you'll notice is, is that particularly those of us in academia, we have a lot of titles and uh, affiliations, uh, but uh, Mike is a really great guy and does really terrific work you'll see momentarily. Uh, David Evans is a public health consultant and patient advocate. We have Marie Brown, professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at Rush Medical College. She's a physician director of practice redesign for the American Medical Association and past governor of the American College of Physicians. Um, to her left, we have uh, Matthew Loper, who's the CEO and co-founder of Wealth. And then uh, you've already heard, but Andrew will uh, finish this up, and he's the executive director of the Substance Use Disorder Institute and the John Wythe Dean Emeritus at the University of Science in Philadelphia. Um, so the uh, panelists will give an overview, six to eight minutes. Uh, Haley will be, uh, she has a, uh, uh, a gong, so she will really hit, no, she'll, she'll um, bring it to your attention. Uh, and then we'll open it up for discussion afterwards, and I'll try to help facilitate that discussion. So, Mike, you're up. This is like speed dating for adherence. Um, so, uh, again, in six minutes or so, um, I'm just going to quickly walk through. Uh, this, is, this panel uh, is mostly focused on thinking about barriers and and I, I think Hayden said this uh, at the very start, that medication adherence I find so fascinating. Most of my work has been focused broadly in self-management of chronic disease, but it is what I would say arguably the most um, prevalent and also most dynamic health behavior. <laughs> and uh, when you start to deconstruct it, especially from the eyes of the patient, and this is not an exhaustive slide, but this is one I just con constantly have used when um, giving lectures in the medical school just to kind of say, let's just think about what it's like to have to take medication. And it requires, you know, uh, oftentimes adding, changing, removing medication to your regimen, thinking about someone like, you know, the average patient over 65 may be taking around several medications. You've got a multiple drug regimen with variable doses throughout the day. You've got uh, multiple devices possibly, so routes of administration may vary, and this is a big thing we always try to figure out, how do we assess the solid pills that you're taking in your organizer, but what about the insulin that you're also using? And, and that's become a big issue in terms of measurement. Tapered and escalating doses, uh, doses dependent on measurement. If you're looking to see you know, how much you weigh in the morning to figure out what uh, you know, your water pills that you're taking, your diuretics. Uh, daily versus non-daily medication, limited duration versus extended duration, the guest appearance medications or the pro or PRN meds that you kind of sprinkle in. I always say that my sister, uh, who's been living with lupus for over you know, two decades, uh, it wasn't until she went in for an elective surgery did she realize that maybe she doesn't need the 24 medications she's taking, including two proton pump inhibitors, uh, seasonal medications that she just kept taking over and over again and some over-the-counters. It's, you know, people have a very uh, unorganized, maybe um, unintentionally a disorganized way of thinking about all the medicines that they may be taking. Brand versus generic drugs, issues of trade dress where your medications may switch out because you just, uh, the pharmacy switched to a different generic make that looks like another medication you may be taking. And then unsynchronized uh, fills from pharmacy, thinking that patients have to go multiple times uh, to the pharmacy. Uh, and also, even right now, we're even looking with partnership with Walgreens, just how many patients are taking chronic meds that are still on 30-day fills. So this is a, just a very complicated behavior. Again, we know a lot about this. There are multiple systematic reviews that get at to the, the over 100 reasons why patients don't take medication. This is the WHO kind of model of trying to cluster the, the different factors that uh, go into what might affect patients taking medications. But again, in my six minutes, I'm going to focus on the way we've started to think about, and again, it's not an exhaustive way, but at least from a health system perspective, to start to find a way for us to get a clinical signal back to healthcare providers, especially in ambulatory care, as to why patients, uh, whether or not patients have an adherence concern. 
And specifically, we've been phenotyping patients based on at least trying to figure out if we can get some sort of clinical signal into whether or not someone has a concern. If someone expresses, if we do ask patients to self-report, we may trust them if they say they have a concern in the nature of what that concern may be, but maybe we need a little bit more information due to the social desirability of wanting to uh, feel like you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in terms of treatment and not necessarily rely on it. We've got multiple projects that either if there's a biomarker that you can couple it with to or using validated measures to start to try to figure out how we can, again, this is deviates a bit from WHO, but when you think of the nature of, of what we often face, the various cognitive, social, economic determinants of health, these are the factors that we see pop up the most, or at least what we can bucket into these six kind of phenotypes. Again, you may have multiple barriers in a patient, um, and they may evolve over time. But we do think about, you know, types of uh, examples that we see of one of the most common reasons why patients may not take medications. And again, I'm going to just, for this context, thinking about patients with not just one, but maybe multiple chronic conditions. Um, you have issues of memory. Again, it's a prospective memory task to have to remember to take something in the future. It's one of the reasons why we also see that the dose in the evening may be harder to take than the dose in the morning. Um, health literacy also has come into play. It's also quite related to cognitive factors. You've got issues uh, in psychological where it may be depression, it may be motivational factors. This big focus on patient activation right now uh, has really kind of started to think about patients' just engagement in their care in general. Acute changes in health status or complexity, which really tops the list in many, many cases. We're really focused on the increasing prevalence of polypharmacy with uh, demographic trends right now where patients, you could have more and more of your patients coming into primary care that are taking quite a bit of medications and actually taking a moment to thinking about how do you take your medication? How do you organize your daily schedule? Um, how do you manage to take medication? And we've shown in many states that patients will, uh, because we don't really talk about how you take your medication and all of your medicine, oftentimes they may have naive theories about whether or not medicines can be taken together and they may take medication throughout the day more often than they need to and that's not sustainable. Aspects of tangible support, do you have people that are helping you take your medications? What more they could be doing? Can we get that into, into play? Uh, costs and what we see oftentimes, even in some of the most high risk or, um, you know, uh, scenarios like in solid organ transplant, we've been constantly seeing patients, as many as you get a third of them, making trade-offs uh, due to the cost of some of their medications over time. The reason, and Hayden pointed this out, the reason why we care is because, uh, and as a joke at Northwestern, we, and I don't mean to out my own institution, but there's been some issues like people have thought that maybe um, we could start launching across all groups of patients things like text reminders because they're cheap. But, you know, imagine the patient who can't afford the medication getting a daily reminder that, hey, take the medication that you can't afford. We need to map solutions to problems. And so when we think throughout this day, um, if we do have a way to clinically get feedback into the delivery of care on if patients are having a problem, what the nature of that problem is, then maybe we can think of what's in our toolkit and deploy the right resources accordingly. So not to just think of it's a one size fits all solution. And I just throw a little bit of uh, some of the options we've kind of considered. And again, these are again, a short list of what I could fit in in six minutes. But uh, some of the things that we've been able to recognize are reasonable for us to be able to have at our fingertips to, to, to recognize. And maybe even, especially in depending on what practices you're thinking about, um, uh, who should be responding to the patient accordingly. So I'm going to pause right here and hopefully I stay within my time, but uh, move on to the next. Hi. One of the best things about being a patient advocate is I don't have to wear a tie, which is great. Um, let's see. How do I forward it? There we go. Um, this is hardly original, but um, the reason I put it up here, the fact that adherence really is an ecosystem, is that the moment that the person actually consumes the product, that's the furthest downstream. And if we don't change everything that's upstream, that can't change. And the other part of it is that often where that product gets taken is in this murky pond of things that we often don't measure as well. And I, I'm gonna argue that they're incredibly important um, but often unseen, not because the 
patient isn't aware of them or even their provider or pharmacist is because they were never measured in the first place. And if you don't measure something, it doesn't exist. As you know, at least as according to science. Oops, I don't know what I did. Can you go to the next slide? There we go. So what is beneath the surface? What is lurking in that pond that we often don't uh, address? Next slide. Uh, social isolation and stigma. I think these are incredibly important drivers of non-adherence that we often don't look at. Depression and anxiety has been mentioned. Um, insurance and provider churn. Um, one of the, the downsides of the Affordable Care Act is that oftentimes as the plans change, as the providers change, as the pharmacies change, it introduces a lot of complexity. And the thing about um, adherence is it's not just persistence with the medication, it's having enough persistence with the system to overcome the challenges that you might encounter in trying to get that medication in the first place. Um, it's also uncoordinated care, and we have some folks that are going to talk about that. And also something that has been my experience, and it has actually been one of the most important factors in my own adherence, is a failure to acknowledge the fact that it is the products that failed me, not the other way around. It's the systems that failed me, not the other way around. And when you have a provider who is able to be transparent and, and acknowledge, acknowledge those failures and work with you, it can make a huge difference. And so I want to just share my own personal experience as a patient in two different situations. In both cases, I was pre prescribed a, me uh, a medication in the same class. The first time around, I ended up having to go to a public health clinic, even though I had a pretty decent income and health insurance. But if you lived with a mental illness in New York City in the 1990s and early 2000s, try finding decent mental health care without paying out of pocket. No one accepted insurance. So barriers to medical medication that way. The pharmacy at the clinic that I went to was only open from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Try getting your medication if that's your only way to get access to the medication. I had a clinician who prescribed the medication that I was on, which caused me to gain 40 pounds in four months, who was insistent that the reason was because I had an increased appetite and was eating junk food late at night, because most of his other patients, as he said, that was the problem. In fact, that wasn't the problem. And subsequently, clinical research indicated that, no, there's probably other stuff going on that wasn't just the patient. The product was failing me. Fast forward, and so not surprisingly, after nine months with that provider and that medication, I took myself off. And I think that was a reasonably rational choice at that time, but therefore I fell into that class of, of, of uh, patient who was non-persistent. Now fast forward a number of years, I'm taking something in the same class of medication, only this time the side effect is facial tics and fidgetiness of my legs that is so bad that I would sit on these panels and I would be fidgeting so bad the table would shake. And the person next to me would be like, whoa, whoa. The problem is if you're living with a mental illness and the stigma is so intense, especially if you're trying to, to, to be in a public capacity, how are you supposed to admit the fact that, oh, I'm taking a medication that causes me to fidget so bad I'm causing the table to shake? So the other, the, what happened though was that the provider that I had acknowledged that the product was the problem. The provider was willing to try and give me prescriptions that would help me manage those problems. Unfortunately, the prescriptions meant I had to take medication three times a day. Let's not talk about the nighttime dose. What about the afternoon dose? I don't know how many of you can do that. Um, unfortunately, those products didn't work, and the thing that I was dealing with meant that I could have permanent problems. Ultimately, I did go off of that medication. We were lucky enough to find another one, but I persisted with that medication for four and a half years, and that was because the provider worked with me. And the problem is that if we're not measuring those things, stigma, social isolation, provider relationship, along with these other factors, we're gonna miss something important. And the reason I say that is not to scold, because if you're here, obviously you care. If you're watching, you care. I say that because if we're not measuring the right things in the right order, we're gonna miss them. And our interventions to aid adherence won't be effective and they won't be replicatable in additional studies. So I think that's incredibly important from a scientific perspective. Next slide. So patients, providers, and pills, which ones do we measure first? Do we measure them alone? 
in what combinations, and how do we measure some of these other, quote, murky or soft science issues that sometimes can really drive non-adherence or persistence, but we don't know about it because we don't look at it. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. I'm Marie Brown, and excuse me, I have a little cold coming back from Chicago, so bear with me. Um, I'm a practicing physician, and I'm going to give you the perspective, hopefully, if the video works, of some patients, as well as my perspective as a physician for 30 years. Uh, grew up in a, an environment where, in a learning environment where the worst you could say about a patient was they're non-compliant, right? They were bad people. And if you go back in time, why was that culture? And that was because uh, in the days of tuberculosis, uh, people could be put in jail if they were non-compliant. They were public enemy number one if they got on a bus. And that attitude has pervaded uh, some of uh, the work that all of us do. Uh, so it isn't the patient's fault. Um, and hopefully I'll share, and our patients will, my patients will share some of their uh, uh, reasons, uh, very rational reasons for not taking their medicine. You'll hear a lot about the World Health Organization, and I love uh, what they, they say about medication adherence, and that is that increasing medication adherence may have a greater impact on the population of society than any improvements in any medical therapy. Because we know that 50 to 80% of patients are not taking their blood pressure medicine. It is huge. So focusing on medication adherence and fixing that before we reach for the third or fourth line drug, because in my experience as a physician for 30 years, the patients are not taking the first line drug. But the problem is that we are not discovering it. Talk about going upstream. We have encouraged our patients or admonished them so severely that they will not share with us their true medication-taking behavior. And that's what I'm, I'd like to focus on. So forgetfulness is a lot of what many of you um, online and here in the room are focusing on. And texting and innovative ways to help people remember is important. But it is not the vast majority. It is more than half of patients. It's not forgetfulness. But patients hide their non-adherence for a wide variety of reasons, and mostly because we, in healthcare, have encouraged them to hide their non-adherence. We have yelled at them. We have made them feel foolish. We have admonished them if they tell us that they're not taking their medicine. Because we care. We care deeply. So patients tell us what we want to hear, and that's called social desirability bias. Right? So hopefully, if the video, we have a one-and-a-half-minute video, I had the opportunity to work with the American College of Physicians and interview my patients who I had a deep relationship with, a long relationship, 10 or 20 years, many of whom hid their non-adherence from me for years. And I asked them if they would share some of their um, experiences. Just, just hit the button. Cholesterol is, cholesterol is over 300, and my LDL is 200 something, and it's really important. And I'm two years older now than my mother was when she had her first heart attack, and so it's very scary. I wouldn't take it on a regular basis, and then I would see you, and I would. Um, let you know that I'd sort of been taking it. Basically, they will ask um, if you're taking the medication. I would tell them yes. However, in fact, it would be um, the frequency of me taking it. I probably missed it for a month or two, um, but I still considered myself taking it. Okay. And they didn't know. Correct. I think they need to get a little bit more detail in their questioning, because if you give yes or no questions, that's what you're going to get. Over the last couple of years, my Glucose numbers are up like a yo-yo, <laughs> like a SPC chart that we use at the job. <laughs> Trying to stay in the middle, but you're above, you're below, then you come back, so. I, I guess I was in denial until I learned that if 
I didn't take my blood pressure medicine, and my pressure goes so high that I could have a stroke or die. Dying doesn't bother me. Having a stroke and being dependent on somebody else really, really is not something I want to have to do. Don't put so much you know, blame on them to take the medicine. I mean, you know, I mean to pressure, I'm going to say, to t for them to take the medicine. Just explain how good it is, how beneficial it will be for them in the long run. And how do you build, how, do we, how should we try to build trust with, with patients? Hmm. I can only say time. I, it, that's the only way I can see it. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way you develop, that's the way you build a friendship outside of the doctor-patient mm -hmm. relationship is time. They're fantastic. So those are real patients. The legends at the bottom are real. Uh, the last patient I saw actually during my clinic on Friday, she's well, she's only on one medicine, and you can see that was almost 20 years ago. And she came in and for years to, was, came to me on three or four medicines. She wasn't taking any of them. Uh, because when, if she did, she felt badly because she was all or none. So. Um, I want to share that really a non-adherent personality is, it does not exist. And contrary to many of my colleagues in healthcare, uh, many physicians, many clinicians think it's a type of personality, a socioeconomic um, issue, and it is not. Um, it is unrelated to self-care and lifestyle. And there's no consistent relationship between demographic characteristics and adherence. And sadly, that is not well known or appreciated um, amongst uh, healthcare. It is truly a decision making process. And as Hayden said, this is, and Andrew, this is one patient, and their reason for not taking their medicine is powerful. And unless we find out what that reason is, we cannot tailor the message. But first, we have to uncover that they're not taking their medicine. So I look at the obstacles in this way, intentional and unintentional. And the unintentional are forgetting cost access. But when 80% of medicines are now generic, cost fortunately has become less of an issue. Certainly not with more complicated and solid organ transplant, but for hypertension and diabetes, cost fortunately has not become, uh, is not as much a barrier. Confusion and work restrictions. The patient who was on 22 pills drives a bus in Chicago, and she cannot be on insulin. Right? So that was one of the reasons there. But focus on the intentional causes, the vast majority. And I'll highlight more about mistrust. But fear, when patients come to me, when a cardiologist or someone else has started a medicine, they'll say, sure, I'll take it. But they come to me as the primary care doctor, as the internist, say, well, I didn't start it in a talk un until I talked with you. Because they don't have a relationship with that other doctor. But what is happening in healthcare is the burden of regulatory and documentation that that 20-minute visit is now primarily with our back to the patient documenting on the computer. We know that for every one hour of face-to-face -face time with a patient, it's two hours of documentation time. So where we weren't good at this 10 or 15 years ago, the time to develop that trusting relationship, it continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller. There is no time to develop that relationship, to talk about how bad the bears or the cubs are, to hear and see pictures of the grandchild, to develop that relationship, to overcome the distrust that the patient brings to us because of Tuskegee, because of the history of some of what our patients have been through. So I'd like to focus my last slide, second to last slide, on trust. We can be the most competent uh, person and clinician in the world. You see on the x-axis, low to high. And if you ask a medical student what do they want to be, respected or trusted, many of us would probably say respected. As you see on the uh, y-axis, you have to have time to show that you deeply care. You have to demonstrate that you sincerely care about the person in front of you. Only when you show that you care and you show that you're competent will you develop the trust. 
that will allow the patient to overcome uh, their maybe cultural distrust and see you as someone who deeply cares and has their uh, health first and foremost. So I find that trusting, and I had to change. I had to understand that the patient had very good reasons for not taking their medicine. I had to change before I was able to help my patients comfortably share with me that they were not taking their medicine, and then try to figure out what the reasons were. And again, there'll be 100, if you have 100 patients, there'll be 100 different reasons. All fascinating, very interesting, and very rational. We must remove the structural and organizational barriers. We must develop the time and get rid of some of the regulation documentation, over-interpretation of the rules that are keeping our clinicians, our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants, our nurses from having the time to develop and encourage and do motivational interviewing, one, so we can uncover the non-adherence, and two, so that we can develop that trusting relationship so the patient will understand and work with us to take the medicine, tailor that, that, me that message so that they are motivated to take the medicine. But our work is really ahead of us. It is very broad, as you've heard today, um, I thank you for your time and your tremendous interest in this. We have a lot of work to do, and I hope we can do it together. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Loper. I am the CEO and co-founder of Wealth. And what we do at Wealth is we apply the field of behavioral economic research to healthcare problems. And one of our biggest areas of focus is improving adherence and therefore outcomes for patients that we serve. So let's start with why we do this. Um, I think as you've seen today, there's a huge amount of barriers to adherence. What I like to do is I like to start to think about the patient. I think every one of us has a loved one, a family member that we know, that we know their patient journey. We know the barriers that get in the way of them doing the thing that they rashly know they should, but then don't end up doing. So when people talk about behavioral economics, when I describe it to my mom, what is it? It's um, understanding why people actually do the things that they actually do, because we used to assume humans are rational, and given a choice, they will make their own choice in their own best interest. What we've learned is that assumption is often false. If you understand how and why they make these decisions, you can overcome them for the better. So the patient I like to think about is my uncle on my mother's side, Uncle Roy. He was, he always intended to do the right thing. We said, are you gonna take your medications? He'd say, of course. Are you gonna go see your doctor? Yes. Um, are you going to change the way you eat? He was diabetic, very poorly controlled diabetic. And he would always say yes, yes, yes. And then you would ask him, did you actually do that thing? Did you take your medications today? Did you even pick them up? No, I haven't made it to that part of town. Um, did you go to see your doctor? I haven't had time yet, right? There's always this gap between the intention and the behavior, right? So what we really focus on is how to bridge that gap. And we heard from Dr. Peterson a whole slide on all these barriers to adherence. Let's assume we solve all those upstream barriers and get the right drug to the right patient. There's still this huge behavioral gap where Uncle Roy knows rashly he should be taking his metformin. He knows it's good for him, and he knows it's gonna help him down the road. The problem is that when he takes it right now, he feels no different right now. Versus the Snickers bar on the table, he rationally knows has too much sugar and he shouldn't eat, tastes really good right now. So this is one of these core cognitive biases that behavioral economists call present bias. Simply put, we're motivated by the instant and tangible gratification we get from a behavior, not what we rationally know is good for us. For those that are more of the economic geeks in the room like me, uh, the more technical term for this is hyperbolic discounting. Basically, in our brains, we can't take the, the net present value of a future outcome today with the linear discount rate. We apply a hyperbolic discount rate, which means the further off into the future that outcome is, the less the value is to us today. So let's keep that in mind when we think about the patient journey, right? And let's just abstract all of these barriers of adherence down to one simple equation, right? For any behavior, your subconscious is basically saying, what is the immediate cost of doing this behavior versus what is the immediate benefit? And we heard all sorts of immediate costs of doing this behavior, right? The time and cognitive effort it takes to even pick up those prescriptions and then remember to take them every day. The real or perceived possible side effects from taking that medication. Um, the financial cost of filling that prescription. The list goes on and on and on. What is the immediate benefit for most drug classes? Zero, 
right? There's only the rational long-term benefit. There's no immediate benefit. Let's think about the, the drug classes where we have an over-adherence problem. They give us this really nice feeling, right? They're the opiates, they're the stimulants. There's this immediate feedback loop as soon as you take that medication. So let's use that framework and think about all the interventions that are currently being tried to overcome medication adherence, right? They combine some form of these three interventions. Let's push more reminders on patients. That quickly becomes very annoying to a patient like Uncle Roy, who, you know, he quickly turns that off or tunes it out. Let's push more education on him. Let's teach him about his diabetes, how it works, why he should be taking his metformin. Again, that's just more rational information. That doesn't move the needle for Uncle Roy. And then finally, there's all these connected devices. Let's put a chip in the pill. Let's put a chip in the pill bottle. Let's put a chip in the injector and the inhaler, whatever it may be, so we can watch him, so we can measure him, and so we can get data on if he is taking that medication or not. Well, what does that do? We now have a very expensive pill bottle sitting on Uncle Roy's counter telling us he's not taking his pills every day. He's not any more motivated to take it. It's a great way to measure data, but it's not a great intervention to overcome this present bias issue. So how do you give that immediate and tangible benefit for the behavior? Well, there's a number of ways. One scalable way um, is by using financial incentives. Simply put, we're going to pay patients like Uncle Roy to take his pills. It sounds easy. Um, it's actually extremely nuanced, extremely complicated. Uh, what I like to say is behavior science is not a hard science. It's not like chemistry, where if you give five research groups the same five interventions, you're going to get the same five outcomes every time from that chemical reaction. In behavior change, it's contextual, it's nuanced, it's very complicated. So there's a whole host of um, interventions that we combine, and you'll hear a lot about those later in the intervention panel. But we really focus on how do you motivate that behavior change to happen? And that differs based on different groups, right? Some, some socioeconomic groups require more money to change their behavior versus less. How do you structure that incentive to maximize its outcome? Well, we use um, what's called the endowment effect, where we give the progress up front. We say, here's, a, here's some money. Here's $30 for, for Medicaid and dual eligible patients. Here's $50 for commercially insured patients. And every day that you don't do the behavior, we're going to take away two of those dollars. So it's the same amount of money, but by flipping it and saying, we're giving you the progress up front and taking away for not doing the behavior, you can produce up to twice the behavior change. Finally, how do you form a habit that sticks? We don't want a one-time behavior. We don't want a one-time outcome. We want to create a habit that lasts the course of a patient's lifetime. And the way that you do that is a series of repetitive trigger, behavior, and reward. Trigger, behavior, reward. Every day, the reward has to be salient to the behavior as it happens and reinforce it itself. So, a bunch of studies have been done in the space um, starting to show that if you just give that reward every day for 90 days, you can create this lasting habit formation over longer time frames. Here's a study from the Journal of Clinical Hypertension uh, in 2015. Um, here's a great study showing non-medication behavior, same concept, right? Uh, this is from the University of Pennsylvania Center for Health and Science of Behavioral Economics, a uh, study that was published in 2014, where they showed, again, if you reinforce the behavior every day of using connected devices, you can create lasting habit formation. So at Wealth, you know, we're a company, we're a startup, we're a digital health startup. We work with academic researchers, we do our own RCTs, but we're also a commercial enterprise. I want to show you quickly just how we combine all these different interventions that the, the academics have created uh, and really improve on them and scale them. So again, we offer Uncle Roy up front, here's $30, just download this app. That's your money as, as long as you download this app, right? That's the endowment effect. That's the same reason that American Airlines says, hey, if you sign up for a credit card today, you'll get 60,000 miles up front, right? By giving that progress up front, you get way more enrollment into that offer. On a daily basis, take a picture of your pills, your blood pressure cuff, your glucometer, your scales, your meals, your CPAP therapy, anything that's in your care plan, make sure you take a picture of it before you do it or we'll get the data off the connected device. If you don't do any one of your required care plan behaviors, you're gonna lose $2 for that day. And then that's re reinforced every morning through a set of trigger behavior reward, trigger, time to take a photo of your pills to avoid the loss of $2. He's able to bridge that intent behavior gap, put the pills in his hand, snap the photo of the pills in his hand. We give him this immediate and salient credit. Great job, you've kept those $2 for the day. And by the way, you just had a streak of 20 in a row, which unlocks an intrinsic motivator, which is high fives from your grandson that reinforces that extrinsic motivation of the money. So there's a lot going on there, and I'm happy to talk in much more detail later uh, at, this, at the breakout sessions. But um, when we've done this in real patient populations, now this is a bit of an eye chart, every dot represents a patient on our app. The darker the dot, the more care plan behaviors are required of those patients per day. So you can see the very dark dots are up to five different behaviors per day. And again, that's multiple medications multiple times per day, but also other aspects of care plan, glucometer readings, blood pressure cuff readings, scales, et cetera. 
And if you see each column represents a different patient population, you see the repeatability here of the results we've been able to generate. We mostly select for previously non-adherent or poorly controlled populations, and we um, you know, do this over long time frames. So some of these populations in the middle have been with us for two plus years now. What you can see here is that line there is 80% compliance, which is an industry guideline for non-adherent versus adherent. We're able to get 80% of the individuals we enroll over that 80% threshold. And again, we're selecting for the previously non-adherent folks. And if you look at the average adherence rate, it's 89%. Then if you look at each column, each one is between an 85% and 93% average adherence level. This is across many different disease states. So you can see multiple chronic conditions, CHF, uh, COPD, asthma, diabetes, uh, um, cardiovascular disease, the list goes on and on, even behavioral health conditions, serious mental illness. Um, about 80% of our population to date has been Medicaid or dual eligible. And we have um, some very elderly groups. We have a 97-year-old who's been on our app for two years now. She was 95 when she first enrolled. Uh, so we're serving a very, very broad population, and you're seeing this repeatability across these very different groups. As someone said earlier, um, the most important thing is not the adherence. The adherence is the tool to get to the outcomes. So we're very focused on tracking those outcomes. Again, this is a mix of RCTs and our own commercial pilots with our customers. And you can see things like A1C is going down significantly um, and staying down, right? So uh, a lot of interventions show a three-month uh, improvement to A1C, but then mean reversion back, where we've seen over the course of a full year plus an average A1C reduction of almost a full point. Uh, there was a study that we did with um, Dr. Steve Kimmel and Barbara Regal at University of Pennsylvania that was just published at, or shown at the uh, American Heart Association last month. And we showed a 46% reduction to readmissions between our control group and our intervention group there at University of Pennsylvania. This next metric here is from a uh, population we served with serious mental illness. We saw this halo effect where once we got them adherent to their daily care, they start to follow on with those other behaviors that they know they should, but often don't end up doing, like going to their outpatient behavioral health appointments, and the list goes on and on and on. So thank you very much for the time today, and I look forward to meeting everyone later. Now we do it on time. Okay. Great. All right. Um, Thanks uh, again for being up here. I, I just wanted to take a quick time to recap a little bit of what I heard uh, from some of the folks here. It, it was really interesting. The, the themes that were coming out here for me were that experience with the provider and the trusting relationship is a key element to medication uh, adherence. We heard people talk about um, that poor provider relationship and not understanding what was going on with the individual patient led to non-adherence. We heard people talking about that trusting relationship and ability to be able to begin to help map some of the solutions and take some of those barriers away because that there was that trusting uh, relationship. And the mod <clears throat> behavior modification that comes along with all of those has to come from that kind of trusting relationship. And sometimes we think about that trusting relationship with that prescriber, but uh, some of the other uh, healthcare professionals that are out there are also key. The nurse, the pharmacist are also part of that uh, prescriber relationship and a trusting relationship needs to be developed to be able to take away some of those. So it was really interesting to kind of hear the themes that everybody had said when we talk about barriers. It really comes down to that relationship. And I really appreciate that because then we're thinking about that individual patient. In my mind, I need to talk about some of the uh, system level kinds of issues, and I'll go fairly quickly about these. I want to talk a little bit about pharmacy deserts, care coordination, transitions of care, and medication uh, synchronization, and I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions and moderation by uh, Hayden. Pharmacy desert, by the way, I just realized that this was the, down here. I kept looking over here. Um, pharmacy deserts are the geographic areas which lack an access to a nearby pharmacy where pharmacy services are scarce or difficult to obtain. And I learned about this a number of years ago when I saw a television report uh, about a county within the Pennsylvania area where there was a couple of small community pharmacies within a, a region and serves a, a small population. And then within... Uh, uh, a time period, they had a uh, Walmart that came in and had a pharmacy. And within about a year or two after that Walmart, those two independent pharmacies wound up closing because of the competition. And that Walmart was then the primary pharmacy for that region. 
Well, a couple of years after that, Walmart decided that it was not a good business for them to have Walmart in that region anymore. And they closed. And therefore, they closed the pharmacy. So those folks within that area now had nowhere to get their medications but for pharmacies that were 20 plus miles away. And that created what we call a pharmacy desert. We may see some of those things with food deserts. That's kind of the analogy out of it. But that's the pharmacy desert concept. Uh, the work that we've done at the University of the Sciences had mapped out um, pharmacy deserts at the county level within Pennsylvania. The uh, bluer ones are the ones where there are no pharmacy deserts. And that is uh, pharmacy within access within a mile, within certain regions. And this is for elderly patients. So this is, we used uh, elderly patient data. So we were looking at a specific population as well. The dark red ones were where pharmacy deserts uh, had occurred. And then the yellow ones were uh, midway. The orange ones where there was close to a pharmacy desert, but uh, access to pharmacies was limited, but it was still reasonably accessible there. What we identified, though, that was uh, in places where there were pharmacy deserts, those dark red ones versus the dark blue ones, there was a significant difference in uh, medication possession ratio uh, in those where patients within a pharmacy desert had a significantly lower NPR than those who lived in the uh, non-pharmacy deserts in the places where there was an access to pharmacy. So this is a system-wide issue and it's a policy issue for the payers within the Pennsylvania area to make sure that there is access to pharmacies in those areas. So that was the concept of that. And it takes us to out of that patient, but it brings us into, well, what are the other barriers that we need to make sure of? Uh, and access to one uh, in terms of pharmacy deserts. Another similar one is the coordination of care. And we, we know this is a huge fragmentation of care. People are going to multiple providers. They do a cardiologist one week, a pulmonologist another week, and then a PCP a couple of weeks later. And very interesting, I think Marie had mentioned this, uh, where one of her patients had gotten a, uh, received a prescription from a, a specialist, but chose not to take it until the patient talked to her uh, about it, and that was that part, that trust piece of relationship. But that's that fragmentation of care. If there was some potential for communication sooner than that, that patient could have taken that medication right from the beginning. But that delay had really uh, delayed the initiation of those medications. And people who were being discharged from hospitals, uh, when I was doing uh, my uh, residency training down in Medical College of Virginia, um, we had a patient who came into uh, <clears throat> into the hospital because of some pain, wound up uh, getting some medications while they were there, and then was discharged on, it was a non anti-inflammatory. When she went out back in, she started, continued to take that medication plus the non anti-inflammatory that she had back at her home. She started both of those uh, and continued to them, and two weeks later she was back in the hospital with acute renal failure because of the increase of the non anti-inflammatory drug. So medication reconciliation and uh, communication is a really important part that we don't really do well enough to be able to help coordinate some of those cares. The care. And then multiple medications, asynchronized uh, refills and uncoordinated refills. Somebody had mentioned this too, and I want to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, synchronization, and that is aligning the prescription refills to occur at the same time on each month or each quarter. So that person is going to the pulmonologist, the cardiologist uh, every other week, and then the primary care physician is then also going to the pharmacy the first week, the second week, and the fourth week of the month. Pharmacies love that because every time a patient goes into the pharmacy, not only are they picking up uh, prescription medications, they're picking up uh, greeting cards, they're picking up stuffed animals, they're picking up some candy or things like that. So there's a business that goes along with this. And that's a barrier that we need to consider. But at the same time, if the patient is not taking their medications, they're going to wind up losing business as well. So uh, medication synchronization, uh, one study published by the National Community Pharmacist Association, NCPA, did show that patients who were synchronized, and that is that they were getting all of their medications refilled on the same day each month or each quarter, actually had a higher PDC, um, proportion of days covered, than those who were not synchronized. It takes effort by the pharmacist and the patient, this is where some of that trust comes in, where they have to give the patient extra medications or hold back a couple of medications so they can get all of those doses in sync and that is an important piece, but that takes some time and effort and usually takes uh, some uh, coordination. Uh, but that is really important because then that will help improve our medication adherence. 
And then I, the barriers, I just kind of summarized this a little bit already, so uh, that was my last kind of slide. But I just want us to remember that uh, as we talk about the barriers and the interventions, again, we are talking about individual patients, but there are system-wide kinds of things which impact those individual patients. So uh, thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. So I want to thank our panelists. Uh, that was really helpful and really appreciate uh, queuing us up. Just a couple comments and then uh, open up for discussion. So, um, you know, I think Mike's point of the phenotypes I think is really fascinating and really important. I just would also comment that if we're screening, you have to have a solution, right? So we know that if you don't screen, if you don't have a solution. So as we think about our to uh, tools, making sure that we ask the question and then have that. So I like the slide that Mike put up there where it shows the phenotypes. I think Dave's point really ha hammered for me, uh, where's the individual? So we can create these programs, but if we don't have the individual at front and center and think about that case study, how is that individual using the product um, we miss something. It's really easy to look at aggregate, big data is a big thing, but we lose a lot, I think, in that. I also think that from Dave's perspective, it made me think about, um, David's perspective, the psychosocial factors. So when I look at existing databases and I talk about predictive analytics, and I'm using my claims data to predict who's going to be non-adherent, that's great data but it doesn't capture the patient's perception of the benefit of the, or risk of that medication. Everybody makes a decision. There's a risk and a benefit. There's no side effects typically in there. There's no ability to pay that's typically in there. There's no perceived value of that medication. So all these psychosocial factors that I think really come to bear that also Marie pointed out are not easily obtained. And that actually requires us to go out and directly contact and interact with the patient. So we have large databases, they're growing, and those are wonderful. But that's just one part of the tool, but being mindful that it doesn't capture all the other important pieces there. So, and so Marie mentioned trust is another issue. The other one I want to just highlight at some point will come back to maybe is regulation. There's a lot of rules and regulations that are by state, by federal, which really makes things complicated. And so to whatever extent we can help I actually frame that, I think that would be helpful because I do think it uh, prohibits or de decreases in, uh, innovation in some respects. Um, but that's something too that we need to maybe perhaps consider at some point. I think Matt's talk was great, uh, very f helpful, but I think at the end of the day, again, if we're talking about medication adherence and we're talking about chronic medication, our goal is really to create a habit, something that is long-sustaining, that is just part of our daily activity. And so to whatever extent we can do that, but just because we create a habit, we also have to check in periodically as well. So not just simply initiating, and, uh, but also making sure that we maintain that over time. I also think that it, he raised the issue that I think is really crucial and we'll get to, methodology, RCTs, clinical trials, what's the gold standard? How do we do this more effectively and more efficiently? NIH grants are great, but the model of a five-year R01 to test something is fundamentally not something a healthcare system can wait. So we need to do this better, more efficiently, but we also cannot sacrifice science. So I know that Michael and others will talk about this uh, momentarily. The last point I would just want to make is, is that um, I think Andrew's point about the system level is absolutely crucial. Um, I would just emphasize the care coordination, I think, is a fundamental safety issue. So for no other reason, we can talk about the costs and the issues of medication and how these are very expensive. They're increasing in some respects. Yes, 80% are generic. There is a fundamental safety issue. If people are not taking their medication appropriately, what are those implications? And so when we quote $300 billion is what the medication non-adherence, I think that's BS. I think the numbers are much higher. We're just not doing a good job of researching, and I think people that end up in the hospital because of poor taking medication is fundamentally part of the problem. So I think that's something why I emphasize that I think this is a huge public health issue. So I think Andrew's point about care coordination is crucial. Um, I also want to just mention, too, last point, when we think, think about pharmacy, we have the community pharmacy, as Andrew was talking about. We have retail, we have mail, we have specialty pharmacies. So this whole model is changing pretty dramatically. So if, again, if we're talking about care coordination, it's very possible you can walk over and get your retail, but you're also getting mailed. And so we just need the, that to keep in mind, too, there's a much more complex situation than just, but I, I like the idea, too, that the pharmacy, the, the issue of the relationship of the community pharmacy is, is not what it used to be. 
that's all I have to say. Now, um, do the panel have anything else that they would like to add? Um, because if not, I would love to hear, maybe um, people could start queuing up if they have questions. There are microphones, I believe, too, there if you have a question. Uh, Bernard, you can't raise your hand, you've got to go to the microphone. <laughs> Um, but before we do that, any comments from uh, the panel? Anything you would like to emphasize? Anything that, um, any other comments? I, I guess I'll say something. Um, it's like I'm on an impeachment trial. Um, <laughs> I think one thing, Hayden, you just mentioned that's really important is uh, kind of having all stakeholders work together, right? You see this conference is awesome because there are people that are you know, digital health companies, startups, commercial enterprises, there's great researchers, there's people in, in government and regulations. Um, but uh, you know, if we're gonna change this healthcare industry, we all have to work together, right? You have the problem of anyone working in isolation has their own incentives, right? Digital health companies sometimes you know, fabricate or, or you know, kind of create more um, hype than, than actual reality. Academics are really good at creating research, but you know it's a five-year cycle to get a study done, and regulations often stand in the way of of these you know proven interventions scaling up in big populations. So I think we need more collaboration and events like this to bring all the stakeholders together. Um, you mentioned regulation. One of the things that we found that with chronic meds. Uh, people are going to be on them for the rest of their life, so why aren't we writing 90 plus 4 rather than 30 plus 3, which is still going on? That takes away an easy barrier. When people do this, and we uh, guided a FQHC in uh, the Chicagoland area to do this, they found that they uh, saved an hour a day for the provider because they halved the number of refills that they were doing. You continue to see the patient as often as needed, but you, you only have to do the refills once. Um, states um, vary by how uh, long the duration is. Illinois uh, just changed from 12 to 15 months. Mm -hmm. So if across the country we move to at least 15 months, that would help as well because the chances of seeing the patient exactly 365 days later is pretty small. So that's great. That's to be um, that makes me think that we have a couple international uh, uh, speakers and individuals here. One thing, too, that I would just emphasize, there's comparative effectiveness in looking at other communities, other societies. Um, you know, we're probably about 45th with life expectancy, the first time in our generation where people are actually not living as long as our uh, initial people, uh, parents. Um, and there are systems outside the U.S. that have really fixed this and solved this situation and are models that we should be looking towards. So as far as regulations and ways, uh, blister packaging, there are a lot of things out there that others are doing that we should be thinking about. But let's see, uh, if you, uh, looks like we have two speakers. Could you introduce yourself and then go ahead and present the question? Hi, my name is Harry Travis. I'm the CEO of VTech Rx. Uh, good panel, thanks for your thoughts. I have a question about, in general, how, who do you feel is the kind of primary professional who should be responsible for adherence? And if that's a multi-part question here, and if that's the pharmacy, how do we get that done if pharmacists continue to be paid based on essentially the markup of the drug? Great. I think the larger context is how do we think about reimbursement and roles and responsibility. Anybody on the panel would like to take a shot at that? Uh, uh, as, a, as a practicing physician with a team, um, I think it's the provider, uh, whether it's the PA, the NP, the APP, uh, the, the general team. It, sometimes it's the medical assistant who has the greater uh, relationship with the patient who's going to uncover why they're not taking it. Um, my experience with uh, pharmacists and commercials is when patients come back after I prescribe something and they've read what it could do to harm them and it includes death, it's very difficult in this short period of time I have um, with them to, to uh, address the other 1600 guidelines during that 20 minutes uh, to counter and explain the risk and the benefit because all they hear on the commercial is death and all they see in that long list is uh, a lot of negativities and it, it isn't put in perspective and the time we have to, to try to counter that is really challenging. So I think working closer with the pharmacists um, and the FDA to, yes, legally um, we need to share uh, what could happen 
But the word potential, what could happen, is very difficult to convey uh, when we're talking about an asymptomatic condition and the benefits. So help from all of us would be greatly appreciated. If I can jump in too, I mean, um, yeah, I don't think that it's a, it's a simple pharmacy pre prescriber issue. I, I think it is, a, to, to Marie's point, like the, there's information on both sides that doesn't get shared very well. Um, and also I think there's, there's knowledge and expertise on both sides that also uh, could benefit one or the other. And also I think you're, you're getting behavioral information about the patient, whether it's about, you know, delays in fill and whatever, that's just, I think we're, we're just now starting to see in electronic health records some feedback loops that, that are trying to kind of, uh, at least in some EHR platforms, trying to inform clinicians if there's an adherence signals. I know we're working um, uh, on trying to allow community pharmacists to actually have access to not just have read-only access, but read and write access um, and even how to deal with, uh, you know, again, uh, to, to Andrew's point, like, you know, 65% of medic uh, charts in ambulatory care, I think this has not changed in 15 years, have discrepancies. So the reconciliation issue is still the found fundamental problem that we can't even get over. Um, and, and there's also counseling and medication reviews and services that I think could be in some ways optimally delivered by pharmacy, but they can't do it because they don't have the complete information. So uh, finding these partnerships between uh, in having true care teams, I think, is, is the goal. Okay. Now, what I also wanted to say is that, you know, with the rise of pharmacy benefit man, uh, managers and the fact that so many of them push to mail order, I think that really deeply affects how the pharmacist and the patient are able to interact. And, you know, the other, so from that perspective, just based on an economic incentive, is we need access to the data that actually shows that there are poor uh, health outcomes. Um, and often that data are restricted, and, and so I think getting access to that data, doing those kinds of analyses are going to be really, really important. So, um, do you have a quick I one? just wanted to just add that I, I agree. I don't think it's a, a single provider. It is that care team. The pharmacist is an essential part of that. Uh, oftentimes, that is the last uh, health care provider that a patient sees before they start taking the medication. And the opportunity there to be able to talk to that patient about the need to take that medication and then reinforce that refill uh, piece and how to, to do that is a key element to the process, but we don't have the time or the money, and the pharmacists are uh, concerned that you know their their metrics are uh, you know how many prescriptions do they get out or, or or patient satisfaction in some way, but not really you know how do they take that medication and they satisfy the law by signing something here and giving a, a pamphlet out to somebody and that promotes a lot of that confusion. So if there's a, a better strategy to, to improve the communication and the trust with the patient and the pharmacist, I think we'll see an improved medication adherence. Last comment uh, related to that. I think one thing to, com you know, we haven't really talked about policy. So value-based care is a big issue. So really trying to frame the context of what we're doing so that there is some policy reimbursement model. But I think at the end of the day, data. So we need data to demonstrate that this is something that we should be paying for or being reimbursed. So, um, sir, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, my name is Deepak Sardeshmuk. I'm a partner in a digital health company in Chapel Hill, with an academic background in pharmacy as well as patient uh, measurement. Uh, just one comment on this one. I've seen accountable care organizations, such as Desert System in California, where they actually have pharmacists who are pretty much dedicated to doing the, uh, the entire gamut of uh, uh, looking at adherence and other factors too. So they're, they're a good model, I think, to follow up on. The question I have for the panel, particularly maybe Michael, but a couple of others, um, all of you have talked about how there are dozens, maybe hundreds of reasons why patients are non-adherent. Uh, do you think that could be a reason that explains why two very well-known studies, one by Nitesh, who's going to be here later, called the Remind trial, ended up showing no results, and more disappointingly, the HeartStrong trial, done by the Penn Group, which included behavioral incentives, financial incentives, social support, and these are patients coming off of AMIs, showed A, no effect on adherence, interestingly, no effect on outcomes, which in a way was encouraging, because if adherence had been not affected and outcomes were positive, that'd be a problem. Um, that, so do you think it's a heterogeneity, so many factors being there, that's an explanation for these two studies, 
which sort of took some of the air out of all of this, uh, and for me uh, is, is something I'm curious about. And it's a thank you for the opportunity to ask you the question. Yeah, I think uh, Michael can answer momentarily, but I think Nitish will be here, but I think the biggest issue is um, 40,000 people didn't all have memory problems, right? So just because you had a large sample and you have a solution doesn't mean that you've actually targeted the appropriate solution for those individuals. And I think that was a fundamental issue. Michael? Uh, I'm just going to reiterate, I, I think like the... Uh, what we're all saying in, in many ways, and, and I think that's probably the take home from this panel, is, is that um, we don't, at, at least it seems in, in clinical practice, you don't have a signal that really tries to get at the, the precise nature of any barrier that you may have. And we, before you start to deploy, even a, as multifaceted uh, uh, of an intervention, as strong of a lever on the surface that would appeal, you don't know if you're actually getting at why someone's not taking their medication. And so finding ways for us to routinely assess this, I think, in the health system uh, and periodically, yeah, so it has to be something because these problems evolve, I think, are, is the better way to figure out what you need to deploy. Um, and I think it can be more cost efficient as well because, again, whether not everybody may need a financial incentive. You know, not everybody may need a text reminder. Not everybody may need education or motivational interviewing. And all of these things can come at cost. But you ultimately look to allocate the resources, especially those that are more intensive, to those who demonstrate a need. I think that's what we need to be doing. So we're in the last question. But um, I think the other point, too, is on the fourth section, we'll be talking about methods. So heterogeneity of treatment effects. So this is an opportunity that we really start trying to understand groups of individuals and try to uh, use uh, methods to help uh, stratify or, or identify the right people for the right program. So there's methods that are coming out that we should hopefully have an opportunity to talk about. Uh, we have a ringer. Go ahead, Bernard. You want to introduce yourself? Bernard Vriens, Ardex, Belgium. So in the discussions, there was mentioned a couple of times that adherence was a means to outcome. And I think we have forever thought that it is, it is a means to outcome. However, it was said also that it's the tip of the iceberg. And you have a lot of things that are not going well. Uncoordinated care, lack of trust, inappropriate prescription. So that's probably the reason. All these are the reasons for non-adherence. This, this is the tip of the iceberg. And last year, there was a seminal report by the OECD asking and suggesting that adherence should be a measure of quality of care. Because if the quality of care is improving, adherence will improve, and in particular, persistence. And this is a measure that can be compared between systems, between, between countries, between therapeutic areas, globally. And they highly suggested that in the last year report of the OECD. And it was also suggested two years before by WHO in the context of the aging population. And I would like to see your view about having adherence, not a means to outcome, but a measure of quality of care. It's all yours. <laughs> I think I, uh, it's a fa fabulous point, uh, focusing on a process rather than the end outcome is you actually improving someone's, um, you know, uh, health as a result, not just focusing on the behavior, which I think we do. I think we absolutely have to be moving beyond it. I mean, in the context, um, again, uh, and Hayden's aware of this, pro we have a project right now, a trial that, you know, we chose some of the more complicated issues, you know, just because adherence was not a factor, for instance, in the context of, of, of transplant adherence. Uh, when you have a third of patients with a new kidney that cost $250,000, they start focusing on the behavior knowing that you might actually affect their immune suppression regimen if you, if you had that feedback loop, but ultimately you don't care about them taking the, There's act, You can actually be less adherent to medication, especially older patients, and, and actually get maybe have better immune suppression because you have the natural <laughs> immune suppression going on. So, so I think like the notion of it being a, a measure of quality of care means for us to start thinking about, well, what does it mean? Does it mean better counseling, that you're actually tracking this information? How does adherence get operationalized as a quality indicator? I think that's something interesting, and I think a lot of health systems may not be thinking about nat naturally. So I, like, I, I think even from our end of it, uh, with value-based care models that are, you know, that have, we've been dipping our toes in in different kind of clinical contexts, the idea that 
maybe it, there is a value for care coordination if it means that we can actually do things more efficiently and th that counseling and that uh, understanding how patients are engaging in certain behaviors such as medication taking might actually um, uh, be something we should be attending to. I think that is something that is just still starting to kind of emerge in the conversation, but it hasn't, uh, again, on the, on the ground level, there's someone behind you that's wanting to, to chip in. To just add a little bit to that, uh, the PQA, the Pharmacy Quality Alliance, has uh, integrated several of those measures, uh, a PDC as a, a measure of quality, and that impacts the Medicare star ratings and things. So it is beginning to be integrated by, uh, I push back and say, is PDC the right one? That's the one we've kind of defaulted to because uh, it's an easy measure through some of the data sources that we have. But uh, as I said, PDC does not always tell the whole big picture uh, of what is going on with uh, individual patients. Uh, so it is part of a measure, but I think the measures that we have are, are somewhat inadequate to be a ubiquitous uh, quality measure. Great. Um, one last point, too. Uh, so as the moderator, I get the last opportunity to say, I mean, one thing um, we also have to be mindful of, particularly when we think about quality measurement, is unintended consequences. So I think that that's really important that as we roll things out, understand what the implications are, because there's always something that's going to happen that you wouldn't anticipate. And we have stories of uh, CMS, Medicare, the Advantage Part D, uh, what, what some of those unintended consequences are. Um, so um, I want to thank the panelists uh, for their insightful discussion, and I thank you all for your attention. This has been uh, a great start. Uh, we have three more, uh, and they're only going to get better. So reasons to stay around, uh, and we'll take uh, a 10-minute break or 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, so thank you.
I'm in jeopardy of being fired as the moderator. All right, we're going to go ahead and start. Um, I'm getting uh, the, the sign. Okay, um, so we're moving into session two, and we're going to be talking about interventions to track and improve medication adherence. So we talked a little bit about barriers. So um, kind of moving, and you'll see the pattern where we're going. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, introduce our next panel. Um, to my left is uh, Josh Benner, the founder and president and CEO of RxAnti. Um, he'll talk about uh, his company and what they've been doing over a number of years now. Um, we'll have uh, Stephen Thomas, professor of health policy and management at the University of Maryland School of Public Health and director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity. Uh, we'll have Andrea Troxel, uh, professor of population health and director of biostatistics at New York University School of Medicine. Uh, Jocelyn Yolerich, uh, Deputy Vice President for Medical Innovation Policy at Pharma. And then we have at the end, uh, Jack Lewin, Chairman of the Board at National Coalition on Healthcare, Principal and Founder at Lewin and Associates LLC. So uh, similar pattern, they'll each uh, give six to eight over minutes overview. I'll um, try to help facilitate the moderation and then open it up for conversation. So uh, with that, Josh. Thanks, Hayden. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be with you today. I want to start by, does this move my slides? Yep. Just quickly um, introducing about five topics that I'm going to hit on briefly in my remarks. The first is I'm going to summarize um, the Medicare Part D star ratings for medication adherence. The last panel ended with mention of this topic, and so uh, that was a, an unpaid advertisement for my uh, comments today because that is the context for our work on medication adherence. Second, I want to just talk for a moment about the specific and unique challenges to medica managing medication adherence at a population level. Third, um, touch on some of the effects of real world adherence improvement programs that we've had the opportunity to target, deploy, and evaluate. And then fourth, um, talk about how we're using barrier information that comes from patients on what's keeping them from being adherent to design better interventions, just very briefly. And then finally, close with a few questions and some, uh, some future directions that we're excited about. So this is publicly available data from CMS. It is the adherence rates in three categories of drugs among Medicare Advantage members from 2010 to 2018, the last year for which this data are publicly available. It's a good trend, right? It's a good trend because of a policy change that happened in 2011 when these three categories of drugs, blood pressure, cholesterol, and oral diabetes drugs, became the subject of Medicare Advantage and Part D plan star ratings. So those three categories of drugs are now being tracked by CMS, and plans are being held accountable for the adherence rates with these categories of drugs. I'm going to spare you details on how those incentives work, but suffice it to say right now that these are existential incentives for these plans. You cannot be a winning plan in Medicare Advantage, which is the fastest growing segment of business for most of the big national health plans, unless you're doing well on these, members, on these um, measures. What are the measures? These measures are based on the proportion of days covered, PDC, and for a patient to be considered adherent, they have to have at least 80% of days covered in the plan year, which is a calendar year. And the counting begins as soon as the patient has filled their first prescription, but they get to drop out of the denominator if they don't fill twice during the year. All right? So just, you know, think about that for a second. Fill once in January, fill again in February. Now I'm in the denominator. The plan's accountable for me and my adherence rate, and going back to the date of my first fill, I have to have 80% of days with that drug on hand between that date of first fill and the end of the year to make it into the numerator, to help the plan as being an adherent patient. It's binary. You are or you are not adherent. Um, so the, the second thing to know is that proportion of days covered is based on prescription refill data, and that means that this is a measure about timeliness of refills. What hurts you if you're the health plan is gaps between refills because those accumulate days for which the patient does not have the drug on hand. Make sense? May not be the perfect measure of adherence. We'll come back to that later. 
but it's meaningful. I think it's evidence-based as someone who was on the committee that drafted those measures along with Andrew and David Now and Emily Cox and other people many of you know several years ago, um, the evidence supported and continues to support these measures. This is the impact of the policy. So the policy became effective in 2011. Those incentives were added to Medicare's quality-based bonus payment program. They're big incentives. And we've seen an increase in the adherence rates to these categories of drugs of between 11 and 16% in absolute terms. That is 11 to 16% of Medicare Advantage members are adherent to these drugs that weren't uh, back then. All right, so let's talk about trying to manage this if you're a health plan, right? I got several hundred thousand members, maybe a hundred or hundreds of thousands of members on these drugs. My challenge is finding needles in the haystack. There are a lot of these people that are gonna be adherent on their own. There are some people who won't, and there are some people that are gonna be challenged to be adherent no matter what you do for them. And so if you're a health plan, your job as a population health manager is to do really well on these measures in spite of that challenge which is where you hire firms like ours and others, and you get help from your PBM, and you make everybody you can think of accountable for helping you win on these measures. But it requires analytics to target the patients at risk, to deploy interventions most likely to help those at-risk patients, and then to evaluate the performance of those interventions. And so what I'm gonna spend a few minutes doing now is just quickly showing you some examples of those interventions, how we have measured them, and I'm gonna leave out um, some of the details around how we target them just in the interest of time, but happy to address them in, um, in discussion later. All right, so um, here are some direct to member interventions that health plans commonly run. So I'm using a couple of real world examples here. Um, the first one, the one on the left, um, is one of the highest performing interventions we've had an opportunity to evaluate. This is a pharmacist who's employed by the health plan calling patients who are flagged based on predictive analytics that say that patient is at high risk of being non-adherent for the year. This pharmacist has a lot of authority. They can call these patients as needed. Um, that list is revised on a weekly basis about who needs this and who doesn't. They are, because they are a licensed pharmacist, the conversation can range to address whatever barriers that pharmacist can uncover with that patient. But they are coaching them by phone from a distance, not in front of them in a store or in a pharmacy. The way we evaluate this, these, um, I'll try to explain very briefly, we use something we call a difference in differences approach. But the idea here is no plan has the patience or the business tolerance for a randomized controlled trial. Very few plans do. Some may still, but in our experience, none of our clients do. The imperative is to win on these measures right now, which means I cannot forego, there's no such thing as a control group. I cannot forego the opportunity to intervene on somebody who could help my performance on these measures. And so what we've had to do is come up with the next best thing. And what we believe the next best thing is, in consultation with several academic thought leaders in causal inference, is to compare the people that we reached with the intervention and were receptive to it to people who we wanted to reach with that intervention but couldn't. And so those unreached patients become our control group. And what you're looking at here with these statistics is the adherence rate we predicted among people we didn't end up reaching was 57.3% uh, um, in this population with this intervention. Um, that group ended up having an adherence rate at the end of the year of 54%. So that's the natural rate of decline in people we wanted to target for this intervention but couldn't reach. Among those who we reached with the intervention and who were receptive to it, they started with a slightly higher probability of being adherent. My eyes are failing me so I can't read that number from here. Is it about 59, 60%? And then it went up to 64%. And so the way we calculate the effectiveness of this intervention or its lift is the difference between this delta and this delta, which in this case is 7.4%. So that means that for someone who's receptive to this intervention, we expect it to create about a 7.4% lift in their probability of being adherent at the end of the year. Okay, it's not perfect. Lots of limitations we can talk about later, but it's what we believe the best you can do in this setting. All right, so that's a pharmacist. And you know, look, these are based on lots and lots of intervention recommendations uh, being deployed and about 42% of members that we wanna talk to being reached. I'm gonna talk to you about another intervention here, which is proactive IVR. IVR stands for interactive voice response. 
This is technology that calls the patient with a robocall, but tries to engage them in a conversation that's actually fairly surprisingly naturalistic. Uh, it's designed to get the patient to uh, be aware of their upcoming refill and to go get that refill. Here you see, using the same methods, lots of recommendations, almost perfect deployment, 42% reach rates, and about a 3.4% lift. The fact that this intervention goes to people who are already at a much higher predicted likelihood of being adherent compared to this one reflects the fact that we're targeting this to that population intentionally, and because this is a very effective intervention, we're giving it to people who are less likely to be adherent at baseline. Another trend that you're going to hear a lot about when it comes to managing adherence, and it came up in the last panel, is how do I get providers engaged in managing adherence more effectively? So I'm going to show you two examples of programs we've done in that regard. The first deals with physician practices, and the second deals with pharmacy chains. So with physician practices, we implemented an incentive and a tool to try to help physician practices improve adherence in these categories of drugs among their attributed patients. And so the payment incentive, or P for P, is, I would say, meaningful but not astounding. So if you're a physician practice and I offer you 25 bucks to make a patient adherent by the end of the year, you might say, that's not worth the effort that I think it's going to take, and I'll pass. If I offer you 50 or or $100, you might get more interested. In this case, I don't remember the actual incentive. It's not really relevant. What's important is you get this variation in the physician practice's engagement in the program. And you get variation in how many of the targeted at-risk patients they're actually willing to contact. And so the variation we saw here is actually a function of the strength of the incentive. And then we give them a tool on which patients to reach out to. So the blue bar here is that control group. These are practices, uh, let me look at my notes up close that I can actually read, that we failed to recruit but wanted to. Um, and the eligible patients in those practices. And then the yellow, red, and green bars are in order the recruited practices, that's all recruited practices, uh, patients in recruited practices, 253,000 of them. In red, those practices, patients in practices that were active, which is about 186,000. And then finally, these are subsets, right? These are nested subsets, red and green, of the yellow. The green are the highly active practices who um, actually worked um, uh, to get a 4.5% lift. So the highest lift we were able to see with this physician incentive program was 4.5% on an average for all recruited practices of only 2.1%. And then finally, I'm just talk about this um, pharmacy chain program. Same idea. Gave pharmacy chains an attributed list of at-risk patients, told them what we thought the adherence rate was going to be if they didn't do anything, and then offered them bonus payments per patient if they could drive that rate higher. And we saw, um, again, differences in the rate of engagement by the pharmacies. Pharmacy 1, the dark blue bars here, were showing you their lift in adherence rates by the diabetes meds, the um, RASA antagonists, this, these are the hypertension drugs, and then the statins. Um, Pharmacy chain one was what we considered to be the more highly engaged of the two, but the lift was pretty, pretty disappointing, 1.1, 1.5, 2%. Pharmacy chain two, which we considered to be moderately engaged, did very little work and really created no important lift for the plan. The plan ended up canceling the program. This is not enough lift uh, in Medicare Advantage to get the plan excited. So moving from interventions that sort of work well, interventions that work uh, not as well as we had hoped, how do we think about improving the quality of interventions? Just want to talk for a moment about how we're using barrier data. So as I mentioned, every time one of these direct-to-member outreach interventions happens, we ask the patient, are there barriers that are keeping you from being adherent? And so we're listing here um, a lot of these barriers in these two charts, but we've segmented into two charts because there are barriers that seem to be associated with an increasing likelihood of adherence over time on the program compared to uh, barriers that patients reveal um, and then have a declining trajectory for adherence over time. And so we look at this and we think, all right, if there's a very steep declining rate of adherence um, probability for patients who are having these barriers, these are barriers the, in the interventions are not addressing very well. And these are barriers we need to continue to think about overcoming in better ways. And so those uh, barriers included side effects. You can see the trajectory is downward over time in spite of being in our intervention program. Physician changed the dose, 
Um, the yellow one is the member changed the dose on their own, they're getting outside uh, samples, or the physician discontinued the product. That's the steepest decline here. So some of these affect the claims data, which is why they affect the measure um, in the ways that you might expect. But when we look up here, we see um, a brighter uh, story. We see some interventions for or some barriers for which the trajectory and adherence is high. Um, it's steeply upward. Um, and that means that we think that these are barriers that those pharmacists, those physician practices are actually doing a better job of addressing. And so that transportation barrier is the lighter blue bar. Uh, forgetfulness is that darker blue bar. You could say we're reminding people or you could say we're just reminding people that we're actually monitoring their adherence and uh, that that's what's driving it, the Hawthorne effect. But these are, these are the barriers that we think these programs tend to do a better job with. I got the stop sign, so let me just touch on this last one by raising some important questions. Uh, the first is, we think it's still important for this community to be asking, how do we define and measure medication adherence? I think it needs to depend on the use case and the consequences of being wrong. And there's a big difference between measuring fills and measuring eaten pills. And so uh, if you're the FDA and you're listening to this, this is really important, we think, for your use cases. Secondly, how much adherence is enough? We think we need better population level data on adherence response um, in terms of clinical outcomes. And then finally, what's the nuclear option? I won't talk about it now in these remarks, but we have to solve these problems that you see in pictures here. These are pictures we're taking as we go into patients' homes now. And we think that um, polypharmacy, an abundance of drugs in the home, and um, inadequate care over what's prescribed, not what's filled, but what's prescribed, is the next frontier in getting to better adherence. Thanks. Good morning. I am telling you, what an audience we have here. Um, I think I might be a little bit out of the box. You guys are going to tell me in the Q&A. Um, I think we need less talk and more action. And I want to talk to you about racial and ethnic health disparities. Yes, I said it, race. I said the word race. We're going to talk about race in here today. And start looking at this data. I'm asking my colleagues to start looking at this data by race and ethnicity. I think we see a whole different story there. Part of the story I'm going to tell you this morning. And so, um, as you know, I'm director of the Maryland uh, Center for Health Equity. I love the state of Maryland. I'm flying the flag here right now. And I think we need to fly the flag. So around this, these images here are some of the examples of the community-engaged research infrastructure we have built over the past 20-plus years. And uh, I'm going to touch on a few of those to give you both context and then tell you one story that I hope will encapsulate the challenge and the opportunity that we have here today. So building trust. Now, this was a theme that has come up uh, in several of the talks. Uh, and here we have a work of our own uh, center, um, one of the scientific products of our National Bioethics Research Infrastructure Initiative is an online interactive building trust training curriculum for providers and for the community. And in the Q&A, we maybe can go into greater detail here. So context. I think that one of the challenges we have is to recognize that we need to move beyond a biomedical kind of frame and look at the social historical context in which the people we're trying to address live every single day. That's issues of poverty, issues of exposure to environmental toxins in their homes and neighborhoods, and most importantly, the need to tailor our message to that community, not just take something off the shelf and put it in Spanish and say, these are for the Hispanics, or take something off the shelf and put it at blackface on the cover and say this is for the African American community, but actually tailoring to the historical context of that community. And we all know about this civil rights movement and the nonviolence of Martin Luther King. Those are important messages, but here's the winds I'm hearing in the communities I work in that maybe we need to also listen to Frederick Douglass, who said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing the ground. They want the rain without the thunder and lightning. 
They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. If we want a future for this young lady here, standing in front of a Frederick Douglass statue on my University of Maryland campus in College Park, we need to be agitators. And when we hear the agitation from our community, we should not run from it. We should embrace it and understand the, the legitimate reasons why they're angry. So here's some examples of what our community-engaged infrastructure looks like on the ground, what cultural tailoring looks like. Back in 2001, the federal government launched a campaign called Take a Loved One to the Doctor Day. What a great program, online resources, press releases ready to go, and we realized in our communities the people didn't have doctors. But what a great idea. So we took that idea and flipped it on its head and said, let's take the health professional to the people. How about that? Let's take the health professional to those settings in the community that are already trusted. And who would have imagined that that is the black barbershop and beauty salon? Now, for those of you out there who go to supercuts and hair cutlery, let me tell you a little story. No self-respecting black barber would ever say, I'll get you in and out in 15 minutes, all right? You're gonna be there all day. Where's my soul brothers in the room? Come on, give me some support back there. It doesn't matter how much hair you have, you're going to be there all day. You're going to get caught up on the news. You're going to get caught up on sports. And every now and then in that chair, and in this scene you're looking at here, this is the pharmacist in the barbershop talking to a young man who probably hasn't seen a primary care physician since the last time he had a sports uh, physical. And in that space... Yes, there are TVs on, multiple TVs. Judge Judy over here and a football game over there. Multiple conversations. And yes, the music's playing all at the same time. And in that cacophony of noise is a space of privacy. And I'll never forget a day when a man came in people hadn't seen for a while. We'll call him Joe to protect his innocence. And they said, Joe, where you been? He said, you know, I have been in the hospital. They said I had a heart attack. They put me in for three days. And the doctor gave me these pills. He's pulling out the pills now. Everybody in the barbershop is listening right now. And the doctor says, I'm going to have to take these pills the rest of my life. And the barber said, you know, Joe, if you take those pills, you're not going to be able to keep up your obligations. Now, do I need to translate in here? Do I need to translate what obligation means? Joe, if you're experiencing erectile dysfunction, now we're back to the side effects. Joe's not going to take those pills. And his doctor has no idea there's somebody out in the community who's a barber, no degrees behind their name, has that kind of power, has that kind of influence. And that's because of trust. And that's when we recognize that what if that barber helped to reinforce the evidence base, help to reinforce the doctor's discharge orders. What if that barber said, hey, Joe, if you're experiencing erectile dysfunction, tell your doctor. They can change the medication. They can make an adjustment. But he would be ashamed. He would not tell his doctor he's not taking the medication. He'd rather not go back to the doctor instead of telling him that. And I used to think that the fear was that the fear was that man's own pride. You know, he's calling up to Scotty for more power. I need hydraulics. And there's nobody answering here. I used to think it was his pride, but I realized that it's his, the fear of his, his wife or loved one. Because if you don't have power for me, it must be going somewhere else. Come on, tell the truth now. I need an amen corner in here somewhere. <laughs> he's afraid that those side effects is going to affect his relationship with his loved one. That's not in any prescription. That's not in anybody's side effects. But he's not going to take those meds. And so we began bringing health professionals into these spaces to really build that trust, build that relationship, go where the people already have trust. We have a national program to train barbers and stylists to, 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 to make their venues safe places for health professionals to actually come and deliver services. The miniaturization of our diagnostic techniques means you no longer need to be tethered to a hospital or a clinic. Get out of the clinic. Get out of the hospital. In the communities I work in, they think going to those places means nothing but bad news. They live lives 
that are already complicated. The last thing they want is to be shamed because they didn't take their pills. Okay, now I got to get to the finish line here. We turn every other year our Xfinity basketball arena into a 120 chair emergency dental clinic. Um, we serve a thousand people over two days. People line up and sleep outside overnight. We are nine miles from the White House people in the richest nation in the world, right across the street from the FDA. And um, this young man here uh, came in, his mother dragged him in, and this is the situation in which he found himself. This quote comes from uh, another patient, and she says that because the majority of dental care is very expensive and we cannot afford it, if you ask me if I had pain in my tooth, but I have to give my children food, I prefer to buy food for them than take care of my own dental care. That's the decision people are making when they walk up to that pharmacy with all those prescriptions. Am I going to buy food or am I going to fill this prescription? Medical costs are very expensive. This is another quote. So anytime there is something free as it relates to medical, people will probably take advantage of it. This person saying, I'm looking around this space. There's 700 people around here today, and many of them may not be seen. But the fact that they can come here for a cleaning or perhaps get some uh, care, uh, something they haven't had in many years, so I think this program is being offered is great benefit. So my point here is to have Again, bring the clinical services outside of the hospital, outside of the clinic, give people what they need, in this case it was dental care, and then wrap around them all the other things you know they need. At this event, we had a pharmacy station. We encouraged people to bring their brown bags, bring all those meds you think mom's taken, so you can help and talk to a pharmacist to sort it out. This is how this young man left. This is how he left. And one day, we changed his life from this day forward, he trusts, he trusts us. From this day forward, he's going to listen. We met him where his need was first. That's what's missing. And there's no app, there's no technology that's going to address this issue of trust. You've got to look somebody in the eye. You've got to build a relationship. I don't even answer the phone at our house if that caller ID doesn't show up. So I don't know how these other systems are working. Because, and, and, and the communities we work in, when it comes up and it says hospital, they definitely are not going to pick up because they think it's a bill collector. So as the hospitals get more aggressive in collecting unpaid bills, people associate that phone call from the hospital system with another big headache. They're not picking up the phone. So how do we get onto their phones with our apps and with our resources? We believe we do that in a trusted place like a black barbershop and beauty salon. So we're here looking for partners to join us in a national campaign to mobilize these trusted venues, these humble venues, <coughs> to advance our efforts to promote health and prevent disease. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I think I have the misfortune of following that amazing talk, uh, so <laughs> I'll do my best, uh, but I probably can't compete. Um, I am a biostatistician and a behavioral economist, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done uh, with various colleagues over the years in trying to apply behavioral economic uh, interventions uh, to the problem of, of medication adherence, largely in the setting of chronic disease, although not exclusively. And uh, the speaker from the talk this morning did some of my work for me, so I will skip a little of this. Um, and I think we don't need to, to go over the many uh, uh, venues in which medication adherence is a huge problem. But there are some common elements to the, the task of medication adherence that I think are worth co considering and that relate to a lot of these behavioral economic concepts that we talk about. So it's a daily behavior, or often a more than once daily behavior, but certainly at least daily. There are varying degrees of burden associated with uh, medication adherence depending on uh, the complexity of the regimen and the potential side effects and other things that, again, we've heard about. 
this problem of no immediate benefits, I think, is really critical uh, because the, there are many negative things about remembering to take uh, medication every morning, not least of which is that you have some condition that requires you to take medication every morning and that you're reminded that you're not as healthy as you would like to be. And again, the, the immediate benefit is, is really absent. Um, and, and the tangible benefit is absent. So the benefit is that in 10 years, my risk of heart disease is going to be 15% less if I take this, you know, uh, this statin for the, for the next 10 years. Well, that's abstract and hard to, you know, make concrete. And so not only is it delayed, but it's, it's hard to conceptualize. And again, as I think was mentioned earlier, this is a behavior that's often completed privately. And uh, when things are completed privately, they're, you know, we're not accountable to other people. And so there are ways perhaps to try to adjust uh, the, the settings in which we uh, adhere to medication that could be useful. <clears throat> so again, uh, we know that behavioral econ ec economics is a, is a mixture of psychology and classical economics. Um, we are not a rational man, as I think is now clear. And we, as humans, make a series of predictable uh, decision errors. And I've listed a few of the, of the common uh, pitfalls that we suffer as, as human beings. I won't define them all. And again, we've heard a little bit about them earlier. And the idea is really to try to harness these, uh, these errors that we make and to use them uh, to, to design interventions that will make us do better rather than, than suffer from these pitfalls. One thing I also want to mention that I don't know that has been mentioned yet, but is really a foundational pillar of a lot of the behavioral economic inter interventions that we might develop, is that defaults are extremely powerful. <clears throat> so changing the default uh, in a lots of different settings is a very good way to actually make a pretty substantial change in people's behavior. And so we can take lessons from the early uh, work in defaulting people into retirement savings plans that you know, dramatically uh, shifted the percentages of people who began saving for retirement, all because they didn't have to actually sign up. So, so making things opt out rather than opt in, uh, I think is a really important feature to keep in mind, along with a lot of other things that we could develop over time. <clears throat> So I want to just spend a few minutes on one uh, intervention that I've worked with very closely. So before I was at NYU, I was at the University of Pennsylvania, and I worked very closely and still work closely with David Ash and Kevin Volpe, who are leaders in this area. And one of the interventions that we've uh, used in many settings and tried to fine tune and develop over the years is a daily lottery. And the idea here is to harness multiple uh, of, these, of these behavioral economic decision errors that, that we suffer from in one uh, kind of package. So the way the lottery works is that you have some sort of daily behavior, which could be medication adherence, it could be walking 5,000 steps, it could be uh, adhering to a diet or, or other things. And you're entered into a daily lottery that, that matches that daily behavior. And there's some uh, relatively large chance, like maybe 20% of some small reward, like three or five dollars. And there's a relatively small chance, like maybe 1% of a large reward, like 50 or 100 dollars. And you uh, have a number, so my number might be 43, and every day we draw a lottery number, and if one of the numbers matches, I get that small reward, and if both match, I get that large reward. But the key is that it's a so-called regret lottery, so that I only get the reward if I actually did the behavior the day before. And I get a message, so say, say I'm supposed to take my medication, and I didn't take my medication yesterday, and my lottery number came up today and I won, I get a message that says, oh, congratulations, you won the lottery, oh, but sorry, you don't get the money because you didn't take your pill yesterday. So there's this concept of loss and regret that we as humans, again, have a really hard time with, and it's very motivating to avoid that, that feeling in the future, that bad feeling of, of loss and regret. And so we found this to be a very powerful combination of, of uh, elements that, that has been not uniformly successful, as we heard uh, in one of the questions earlier, but often very uh, successful in a variety of settings. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all of these uh, interventions in detail just due to time, but again, I think deposit contracts are another really uh, powerful way to, mo to uh, leverage this loss aversion. So you put money down up front, or, or you're given virtual money up front, but you feel like you've been given it. And then as you, uh, again, as was described earlier, as, that, as you fail to do what you're supposed to do, that money is taken away, and that's a powerful sense of loss. I also want to focus a little bit on social incentives. So um, I, we've done a lot of work in, in financial incentives, but in addition, uh, social incentives can be very powerful. And there are settings in which financial incentives, for various reasons, may not be possible to implement, but uh, social incentives are almost universally uh, possible. So you can do things like identify support partners, 
where, which, which is a way of perhaps making this private behavior a little bit more visible. So I might say, all right, my, uh, my adult daughter will be my support partner. And every time I'm non adherent for a few days in a row, she's going to get a text message that says, mom is not taking her meds. And she's going to call me up and say, WTF, why, what's going on? You know, like, can we please, you know, get over this, go do what you're supposed to do. Or she's going to call me up and say, are you sick? What's wrong? You know, she'll, she'll help me. Um, and so not only do that, I have some social support, but I have some accountability that I didn't have before. And I know that if I don't take my meds, she's going to call me and I'm going to have to explain and I'd, I'd rather just take the pill and not have to have that whole big conversation, right? So uh, there are a lot of ways to improve our behavior simply by knowing that other people might be aware of what we're doing. And, and there's a fine line between being like a little creepy and, and, and watching over people too closely. But in fact, um, our experience with this is that most people feel supported by this and not spied on. Um, and so, you know, the framing is important, but uh, it's doable in a lot of ways that uh, can be helpful. <clears throat> and then last, um, those are interventions that are primarily directed at, at patients or, or people, as we might just call them. Um, but in addition, we have incentives that could be directed toward providers. And we heard a little bit about this uh, just earlier this morning. Um, and these can be made more salient for providers and, again, try to provide accountability and potentially even competition uh, to leverage those, uh, those uh, kinds of activities. So I want to briefly talk about one example um, that I worked on when I was at Penn, which was a nice trial because it, was a com it looked at a, the combination of both patient and provider-focused incentives. So there were four arms of the study. One was a lottery like the one I described for patients to take daily statins. Uh, there was a provider incentive arm in which providers got quarterly payments if their patients met their goals. And then there was a combined incentive arm in which both were the patients received the lottery and the providers received the payments, but each had half the value so that the total outlay should be the same for a, for a compliant patient. And the primary outcome uh, was, was reduction in LDL values, but we also measured uh, uh, adherence. And so this is the really where the information is. You can see um, a couple of interesting things in this, in this uh, slide. The, uh, all of the patients did very well in the first three months. So everybody had this massive drop in LDL, and that's great um, in general, but was a little less great from the standpoint of trying to show that our interventions were effective. Um, and so there are some reasons we think we understand that now. And then you can, as you can see, so everyone's LDL went nicely down in the first three months and then pre stayed pretty stable over the year in which the interventions were active. And if you look at the colors, the control group is the yellow group, which had the least amount of you know, improvement and, and stayed uh, the highest LDL over time. And the shared incentive group, which is the blue line, uh, had the largest drop and then continued uh, to improve a little bit uh, so that they had the best overall result. One thing that was very interesting about this was that the only statistically significant uh, result that we found was comparing the control group to the shared incentive group. And we were a little bit surprised by this initially because we really thought that the, the patient lottery would be you know, one of the primary uh, things that was impacting adherence. And it turns out that that was true. Uh, but what we failed to predict was the physician uh, the, the lack of uh, correct attention by the physicians to the problem of uh, not only adherence but prescription. So <clears throat> it turned out that among the patients in the incentive arm, whether it was full lottery or half value, there was statistically significant improvement in adherence as measured by Bailey, you know, pill cap taking. And among uh, the patients whose physicians were receiving incentives, again, at either full or half amount, there was a statistically significant increase uh, either new prescription of statins or intensification of statins to uh, you know a more effective to a to a more potent uh, medication or a higher dose or something of that sort, and so uh, you can see here the adherence in the in the patients is highest among those in the shared and the patient incentive arms and lower among those in the physician arms because they weren't receiving any feedback about their adherence. Um, so. The physician incentives are no better than the control. The patient incentives were no better than the control. Combined, uh, they worked, but each at half value. So as, as David Ash always likes to say, it's a strange uh, event when you take two inert substances and uh, cut them in half and combine them, and suddenly uh, you have an effect. So what is going on? Well, again, in retrospect, it's easy to understand. The patients can't take medication that they don't have. So the prescript the 
providers need to do their job at appropriately prescribing the medications, and then the patients need to do their job in taking the medications. So both of those things have to happen, and it's only when both of those things are being targeted that we see uh, a statistically significant effect. I want to say one more thing about incentives in general um, for both patients and providers. There's uh, and along the lines of some of the comments this morning about, about you know, patients who are non-adherent are, you know, are bad people or they're somehow in, inferior or they're somehow not doing what they're supposed to be doing and we should criticize them. Uh, so, so people often make this argument about financial incentives in a, in a wide range of areas. You know, why should we reward people for bad behavior? Why should we uh, pay them when they're not being adherent? And you know, what about the people who are being adherent? They get nothing. You know, it, it's, it's so unfair. Um, and similarly, why should we pay doctors to do their jobs? You know, doctors are supposed to be doing this anyway, so why, why do we have to reward them? Well, I think there's a couple of responses to that. First, we're not, we're not rewarding bad behavior. It's not bad behavior. It's a failure of systems and human foibles and a lot of other things, and it's not, it's not something that you know, should be punished. It's just another way to try to help people do what, what is good for them to do. And so it's important to, to realize that. And in terms of the physician payments, you know, Physicians aren't volunteers. We pay physicians to do their jobs. It's just a question of focusing attention and where that payment is. And there are already, you know, hundreds of built-in ways that we incentivize physicians to do various other things. So it's just, again, part of, of the package of how we think about what we're doing in order to, uh, to make progress and, and help the, the patients that we're here, you know, to support in the first place. <clears throat> okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jocelyn Ulrich with Pharma. Uh, we represent America's leading biopharmaceutical research companies, and so I'm going to try to present a little bit of the 50,000-foot view of the industry and um, what we have to say on improving adherence. So I think we've well covered um, the benefits and challenges of adhering to medicines appropriately. Um, there's savings to the patient, benefits to the patient, savings to society overall. So I'll just kind of quickly skip through these. Um, so the first thing I wanted to touch on a bit is you know, patient-focused drug development um, as an important driver of providing um, medicines that can be more easily adhered to. So thinking about the patient, the end user as we develop medicines, um, getting patient preference information up front so that um, we know that a side effect, such as Dr. Thomas mentioned, would be something that would cause someone to not take the medicine. And so thinking about how to develop things um, that are more easily acceptable to patients at the end state. And as researchers listen more to patients uh, and develop new uses that are meaningful to them, their caregivers and their physicians are able to innovate these new ways. And so that's a really important driver that I think is getting a lot of um, attention at the FDA, they're doing a lot of good thinking around this, and I think will be an important driver of um, better medicines so that are, are more able to be adhered to and can overcome some of the barriers that we've talked about. Um, new forms and dosing options are also increasingly an important way to think about how to increase adherence. So I'm going to touch on three primary ways in which the new development of medicines can improve. Um, many patients must take multiple medicines. We saw that picture that Dr. Thomas again had in his slides about how complex and challenging it can be to um, maintain a, a therapy. And so um, medicine regimens can be uh, combined, so fixed dose combinations, chemically bringing these medicines together in ways that cannot be separated are a really important driver for how we can help patients and improve health outcomes. Um, research, research has shown that the average adherence rate for treatments taken once a day is nearly 80% compared to about 50% for medicines that have to be taken four times a day. So though this may seem like incremental innovation, I think from an adherence perspective, we're talking about a quite significant benefit in really simplifying uh, regimens. Another study showed that across medical conditions, administering drugs as fixed dose combinations versus separate pills significantly increase the likelihood of adherence. So we have data that this is really helpful. 
Long-acting formulations of medicines often brings the same benefits as fixed dose combinations. So these are formulations that can include extended release preparations, such as once daily, once weekly, once monthly. Um, and that really removes that daily burden and also can be very, very beneficial for patients. Um, extended release medicines can increase the length of time, reducing the number of doses needed, and giving greater flexibility. Um, for example, one analysis found that across acute and chronic disease states, reducing the frequency of oral therapies from multiple dosing to once daily was shown to improve adherence and reduce medical costs. Over time, scientific and manufacturing advances may enable new ways for packaging or delivering, and here we're th um, manufacturers are increasingly thinking about new ways of administering, such as moving to patches, um, chewable tablets, injectables that can be self-administered rather than having to go to a physician's office, and all of these things are also very helpful in overcoming barriers. There are also a range of policies that can better promote uh, use of medicine. So patient education, I think we've talked quite a bit about this morning, um, ensuring that medicines can keep their patients, but there's other things that are being utilized as well. So having sound evidence-based and robustly validated shared decision-making tools can be a helpful aid for patients. Um, having conversations with their providers and better understanding their diseases to make informed decisions. When patients are then more invested in their care plan, they have a better sense of their medications, risks, and benefits, and they're more likely to be adherent. Medication therapy management is another program that was created out of the Part D benefit to promote the safe use of medicines. Um, these can help ensure patients are taking the right medicines and reconcile issues that could result in duplicate or contraindicated medicines. And there's evidence here that well-defined and targeted medication therapy management programs can improve adherence and result even in fewer hospitalizations. Another simple intervention to improve adherence uh, is for patients who are taking multiple medicines to synchronize their refills. Um, so that patients only need to go to the pharmacy once to refill all of them. And medication synchronization programs are being adopted rapidly across the country. A study out of Harvard found that improved adherence due to medication synchronization can reduce hospitalizations by up to 9%, uh, translating to about $4 billion uh, annually. And then um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the interesting technological advancements, not just companion apps, but within the medicine themselves. Um, and finally, value-based payment arrangements are ways to enhance incentives for manufacturers to be attentive to how their products are being used, whether the patients who use their products benefit clinically. So similar to some of the incentives from the um, from the payer side, here we're talking about um, an outcomes-based contract. Specifically, manufacturers receive a smaller net payment when the medication does not result in the specified outcome, which creates incentives for them to work with the physician in order to ensure that the patients are being adherent. Um, and these often include provisions to track adherence so as to distinguish outcomes associated with non-adherence from those associated with um, incorrect use of the product. So I'm um, talking a little bit some of the interesting and really innovative ways that we're now thinking about digital tools to enhance um, medication adherence. So digital tools are a really interesting um, part of development. Um, they are uh, increasingly being looked at as, uh, I think, in both the regulatory decision-making process, but also in thinking about how we're helping with patients. So uh, one company has developed insulin pens with a digital display and a memory function embedded into the pen, and then launch a feature to capture the insulin dose through Bluetooth-enabled smart device attached to the pen, and the attachment then transmits this dose, time of dose, and the type of insulin to a phone app, which helps the patient um, track their dosing, and then the user or care provider can also look back, identify in patterns, and identify when doses have been missed. Um, and this can also include analytics of their usage over time, and, and those kinds of tools are really, really beneficial for understanding how well um, patients are able to adhere. There are also companion apps for um, treatments such as hemophilia. Um, these can help patients track bleeds, infusions, factor supply, um, as well as sharing that data with their healthcare team. And finally, oral medicines with ingestible sensors uh, for treating schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression, and other diseases where, um, or conditions where adherence can be a real challenge, um, can really help uh, ensure that patients are, are getting the, the right dosage and the levels they need. 
So all these are innovative ways to leverage cutting edge technology. Um, and though adherence is a public health problem, there are many available tools and policies that can work together to improve adherence. And I look forward to discussing further with the panel what some of those other ideas might be. Thank you. Good morning. All right. Um, I think you know, I really, really appreciated this panel. Uh, I think there was a lot, a lot of uh, very, very excellent content and suggestions that came out of this. Um, you know, I mean, finally, we're here talking about adherence. There aren't as many cameras here as at the House Judiciary uh, Chamber today, but you know, we're really talking about this topic now and bringing bringing people across the healthcare uh, sector together to solve the problem. You know, I'm a, I'm a West Coaster, actually, um, although like most Americans, I was born in New Jersey, but I, I grew up in California, spent a lot of my medical career there and in Hawaii, <clears throat> and uh, director of health in the state of Hawaii, was in the U.S. Public Health Service for quite a while uh, out in Arizona with the uh, Navajo Indian people, did a lot of different things in medicine. Um, including running the California Medical Association for a number of years. But adherence wasn't, you know, on my mind during any of that time, actually. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, and actually, back in those days, I just want to thank the uh, uh, Duke Margolis Center for, for bringing us all together today. That's, that's terrific. Um, Bob Margolis and I were, were good friends back in the California days. Uh, Bob started uh, healthcare partners in Southern California. And he provided medical care in communities that really um, were pretty threatened uh, in terms of health. They were lower, lower income communities, people that didn't have a lot of services. <clears throat> and it wasn't really the, the, the kind of place that most physicians wanted to go work in, in that setting that he set up because these were managed care, um, capitated kinds of operations and they were not paying the highest salaries for physicians actually. <clears throat> um, but over the years, Bob was able to develop systems of care that started producing better outcomes and all the hoity-toity super um, high-end um, programs were offering. And uh, you know, I mean, of course, healthcare partners eventually sold for bi some billions of dollars and it was a quite, a, <laughs> quite an operation and now he's got philanthropies going. But I remember how, how that worked and Bob was actually looking at things like adherence back in those days because he realized that outcomes were related to adherence and, a, and, a, and it made a big difference and he had more flexibility because of the payment model. So I think about that and I'm, I'm glad to see Duke bringing this up today because it's, it goes back to the history of Bob Margolis himself um, and uh, the amazing career he had. Um, I was appointed uh, I think 2011, 2012, something like that to an FDA panel called uh, EASI, Enhanced Medical Adherence Strategic Initiative. Um, and we worked away for, I'd say, five, six years, really hard, on trying to figure out how, how to improve adherence. And you know, I was motivated to do that now because I had been recruited back to Washington, D.C. here to be the CEO of the American College of Cardiology. And to our dismay, we learned and realized we were building these national cardiovascular data registry systems that had eventually spread to every hospital in America with a cardiac service. And, and so, at least in the cardiology space, we'd been able to measure outcomes in a very um, sophisticated way on the inpatient side, and we're you know, getting to the outpatient side. And as we did, we realized that 50% or more of the patients with serious cardiac problems, life-threatening conditions, weren't taking their medicines. So, uh, so it really went way up on the radar screen. And uh, so I was, I was really happy to be part of this, this FDA panel. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I think part of the perspective, though, goes back to me being a physician. Because uh, I guess the, um, the, the perspective I had was that, and I realized this really when I got to the ACC, which is that the most significant priority of, of all in terms of uh, improving cardiovascular outcomes it wasn't, uh, you know, 
getting TAVR, transcatheter aortic valves to everybody, which is fantastic science, or all the newest stents and all the newest, you know, bioresorbable stents and all the newest electrophysiologic innovations. I mean, what we've done in cardiology is pretty amazing in terms of 30 plus years of seeing a reduction in morbidity and mortality every year uh, until about two years ago when the impact of diabetes has been felt and the numbers are going in the wrong direction again. Um, and so, but you know, we know, a lot was going on there, but the really biggest priority, and it was kind of humbling to see this, is, is to improve adherence. The biggest impact on outcomes. Not all that fancy super stuff. And look, science is on a roll. It's so impressive to see what, what's happening in, in terms of science today. And it's gonna even accelerate and be more amazing. We'll just kind of wonder how we're gonna pay for it, but it's coming, right? But adherence is actually bigger than all that stuff. So uh, that was, that was, it was humbling, actually. And then we've, we've learned and we've heard this here today that predicting non-adherence in a patient is almost impossible. You can't, there's just, you know, it doesn't go, it doesn't go by gender or ethnicity or uh, income or education. So it's, it's very, it's very perplexing. Uh, and the physician, you know, the doctor perspective, and I had this myself, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I, we all think as physicians um, and clinicians that uh, our patients are absolutely adherent. We just assume that, right? I mean, we, I'm seriously, this is just a, a common assumption. I've talked to many, many colleagues about it. Yeah, it's terrible, but you know, I know my patients are, they're taking their meds. Sure they are, you know, um, and, and that's, in fact, we, we, we know that so that when they come in and the, the lab values don't meet, you know, our, our therapeutic goals, all we have to do is double the dose of the medicine they're not taking. It's so simple. And in fact, that happens all the time in medicine. Um, you know, so it, it's a very complex problem. And we've heard a lot of things today that I think, you know, are worth actually re-emphasizing a bit because they're so important. But um, trust between the patient and the clinician is a huge issue in, in this area. And it's, and Marie Brown talked about it this morning, but it's something we could, we really can improve upon. Um, because the patient-physician relationship is seriously on the decline. Um, you know, we're, um, I, I was in, you know, visiting a, one of my, my, my own personal physician uh, recently, and I and had to say to him, um, you know what, I think when the next patient comes in, I think it'd be better if you didn't have your back turned, you know, working on the computer during the, during the visit. You know, I'm fine with it. I know you have a lot of stuff to do. You want to catch up tonight? Okay, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm okay. But you know what? I'm, I'd really suggest against this with the next patient, okay? And, uh, you know, we, we're laughing about it and so forth. But that's the reality. The, you know, the patient-physician relationship is threatened today. And as a result, that trust, that trust issue, yeah. You know, I feel strongly about this stuff. Um, the trust issue, uh, you know, is, is really... It's a big deal. Um, and um, I, I, the other thing I think that's on the decline is the art of medicine, quite frankly. You know, the idea that um, you look at people, you listen to them, you really try to hear what they're saying, you try to act on that, try to understand them. In fact, there's even an element of the art of medicine, because science is just everything now. But the art of medicine also implies intuition. You know, everything's normal, except you know something is wrong. And, and you know, I, I don't think we're even training, you know, future clinicians in this regard, and I think it's a very big mistake. In the future, most of the knowledge in healthcare will be, uh, be locked up in, uh, in systems, and we might really need to bring, bring people into, into medical training on the basis of their empathy levels. But anyway, let me get to the, in the, in the easy program, um, what we learned after several years of working was that nothing worked. We weren't getting, we didn't seem to be getting adherence. I want to say something to you, Matt Loper, because I, your company came before the, the, the easy uh, FDA committee, and I, I'm, I'm really impressed with the progress Wealth has made in terms of actually measuring reduced hospital admissions and emergency visits. So when we're taking these kinds of systems, we've heard some great ideas today, but that's the result has to be at that end. It has to be reduced admissions to the hospital, reduced ED visits, and so forth. And uh, we obviously need data to support teams, and we need physician alerts and incentives, and we need 
you know, b better lab analysis connections back to the fact that there may be an adherence problem when therapeutic goals aren't reached, high risk patient focus and, um, and, and some of the payer provider solutions and transitions of care are where many, many problems occur. So I'll just leave you with these um, take homes for me and what the National Coalition thinks are the, are the big deals here. Let's, let's improve the patient-physician relationship. It's gonna improve adherence. Let's reemphasize the art of medicine. Uh, and, and let's get the clinician coordination improved in a way that will help adherence. And that's across the whole spectrum of the pharmacists and everybody. Um, let's get payment reform that actually promotes the ability to do different things. Um, research is not clinical care. We've got to remember that. So what happens in, in the, what we publish in manuscripts is not what we see in real practice. We got to, and uh, data integration at the point of care has got to get much, much better. Social determinants of health are critically important. And, and finally, there are going to be some new products out there, polypills and so forth. I'm part of an advisory group for a medicines company on a, a drug called Inclisiran. It's a statin that is a shot that you give once a year. How about that for amazing? Well, that's going to help adherence, but there are going to be a lot of other things we need to do. So anyway, thanks for being here today. Look forward to having a, for a future conversation. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the panel. Um, we, we are um, getting close to lunch, so we'll have a little bit of a dialogue, um, but we also have uh, ample time towards the back, um, so you have to stick around for the rest of the conference to uh, participate. Um, but just let me quickly summarize, and then maybe if there's one or two quick questions, we could probably open it up. Um, just going from the left to the right, what's fascinating to me is, is that there's a 7%. The 7% is a consistent finding, typically in a real world situation. Josh presented it with his findings. Um, medication synchronization, the publication looking, it demonstrates about a 7% lift. So across a lot of these different interventions, we're seeing a, you know, about five to 10% increase, but not these huge effects. But they're really these com um, small effects, but on a population level. And that's also another important point for us to think about. You know, most of us think of our trials or research thinking about within a small community and environment. What we're not thinking about is scalability and implementation. So as um, jo Josh presented, I really think about that. So imagine taking your trial of 300, and what does that mean to put it among 30,000 people? And then you're starting to think about, as Josh presented, perhaps different types of interventions or different dosages of interventions as we think about it. And the other question that we'll get into more, I think from a methodological is, is we know that if it works, again, is a control arm of usual care, however we define it, appropriate? And that may not be necessarily the case. I think Stephen's point about uh, culture, community, social influence, there's not much more I can say about that. I mean, it's absolutely essential. Uh, and I think that we need to include that. And I think it also raises the issue of social influence and what used to be called social determinants. I like social influence because it means that it's modifiable. But these are really, really important aspects in getting out into the community outside the clinic. Um, so as we think about roles and who and what we're doing, we may need to think more about who those individuals are. So health workers, uh, people that are trained, their community members, those are things that we can think more about. Um, uh, Andrea's uh, point, I just a couple of things that really struck me, back to a methodological issue, time is really important. So if her results were demonstrated for the three months, uh, with that one slide, you would have gotten a very different I outcome or impression than if you went to 18 months. And so how do we think about time in these programs? What's appropriate? Is it six months, 12 months? What about sustainability? Um, we talk about an implementation effect, uh, implementation science, a voltage drop. The idea that we basically see something and then as we take our eye off it, we see changes and decreasing. So as we think about methods and programs and how do we measure this, what is the right timeline? How do we measure that? Because if I just take one snap of time, it's like walking into a river. It's just one point. It doesn't represent what the whole journey for that individual is. And I think that's important for us to remember is the journey of the individual. I also like the idea that of um, the multi-level. I think the idea of having the patient provider is a great example that it takes two to tangle at least, right? So if we're only focusing on the patient, we're really not gonna have a big impact. Um, uh, Jocelyn's point, I think, uh, in terms of shared decision making she brought up, I thought was absolutely essential. So 
if we're thinking about the process initiation, really important to have that, that shared decision making. It doesn't matter what the drug is, but somebody needs to understand why am I being prescribed this? What are the risks? What are the benefits? What should I, um, what should I uh, um, expect to happen? particularly side effects. So we find that if we tell them this is some of the things that you may experience, this is what you can do, that can help alleviate some of that. But it comes back down to trust and communication. So as we think about our programs, where is all that, the communication in there? And then I think Jack did a nice job of just summarizing where some of the uh, fundamental issues are uh, with regards to intervention, the roles of physicians, and as we think about how we make a difference. But I think we uh, will start moving into more methods and try to think about some other pieces. But I think this is a nice snapshot of different interventions. Clearly not one of them by themselves are gonna solve the problem, but um, nice different snapshot of the issues there. Um, why don't I, um, so um, for the panel, I guess we'll start that. And then if anybody does have a question, why don't you, oh, we have one walking up there. What I guess for the panel I'd like you to think about is um, seeing that snapshot, um, how, how should we think about the diverse interventions that even just the five of you have presented and how can we think about it? Is it a toolbox or um, how, how do those, all those pieces fit together if anybody has some thoughts? Andrew? Yeah, I think that's a really important question and I think it's closely related to this idea of, of tailoring and, and you know, trying to make sure that the strategies that we use are the right ones for the right people. And uh, um, I think it's a very difficult task certainly and I think thinking of it as a toolbox and trying to find, again, not the right intervention for a person, but the, the right combination of interventions, I think it is always gonna take multiple angles to tackle this problem because it's a difficult one. Um, related to that, and, and in response to one of the questions earlier this morning about the HeartStrong trial, which is one of the, the unsuccessful trials that I also <laughs> have worked on, the, the, the explanation for why that, you know, multi-pronged, what should have been, you know, this beautiful intervention, I think was not so effective, is that it was a beautiful intervention for people who actually didn't need that intervention. <laughs> um, so we, because the, of the enrollment barriers to getting into the trial, which is another area that's you know, sort of separate, but, but very related to a lot of this work and another area that I'm really interested in. The, the participants in the trial were actually very engaged with their health and their providers and their processes and everything else. And so they were actually reasonably adherent uh, to their medications. So we didn't change their medication adherence because it was already pretty good. And so we didn't have the resulting lift in outcomes that we were hoping for because it was, you know, it's not like you can just they had to be willing to answer the phone, open the FedEx package, talk to three different study coordinators, give us their social security number so that we could pay them. You know, like that was a huge, mm -hmm. uh, a huge set of things that they had to do. And many people just like, you know, like you say, don't answer the phone. I don't know who the University of Pennsylvania is. We recruited nationally. I'm in, I'm in, you know, Utah. I don't know who these people are. I'm not gonna answer the phone. Yeah. So, so getting to that level, you know, they were already kind of close to where they needed to be. Great. You could use uh, Josh's IDR with the, 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 the yeah. outside there. Uh, Jack, what yeah, I think I actually building a little bit on that, I think that, uh, you know, it, that's looking toward the, you know, we all know that the 5% of the population, you know, consumes 50% of the healthcare resources, right? That, that kind of a cliche out there. It's, it's a kind of a global phenomenon, really. But we should be looking at the people who are the highest risk. We should be putting the efforts there. And secondly, we need to look where health disparities are most pronounced um, and, and, and focus there as well. And if we, if we put all this great, these great ideas, uh, you know, in those, shining in those areas, I think we're gonna see the best results. And that's, I think that's what Matt Loper seen from the data I've seen is the fact that they've applied their program through the health plans and others to people at greatest risk. And then they've had the result of reduced hospitalizations and, and ED visits. So we've got to focus on, on where the, the needs are the greatest and where the disparities are the most pronounced. Great, thanks, Jack. Um, Ma'am, could you just introduce yourself and go ahead? I'm Lisa Schwartz from the National Community Pharmacists Association. NCPA represents the 21 or 21,000 community pharmacies in the country. And I want to add to the conversation that there is a network of clinically integrated pharmacies, um, 2,500 and growing, that are addressing a lot of the, the barriers, some of the um, interventions that we've been talking about. So, for example, um, these pharmacies all synchronize refills and employ community health workers to hand deliver the refills to people who have transportation barriers. 
these community health workers can also make observations about the patients in their home or in their workplace, wherever they're being delivered. Um, and those sorts of things get reported back to the pharmacy. And of particular interest to prescriber folks in the room, these pharmacies are also taking that information and documenting it in an electronic standard that can be exchanged with, um, with the EHR or it can be exchanged in a, you know, like a PDF sort of format with the patients. Everybody gets the benefit of the information the pharmacy's collecting. Great, thanks for sharing. Question? Yeah, it's actually, uh, it was great that Joshua and Dr. Thomas, you were together in terms of my question. One is that, you know, I'm always struck by that 50% or so who aren't reached and the fact that you may not know a lot about them and how they may differ tremendously, which could potentially cause you to discount a particular intervention because it might have been really successful in that 50% that you didn't reach. And that gets, you know, Dr. Thomas, to what you were saying about don't pick up the phone, may not open that envelope if the mail comes to you at home or the service isn't provided in the places where people have trust. And, and I just wonder, is there a way to start measuring more of that on the front end as people enter into the healthcare system um, so that we can do better predictive analyses of, of what the issues might be? I think the answer is absolutely yes, but it requires the health professional to leave the comfort zone of the clinic. And you know what we have found when we bring them into our, uh, our, our uh, humble barbershops and beauty salons? They love it. They love it. Why do they love it? It reminds them of why they became a physician or a nurse in the first place. They're finally reaching the people that they're not seeing other than in the emergency room. So there's a double edge. One, reaching a patient population outside of a clinical setting, in a setting they trust, and improving the cultural confidence of health professionals to recognize that it is not simply taking an online competence survey once a year, along with your sexual harassment surveys, that it is a lifelong commitment to self-reflection. And you can't do that unless you're actually interacting face-to-face -face with the very high-risk populations we're talking about. It diminishes the shame. It gives them new language. And it gives them a better understanding of the complex lives that our patient populations are living in. And it gives us ammunition to go back to our systems, to our CEOs and CFOs to say, Here's what we're seeing in the community. This is our problem. There's some changes we have to make, not only at the individual level, but at the level of our own institutional organizational practices. That's a conversation we need to have, and it starts by meeting people where they are, where they live, every day. I just want to add to your, your very astute point that um, you know, telephone is only ever going to allow us to reach a certain segment of the population, and it may not be the highest risk segment of the population. Um, we also have issues with people who opt out of phone calls. Laws are getting more and more protective of people's um, telephones. And, um, and so we have plans now who are declining to use the cell phone numbers they do have on file for patients for these reasons. So where I think this is probably headed next in response to that challenge is more of the risk for adherence is going to be transferred to the providers who are going to see these patients in other settings. And it's going to be the hospitals and the pharmacies and the physician practices. And so um, I think that's why those providers need to be ready to deliver greater services to these at-risk patients when they're identified for them. Because they may be our only way of interacting with these patients in addition to, you know, community-based, um, you know, folks who can engage them as well. So maybe one way to try to draw a little bit of comp um, threads through everything that was said is, I think of precision medicine and population health, they're not actually dichotomous. There really is, precision medicine is identifying those individuals that may be on the high end, whatever, however you define it, high risk, where I'm gonna put more resources, I may use more community pharmacists. There may be a group that may just need something else, a little bit low touch and then something periodically checking in with them. The one issue I would just say is, in response to what Jack had said, is I, I think that there are the high risk, but if we also uh, move the population by 5% with regards to blood pressure, for example, we have a huge impact. And so there's kind of this multi-model. And so as I think also from a methodological perspective, 
you know, the QI quality improvement is a really good place to look be, or even thinking about how we clinically practice. If a patient is not improving, our tendency is unfortunately to add more medication, which we could discuss that maybe sometimes it's actually more appropriate to simplify it. But we would never necessarily, if we're not seeing changes, we're not going to have that person in the same arm doing the same thing for 12 months. But that's the way our trials are set up with fidelity, right? Why can't we think about a model where we could probably perhaps change it every three months? If someone's not meeting a milestone or a goal, um, we may increase the dosage. If they do, maybe we wrap it down and they get a booster or something else. So just trying to think a little bit outside the mindset, but I think that gets at some of the variation that Josh was presenting and Stephen was presenting with regards to the community and the large scale. Because at some day, at the point too, is we have to get it to a point of scalability, right? Because we can't have these little, small, little programs that are going on that aren't really well connected. I think that actually could have adverse events if we're not careful. One last comment, and then, uh, but you're the last person before lunch, just to let you all know. <laughs> but why don't you introduce yourself, if you don't mind? Sure. I'm Dr. Fadiyibi from City of Philadelphia. I work for the Department of Behavioral Health down in Philadelphia, and I have one question specifically for Dr. Troxel and the second for the group. Um, to Dr. Troxel, it's just more of a clarifying question. For the, uh, the intervention you were speaking about with the financial incentives, how were you tracking daily adherence? Like, were they self-reporting it? Because I'm assuming the PDC may not be the greatest deal for that. So understanding that. And then for the whole group, a lot of the focus, I think, today so far has been on physical health medications, so diabetes and heart disease. In my work, I do a lot of work around adherence to antipsychotic medications, antidepressants, um, ADHD in children. So it would be helpful if you all can just weigh in on your work in, that, in those different populations. And also, if you think these interventions we're talking about today are generalizable to those populations. Thanks. So I can just clarify, yes, we uh, issued all of the participants in the trial electronic pill bottles, and so we got a signal when they opened the cap. Uh, and that actually, in retrospect, was one of the reasons that the control arm also did so well, uh, because we did focus groups afterwards and asked them, you know, what was going on, and they said, oh, you know, they knew, we obviously told them that we were going to be measuring their adherence, and they, they felt happy about it. They said, oh, the health system cares about me. They're watching over me. You know, again, not a big brothery kind of uh, thing, but a, but a feeling taken care of. And so they were likely much more adherent be just because we gave them the bottles, even though they had no reminders or anything. Um, so again, unintended consequences are lurking everywhere, and we have to be careful. Great, thanks. Um, I think, though, in terms of the content and, and other areas, I mean, I think that's an important point that we have to be careful that what we're talking about and generalizable, but the reality is no patient is just taking typically one medication or has one condition. And so uh, we heard a little bit of diabetes with mental health and de depression and anxiety, um, but I think we have to be mindful that uh, different conditions may be more specific or we need to consider more um, different, different uh, uh, consider it in a certain context differently. So. Um, so I do have a couple of logistical things. Some of you have luggage and you've left it outside. Uh, apparently that is not acceptable. Someone's gonna steal it or, or we're told to move it inside if you could. Uh, maybe we could just put it over there or wherever else it is. Uh, we're gonna break for, as I look to the bosses, an hour, 45 minutes, an hour. How about, how, about, how about everyone come back at 1 o'clock? You can estimate what time, uh, how much that time is. Uh, we have two more working groups, um, and then we're going to get um, move forward. So appreciate everybody's comments, thoughts. Um, I think most of the people uh, that have already presented will be around. So if you have further questions, I know we didn't get to all of them. Uh, and we will have more time later in the afternoon for other questions. So thanks. And uh, lunch, uh, is it clear where to go or what to do? Great, okay, so back there, lunch information and any questions you may have. So see you back at one o'clock and please bring your luggage in if you could. So.
Welcome back, everyone, for those who've come back. Um, some of you may be here physically and not necessarily mentally, but we'll, we'll all wrap around. Um, I think um, first two sessions were good. I think helps frame where we're going. Um, I think now thinking more about some of the methods and measuring will be uh, what we'll talk about. So um, some more keep your brain uh, thinking and moving forward. So session three, we'll start um, looking at measuring and evaluating medication adherence. Um, and so already, as I said, this morning we talked more about some of the barriers. Um, and then uh, the last panel, we had some specific interventions. So I think that's helpful to kind of frame where things are. Um, but now we're gonna go into a deeper dive into specific research questions on how to measure adherence. Uh, and its impact on clinically meaningful outcomes. So that's gonna be an important part um, for us to think about. Um, so maybe if I could, uh, could I have um, Bernard come up, Mike, Neha, and uh, Janet, please. So in addition to measuring, we also have to, as we'll talk more, you'll hear more about context, and we've already started bringing that up, and I think that's an important part uh, for us to think about. And um, as, you, as we proceed, um, I think it's important to imagine that there are probably gonna be different me methods for measurement, and then trying to find what are those appropriate, uh, linking the right methods for the right question. So. Um, let me introduce uh, Bernard Verjean, who have had the pleasure of working through in multiple uh, uh, in manners. Um, one thing to keep in mind, as I mentioned before, um, Bernard is involved with ESPICOM, which is a European organization really focusing on medication adherence and really, I think, uh, leading a lot of the measurement, particularly ABC taxonomy. And uh, for those of you that are really uh, data geeks and really into this, I, I would encourage you to try to attend at least one of the conferences. It's really worthwhile. Last, it was two weeks ago in Porto, Portugal. Uh, next year is in Estonia. But Bernard is the scientific lead at Advanced Analytical Research on Drug Exposure, which all of us uh, usually refer to as RDOX. And that's, uh, he's also a professor of biostatistics at Liege, Liege University. Yeah, hold on, you gotta wait one minute. Okay, let me introduce everybody else. <laughs> Bernard is ready to go. So, uh, um, <laughs> I, only, I know him so I can say those things. Okay, uh, Mike is a colleague also. I've had the pleasure of working with him. Mike is a uh, card-carrying cardiologist who's at the VA. Uh, he runs, uh, he's a director actually of one of the COINS, which is a center of excellence of health services research there. He's also a professor of medicine at University of Colorado. Uh, Neha Pandit, Pandit? Pandit is Associate Professor and Vice Chair of Research and Scholarship for the University uh, of Maryland Baltimore School of Pharmacy. And Janet Damore uh, is Deputy Associate Director of the Healthcare Delivery Research Program in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at the National Cancer Institute. That's a mouthful, but uh, grateful for all four of them. Um, so this time, uh, as we move forward, we're going to have more discussion and opportunities. So, um, but Bernard, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation for being here and to talk about medication adherence. So we have heard before, uh, today we have very effective therapies, but to achieve effective disease management, we will need appropriate adherence to the medications. And there is a famous sentence that was already used for the introduction, drugs don't work in patients who do not take them. But this sentence assumes that medication adherence is dichotomic. Either you are adherent, either you are non-adherent. And the process of medication adherence, it's much more dynamic. So we, I, through my different example, I will show you how dynamic a, the adherence of a patient can be and the importance of capturing that changes over time. We already mentioned the ABC taxonomy, and we were, I was part of an AU-funded project about coming, coming about recommendation about medication adherence, and we were seven institutions in Europe, and the first day, we didn't know what we were talking about. You heard the words before, adherence, compliance, concordance, persistence, and you can imagine the translation in all the European languages, we didn't know what we were talking about. So we said, okay, ABC taxonomy, it's the, the medication adherence is the process by which patients take their medication as prescribed. 
It's a dynamic process over time, and there are three key elements. Once there is a prescription, the first element is that the patient has to initiate therapy. That's the beginning. After having initiated therapy, the patient has to implement the dosing regimen. This means taking the drug once a day, twice a day, with food, without food. And when we think about polymedication, this implementation phase can be extremely difficult. Finally, the patient has to persist with treatment, and for chronic disease, they have to persist lifelong. So it's very important to persist with treatment in that case. So what can go wrong in that process? Either the patient does not initiate. That's typically a dichotomic outcome. It's a yes-no. And in medical practice, for chronic diseases in adult patients, we see up to 20 to 30 percent of the patients who don't even initiate a new prescribed treatment. Then the pa what can go wrong, it's the patient can delay, omit, takes extra dose. That's a dosing history. It's a time series. Or finally, the patient can discontinue treatment, and that's a time to event. So those are three elements of medication adherence that are very different in nature. Statistically speaking, we are talking about a binary outcome, a time series, and a time to event. That's why when we talk about medication adherence, when we measure it, when we analyze it, it's very important to talk about those three elements separately. And as this session is about measurement, I think that we have also, when we talk about measurement, we have to see what are the measures that can ev evaluate each of those three elements separately. And when we look at what is available, what are the pre-electronic methods that are available, like the direct methods like measuring blood concentration, this is an extremely sparse method that gives you very little information about initiation persistence and implementation. When we are looking at patient self-report, it's typically bias. You have desirability bias, but you have also recall bias. Who can remember the dose missed last week, last month, two years ago? It's very difficult. And pill count, what we do in clinical trials, can be easily censored by the patient. They can just drop the pills before showing up at the visit, which compromises the estimation of initiation persistence, but it only, only gives you an aggregate measure of implementation. So today, I think in medical practice, the prescription refill databases and EHR data, not only in the US, but also in Europe, are becoming more and more available. And those are gold standard measures to see who initiated a treatment and who is persisting with treatment over a long period of time. In particular, you can see if a diabetic patient is still on a class of medication after 10 years. That is doable using uh, prescription refill data. However, if you want a precise measure of how a patient is taking the medication on a day-by-day -day basis, electronic monitoring is the way to measure how a patient is implementing a dosing regimen which is easy to implement in clinical trials, which is more difficult to implement in medical practice. So when we are talking about gold standard, I think we have to make the distinction between clinical trials, drug development, where I think electronic monitoring is the gold standard to measure drug exposure in phase two, phase three clinical trials. But when we go to medical practice, we probably need to combine measures to have a good estimate of initiation, implementation, and persistence. There, in my view, there are gold standards, like uh, for initiation and for uh, persistence, pharmacy refill database, EHRs, and for implementation, electronic monitoring. When those measures are not available, we probably have to use self-report, pill counts, and so to have estimate of those three elements. Now I will focus and give you my experience, my background is really from electronic monitoring and I will give you some examples of electronic monitoring. The first example that I wanted to share with you is my father. This is my father, I gave him an electronic monitor and he was using it for two years. And this is how he is taking his medication in, from 2011 to 2012. So on the x-axis, you have the days of follow-up. On the y-axis, you have the time of drug intake. Every time there is a blue dot, he took his medication. Every time there is a red line, he missed his medication. 
So over the 632 days, you can see there were 14 days with double dosing. There were 115 days with no doses at all, which makes him an 84% adherent patient. Okay, so still a lot of missed doses, a lot of red lines. What I didn't tell you here is I was monitoring here his cardioaspirin. Knowing the duration of action of a cardioaspirin, which is two to three days, probably that he had a very optimal level of adherence and we didn't need to bother about because there are very few consecutive misdoses. However, in 2013, he was diagnosed with AFib. He was prescribed a new once daily direct anticoagulant which has a duration of action of 24 hours, and every red line will be critical for him, will put him at risk. So when we talk about medication adherence, we have also always to think about which drug for which treatment for which patients. And that's the importance of understanding drugs forgiveness for each medication, and always comparing the level of adherence, especially when we are talking what level of adherence is required, is necessary for which drug for which patient for which diseases. And to move ahead, I wanted to share those six patients, and those six patients are all six taking 81% of their prescribed doses. So according to the unfortunate rule of 80%, I think they would all be classified as adherent patient. The three on the top are once daily dosing, the three on the bottom are twice daily dosing, and you can see the different behavior of those patients. The first one missing doses at random, the second one stopping too early, the third one, look at the third one in the first line, how often he changes behavior over time, many, many times. Then at the bottom one, you can see a, a BID patients deteriorating over time, a BID patients having problem at initiation but doing perfectly afterwards, and the BID patients having major trouble in the afternoon dose or the evening dose, while the morning dose is more acceptable. And when we think about the previous session about MAP solution to problem, here this gives you really an idea of the problem to discuss, to have a focused discussion with the patient and to find the, uh, the solution that fits that every patient. Now moving, uh, those six patients, they all have taken 80%, 81% of their prescribed medication, but we can also think that the clinical consequences will be different, very different according to those, those different behaviors. And very often when we prescribe a treatment, and here I have illustrated it for once daily treatment, so if we prescribe a treatment once daily, this is our expectation. The patient is taking the drug every 24 hours, as indicated in the bottom plot, and this is the expected drug exposure, drug concentration on the upper plot. After a few days, the patient reaches a steady state and maintains that steady state over time. We hope that the, that drug concentration is high enough to reach a level of efficacy and not too high to avoid side effects. Um, and we hope that this uh, exposure is perfectly uh, located in the therapeutic window. This is what we all have in mind when we say this patient is on treatment. The reality is much different. Patient takes an extra dose, miss a dose, takes an extra dose to compensate the missed dose the day before, takes a little drug holiday and so on. And you see that there is much more variability in that process of drug exposure, which can sometimes lead to toxicity, loss of effectiveness or emergence of drug resistance. And this is something that we need to better understand for each drug, how forgiving is a drug for one missed dose, two missed doses, and so on, and what is acceptable in the deviation in medication adherence. Because it is clear that not all patients will be robots in the future. They will not take the drug every 24 hours perfectly, but we need to be much better understand from the drug development process what are the critical mistakes. And very often, also in medical practice, we don't know the level of exposure. So that means when there is suboptimal adherence and it's not diagnosed because we do not measure it, very often the treatment will fail. When the treatment will fail, the disease progress, we get acute events, and in that case, the patients come back to the clinic and we give more complex treatment. 
the more complex the, tr the treatment are, the worse is the adherence. And this is a loop that is extremely costly and very often leading to unnecessary uh, combination therapy or doses that are too high. This is in medical practice. But I think also in, medic in clinical trials, it is key to measure medication adherence with a sound measure. Because those are study, this, those are, this is a summary of studies that we did with electronic monitoring among almost 17,000 patients coming from 95 clinical trials, phase two, phase three, and some phase four studies. And you can see that this is the level of adherence in the clinical trial. So if every patient will be perfectly adhered, you will have, everybody will be on the top horizontal line of perfect adherence, and you see a gap uh, the first gap is the blue curve, which is the persistence with treatment. And here, even in clinical trial, you will see that the blue curve drops by 2-3% on day one. This is non-initiation. So those are patients who are highly selected, they get the, the medication at the trial center and never open the box. 2-3% to non-initiation. This is much less than in medical practice, which is probably 20 to 30 percent. After a year, we have lost about 40 percent of the patients, and the red curve gives you the proportion of patients who take the medication every day as prescribed. So we have about a 15 percent non-implementation every consecutive days. So that means that my father I showed you before was the 15 percent gap. He is the average patient in clinical trials. Okay? And this is very different across disease, across centers, but I will not get into the details. So I think we have an adherence gap. Usually we think we measure tr uh, efficacy in the clinical trials and we measure effectiveness in practice, but in reality we measure something in between because the payers wants to know what's the level of effectiveness, the regulators wants to know the, effect, the level of efficacy, and we provide an estimate which is in between. And that has problems because we have underestimated effectiveness, we have <coughs> underestimated toxicity, and very often we end up with doses which are inappropriate and often too high for, for adherent patients. So just my last slide to conclude. I think that uh, when we go f through all the processes from drug development to drug response, I think that medication adherence is one of the largest source of variability in drug response. Today, there is a lot of efforts to understand precision medicine, to understand gene, environment, and lifestyle impact on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. However, if we don't consider adherence in the picture, we will not make sense of precision medicine because adherence is a major source of variability. Prescribing and dispensing are professional processes, uh, are processes under professional control. We are doing more and more, be a better and better job in prescribing and dispensing. We get more and more guidance uh, through that. But also, I think we have to start at the beginning, and I think it's very important also that we address adherence in the drug development process so that we come with the right drug, the right dose for the patients, so that every uh, single aspect, each process needs to be taken into consideration when we want to improve drug outcome. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, so my name is Mike Ho. I'm uh, from the University of Colorado in the VA in Denver. Uh, so my job today is really to talk about uh, adherence using pharmacy refill data. Um, so I thought I'd just provide an example of, you know, this is a, a study, a patient uh, data from a study that we're doing right now. Um, and this is uh, an average patient in the study. Um, and this shows kind of their uh, record of the different medications that they're on, uh, the issue date is when it was prescribed, the cancel date is when the prescription expires, um, 
and the release date is when the patient filled the, the medication. So um, you could see that uh, there's a row that we get for each time the medication is uh, filled by the patient as denoted by the release date. Um, and so this could go on and on. And this is uh, not a typical patient that we see in the VA in that this patient's only on two medications. In general, they're on a lot more medications than that. So this is just another example. Um, uh, of the kind of uh, pharmacy refill data that, that we get. Um, so going back to a little bit of what uh, Bernard said, I mean, we can uh, typically look at three types of uh, patient behaviors using pharmacy refill data. We can look at uh, initiation, so when the patients uh, pick up the medication. Um, implementation is, you know, how well they refill their medications over a period of time. And then persistence is how long they continue that medication um, over that period of time. And so again, we can look at an example of a patient where you could see uh, the physician uh, prescribed the medication on March 2nd. They waited for a little bit before they filled the medication, so they filled it on April 9th. Um, then they refilled it, so they got a 90-day supply and then they refilled it on August 6th, so there was really a gap uh, between when they first filled it and when they were supposed to fill it again, um, and then they refilled it again on uh, October 28th. Um, so if you try to calculate um, uh, adherence, which is usually PDC or NPR, it, you calculate it by the number of days supplied over an observation period. Uh, if you just look at this, the patient may be classified as adherent, but if you look really at when he refilled it, or he or she refilled it on August 6th, there's really a gap of a little more than 10 days in which they didn't have a supply of medication. So, you know, do you classify this patient as adherent or non adherent? Um, so, those are kind of the challenges of using pharmacy refill data. Um, and then, in terms of looking at adherence to multiple medications, I think really the challenge is well, what is it that you're trying to look at adherence to, right? So, you know, oftentimes we can look at adherence to a class of medication. So if, if a patient is prescribed a cholesterol pill, they have a, a side effect to it, they're switched to a different one. I mean, we usually count that uh, all towards um, patients taking uh, uh, cholesterol medicines, and we would uh, include that uh, in their assessment of uh, uh, adherence. Um, but then if you look at uh, um, treatment for hypertension, there's different classes of medications. When you're thinking about adherence for that, I mean, it, it becomes a challenge, right? Because there's multiple classes of medications uh, that patients may be prescribed uh, to treat hypertension. Oftentimes, those classes of medications can have different indications. So do you attribute, you know, beta blockers to the treatment of hypertension, or do you attribute it to the treatment of rate control for AFib or heart failure. So um, that's a challenge. And then finally, you know, when you want to summarize an adherence measure for a patient, do you then just lump all of their medications together to calculate um, an adherence score for them? Uh, and, and again, I think it goes back to uh, what the goals that you, you have for measured adherence. Um, this is a systematic uh, review or uh, of uh, different studies that have tried to um, uh, measure adherence to multiple classes of medications. And the goal is not for you to read the different methods, but this was just looking at NPR. And interestingly, as you can see, there's a lot of different ways that people have done it. Um, and in six of the studies, they couldn't even discern how the how the method was done. So I think there's a lot of challenges um, to trying to uh, measure adherence across multiple medications. Um, so, I mean, going back to what uh, Bernard said, I mean, I think, you know, adherence using pharmacy refill really looks at a patient's behavior over a long period of time, right? Because if you think about the uh, sampling um, of data for refills, it's really on a monthly basis or patients can get 60 or 90 day fills. So the data that we get on adherence is really poor. 
um, and it's really looking uh, at behavior over a longer period of time rather than when you're using uh, electronic bottle caps where you can get a sense of when the patients are opening uh, the bottle. And so some of the assumptions uh, of um, using pharmacy refill data is that you know, patients are taking the medication as prescribed and they're taking you know, the doses as prescribed as well. Um, and that's kind of one of the limitations uh, that we have to understand with pharmacy data. Um, despite that, I mean, I think pharmacy data has been linked to um, adverse outcomes or has been linked to hard clinical outcomes. This is an example of a study we did where we looked at uh, patients who delayed filling their medications uh, blood thinner after getting a drug eluding stent. And we found that about 15% of the patients had a delay. And these patients had an increased risk of adverse outcomes in the 30 days uh, after that delay. Uh, in terms of death or recurrent MI. Um, uh, this is a study looking at secondary adherence and outcomes. Uh, in this study, we looked at adherence to DOACs, and we found that in the year after initiation, uh, about a quarter of, of the patients were not adherent um, to their DOACs, and these patients had an increased risk of adverse outcomes as well. Um, and more recently now, um, most of the studies, you know, have looked at adherence kind of retrospectively, um, and I think there's increasing interest to use uh, pharmacy refill data prospectively, so clinically in routine uh, clinical care as well as uh, to conduct interventions. Um, this is just a, a screenshot of uh, EPIC, um, where now they have a new functionality where it displays if you roll the your um, point over the medication, you can get a, a PDC measurement um, uh, directly. Um, this is an example of vitamin D, and then this is an example of clopidogrel, where um, in the, from the EHR, they can get pharmacy refill data, and then it automatically calculates um, an adherence score, PDC, uh, for each patient. So I think uh, with functionalities like these, um, you can think of doing uh, interventions prospectively rather than just looking at data uh, retrospectively. Um, so we've also uh, used uh, adherence data prospectively to conduct interventions. Uh, this was a study that, uh, I don't have the results, but uh, where we um, would look at pharmacy refill data and calculate when they were due to have uh, medication refills. And based on that, we would have auto automated phone, we would deliver automated phone calls to patients um, to remind them to refill their medications. Um, and we recently just uh, finished uh, this trial. Um, this is an ongoing trial we're doing where we're doing text message, we're sending text messages to patients. And uh, in contrast to a lot of intervention studies where you know, we deliver the intervention to everyone regardless of whether they're adherent or not, in the study we um, wait to see if patients are uh, uh, non-adherent and we look at that based on refill data. So we wait until the date that they're due to have a medication refill. If they don't refill it after seven days, then they're enrolled in the intervention um, so that we're just targeting patients when they have non-adherent behavior rather than just giving the intervention to everyone, um, whether they're adherent or not. Um, and so this is a, a four-year study uh, where we're randomizing patients to uh, one of several arms. And so in conclusion, I think uh, uh, medication or pharmacy refill data um, really measures uh, long-term medication taking behavior in contrast to um, uh, using uh, electronic monitors where you can uh, monitor uh, ref medication taking behavior on a, a more daily basis. I think refill data is good for measuring behavior over a longer period of time. Um, you know, I think refill data has been shown in multiple studies to be associated with adverse outcomes. So it's a good uh, surrogate marker of uh, medication taking behavior. Most of the studies to date um, have looked at uh, refills uh, retrospectively to classify whether patients are adherent or not. But I think there's new opportunities to leverage refill data uh, prospectively, both in the clinical setting as well as um, using that data for uh, clinical interventions to patients. So with that, thank you.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. I want to make sure I can get this started. Um, as mentioned, my name is Neha Pandit. I am faculty over at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, but on the side, or at least three half days a week. Um, I also work as an HIV clinical pharmacist for the University of Maryland Midtown Campus Thrive Program, which is not to be confused with Kaiser. It's very confusing for Baltimore people. Um, but we serve uh, inner, inner city Baltimore as well as some individuals outside. We mostly do HIV primary care for those patients, but we do do a lot of hepatitis C. We do do a lot of uh, PrEP patients, or at least a significant amount of PrEP patients. Um, so hepatitis C, HIV, as well as PrEP in, um, in that population. Um, so what I want to discuss today is really talking about how we use some of those data points within a clinical setting. Um, we have the advantage of having a lot of various resources thrown at Baltimore City with um, our high rates of substance abuse and some of the other barriers that we face within that community. But we also have the challenge of having a harder population to find sometimes within Baltimore. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, um, the experiences that we have in using some of not just of our objective data, but some of the sub uh, subjective data as well. I'll also talk about the role of medication reconciliation, which is sort of the bane of my existence within uh, my practice. How do we identify what exactly a patient is taking? Because if we don't know what they're taking, I don't really know what to assess adherence based off of. So it makes it really difficult from that standpoint, and I'm sure like many individuals within in this room and even listening to this, medication reconciliation, as much as we've talked about it, many conferences, many papers, uh, we still don't have an answer to this. Uh, so we'll talk about how we use medication reconciliation and how that impacts how we calculate adherence for some of our patients. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about pharmacy claims data that we have used for some prospective data, so that was a good transition from um, Mike's talk as well. All right, so I want to start with just introducing a patient that's probably familiar to a lot of individuals in this room. Uh, but this is a patient who shows up at their primary care physician's office just for a regular three-month follow-up appointment. We see our patients a lot more, a lot more close together than um, non-HIV-infected patients. This patient has been on a single tablet, fixed-dose regimen for the past three years, really has been virologically suppressed and controlled on this regimen for a while. And the last viral load that we had that showed that this patient was virologically suppressed was three months ago. So this patient comes in, really no chief complaint whatsoever. And you do all the right things by asking about patient recall questions. You ask, when was the last time you took your medications? Are you having any issues with your medication? We even go and ask some of the more deeper questions. So I think it was Marie who showed some of the videos of patients and say, we really need to dive down and ask more specific questions when we're doing patient recall. So do you know the color of your medication? Do you know the time of day do you that you take your medication? What prompts you to take your medication? You do all the right things. They answer all the right questions. Everything looked pretty much the same. You say six month follow up, here's a lab slip to go get your viral load rechecked. Done. They walk out the door. The viral load comes back and it's now 54,000. You pick up the phone because now you don't want to wait six months to see this patient and you're like, what happened? I like the WTF comment earlier. Um, so you figure out, well, what happened? And then you go through these host of barriers that come out because this has been a patient of yours for the past three years. And so what do you do with all this information? Do you address every single barrier of the phone? Do you have them come back in? How could we have identified that all of this existed before this viral load jumped to 54,000, before their blood pressure went to 200 over 100, before their hemoglobin A1C was above 11? So they had housing issues. This is a patient who lost their partner. The partner had their insurance. They had to lose their housing, so moved into their, with their son. The son lives away from the pharmacy, so they couldn't get to any of their refills. They didn't have transportation because the husband usually did all the transportation to the pharmacy. So there's these host of issues, host of barriers that we now have to sort of overcome. The question that I always run into is how could we have prevented this from happening? How could we have helped identify some of those barriers beforehand? I work in a clinic that um, has about five clinical pharmacists. I know that's not normal. <laughs> I know that we have um, about 12 social workers. We have case managers. We have community health workers. We have all the right resources to help with this population, yet we still struggle to sort of identify some of, this, some of the barriers that patients have. 
One of the things that we work on, though, is the HIV care continuum. And probably the care continuum in general is not an unheard concept for many individuals. It's essentially identifying the people who have that specific disease state, making sure they know that they have that disease state, making sure that those people are receiving care or at least show up for one appointment for whatever disease state you're trying to identify or you're trying to treat. And then they keep coming back to you. So building that trust, making sure that they feel comforted and cared for and having engaged in your care. And then the, they're at goal for whatever you're trying to treat. So can you control their hemoglobin A1C? Can you control their blood pressure? And here, can we get them virologically suppressed? So these are actually the numbers from 2016 for the CDC, where about 86% of the HIV population is actually diagnosed, knowing your status, getting people to actually go get tested. How many, 64% of them are actually linked into care. 49% are retained in care, meaning they keep coming back to you to actually get that treatment. And then 53% of them are actually virologically suppressed. What's really interesting to me is that 49% to 53% sort of jump. So between retention to care and your clinical outcome, you have this whole issue of adherence. How many people actually get the initiation, implementation, and the persistence of their medication? How many of them are prescribed and actually pick it up for the very first time? And it sort of makes this leap in what in this <coughs> HIV care continuum, but there's various parts within that um, piece there in the bottom. So how many people actually implement, initiate, implement, and then persist with their antiretroviral medications? So in a clinic setting, the most common thing that we do for assessing one's adherence is essentially three things. We do patient recall, which is something I described earlier and I know you guys have heard before. Do pill counts. If you bring me your pills, I will count them. I'm a pharmacist. I'm really good at counting by five. <laughs> Refill data. I will, call, I will call your pharmacy. I will be that person who holds for 25 minutes to be able to get really good refill data. I usually go back about three months to be able to do that. And so being able to do that takes a lot of time. And I love the question earlier about, well, who's responsible for this? Who does it? We have five clinical pharmacists, and the only patients that get referred to, this, to us are patients like LP, people who have already failed their HIV medications. We rarely are proactive because we have a lot of patients. We have a lot of other responsibilities there. And we struggle with who actually owns this process. But pharmacy refill data is easy. The other rare things are pill counts because people don't often bring back their medications. We also don't have drug concentrations that are part of standard of care for HIV medications. Real life medication adherence, as you guys have heard before, is fairly low. So even though most clinical trials uses that 80% rule that you guys have heard about, we still know that it's about 50% overall for medication adherence. One of the statistics I always really like is how to make something habitual. So how do you actually tag patients? How do you make sure that taking medications is part of their daily routine? And so there's the statistic of 66 days. It takes 66 days for you to do something over and over again for it to feel weird that you didn't do it one day. It's usually for a diet, exercise, whatever it may be, but it's 66 days. We often follow up in about two to three weeks. We follow up in a month. And then we say, great, you're, you look like you're doing fine. We'll keep, you, we'll keep you going. We'll do a six-month appointment. But we also know that at six months, people get complacent. They get virologically suppressed. They meet their goal of whatever disease state. And then they're like, well, I guess I don't have to take it all the time anymore. So really going back and reassessing that piece as well is that it's consistent adherence, making sure that they persist in taking their medications, but we persist as providers to keep assessing their adherence on an ongoing basis. Then the bane of my existence, again, is the medication reconciliation piece. So the medication reconciliation piece is, how do I know exactly what you're taking? I like the terminology of the best possible medication history because there's no good, there's no, there's no gold standard for medication history. Essentially, if you can do three of the things that are listed here, patient interview, community, calling the community pharmacy to be able to get a good list of what they're getting filled, going through all of their providers to find out what's actually being prescribed. If a patient brings you their medication list, that's a great starting point. If they have the physical bottles, that is key in almost every medication reconciliation. And then medical records, if you have that piece of information as well.
Oftentimes it's really difficult to be able to get any of this information, especially if you're in, an, in a hospital setting or if you're in a um, individualized clinic or a specialized clinic where we don't serve as the primary care provider. So it's really difficult to be able to get some of that information. In studies, they found that even in the discrepancies within some of those best possible medication histories is about 50%. Whether a drug is added or not added or duplicated or at the wrong dose, there's many different discrepancies that you can find between a medication, a medication reconciliation. But just by reconciling one's medication, you can diminish the amount of drugs that a patient may need, and you can increase their medication, their, increase their adherence from about 51 to 67% based on this one study. Medication reconciliation can help just identify what medications you need them to target. It also gives us a great opportunity for counseling. There's many studies that show that counseling overall can actually increase one's medication adherence. And so in this specific study, the, even after counseling, it went up to 80% to improve their adherence. I want to briefly go over just two different studies. Um, early on in my career, we tried to communicate adherence information in an objective way to our prescribers. And so we partnered with one of our pharmacies to be able to get refill data. And what we would do is we would enter it into our computer system and say, your patient is 67% compliant. Please counsel this patient at the next visit that they come in. What this did is it actually got them to target the population that they sat down and actually went over adherence barriers with. Because we know routinely that that wasn't part of their discussion. They have 15 minute appointments and they didn't really have times to really narrow it down unless they had reason to. And so this actually gave them an objective data to be able to do that. Similar to what Mike had talked about with the PDC value that shows up in EPIC. This was pre when we, before we went into EPIC. Um, but that's part of the reason that we actually went over that. What was interesting about this is that we flagged patients who were 85% compliant. The majority of these patients, 78% of those patients, already had a viral load of less than 200, which is suppressed. What was difficult about that process is that 85% rule does not work for the HIV population. We should have targeted a much lower threshold for this population. So we were inundating providers with information that in theory, they didn't have to act on. And so how do we really make sure that the data that's actually going back to prescribers was important? And then the last thing that I'll go over is a study that we're actually going through now is actually focusing on medication adherence by ensuring collaboration among four different individuals, prescribers, pharmacists, payers, and health department programs. So this is being able to take not just pharmacy data, but actually pharmacy data that comes from our payers to be able to ensure that we're getting a complete information about pharmacy refill data and proactively and prospectively actually providing some of that information back to our prescribers and to be able to see if we can target adherence interventions based on some of that data here. All right, thank you. This was my last slide, which just goes over interventions that are uh, targeted for this, but I think you have another intervention uh, process going later. Thank you again. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Janet Damore. I'm from the National Cancer Institute, and um, I also co-lead the NIH Adherence Network. And my fellow co-lead, um, Michael Starrett, is, uh, will be speaking as part of the next panel. So I'm going to build on the, um, the presentations that we just heard and briefly review some measures of adherence used in health research and talk a little bit about a recent portfolio analysis we did uh, looking at the NIH grant portfolio. I'll talk about some of the unique challenges of adherence to oral cancer therapies and then conclude with some broader issues for the field to consider. So we've already um, covered this, that adherence is not a single behavior. It's a constellation of behaviors that um, begins with taking the first dose, then taking that medication as prescribed, and then um, looking at, at when a person um, discontinues or stops taking their medication. And the optimal measure of adherence depends on the adherence behavior and the research question. 
And while we need um, sort of precise measures of adherence that map on to the different behaviors that we're looking at, we also need to think about the broader barriers and drivers that shape whether or not someone's going to be adherent to their medication. So these include things that go far beyond um, sort of forgetting to, to take a medication or confusion about, you know, kind of what you're supposed to take and, and when, but looking more broader at um, issues related to shared decision making, the experience of side effects, uh, the person's sort of understanding of their condition and the risk associated with taking their medication or not taking the medication and issues such as cost and making sure that we um, are able to um, design studies in a way that we are capturing this information and that we have valid and reliable measures for these factors as well. So there's different ways to measure adherence behavior. We've um, heard this a number of times today from the very subjective to objective. And again, the, um, the appropriateness of these different measures really depends upon the, the situation at hand and the research question. There was an interesting study recently published by Ian Cronish and colleagues um, in translational behavioral medicine where they looked at the utility of different measurement approaches for different adherence behaviors. So the um, far left columns looking at behaviors involved in starting to take a new medication, the next five sort of columns of bars looking at taking that medication as prescribed, and then the final uh, column looking at discontinuation. And what these bars represent, I know it's a little bit busy, but um, the, these bars reflect the percentage of um, respondents who participated in a Delphi survey and rated each measurement approach at least somewhat suitable for the different adherence behaviors. And I think what's clear from this graph is that the suitability of different measures um, really varies, whether you're looking at initiation or implementation or discontinuation. What's not reflected on this graph, but is discussed in the paper, is that there was not consensus on sort of the optimal measures for these different behaviors. And I think that's really reflected in the, the literature and really the heterogeneity of methods that we see. So the NIH uh, Adherence Network is a, uh, a group of um, a group of scientists at NIH, really that, that span the NIH, that are involved in advancing adherence research, and we do that through a variety of different activities. Over the summer, we looked at the uh, portfolio of grants funded by NIH looking at adherence behavior. So I just wanted to, to be clear, these were not studies um, developing new drugs necessarily. These were studies, sort of behavioral studies, looking at adherence to um, sort of routinely prescribed medications. Um, we looked over, we looked at grants that were funded from the beginning of FY17 through May of 2019 and came up with a, uh, a sample of 120 grants that were conducted in a variety of different disease areas, which I've listed here. One of the goals of this portfolio analysis was to look at the measures that people were using. So one of the things that the Adherence Network has um, attempted to champion is to push um, people doing research in this area to move beyond self-report and to rely on um, more objective measures of adherence behavior. Um, and, and what we see here is that although um, more than half of the studies did include a self-reported um, measure of adherence, most also included uh, another measure, um, most commonly uh, looking at MEMS caps or other electronic monitoring system, um, and uh, some looking at uh, pharmacy records, which we've heard a lot about on this panel. So again, we're seeing in, in our funded research sort of a diversity of measures being used. So I, I want to shift gears uh, here with my last few minutes and talk about some of the challenges to measuring adherence to oral cancer therapies. Um, so cancer therapy has really undergone um, a, a lot of changes in the last decade where many of the um, newly approved therapies f uh, for the treatment of cancer are now oral. Um, and this represents a departure from how things have been done historically where chemotherapies um, were largely um, delivered via infusion. So um, as we have new oral therapies, um, that also sort of brings with it the issue of adherence and the problem of non-adherence. So this slide, oh, 
apologize. Oh, looks like I got cut off at the bottom. That's okay. Um, so we have two different uh, cancer treatment regimens here. So the top uh, regimen in red is for multiple myeloma. The one on the bottom is for breast cancer. Um, what I want you to, to, to pay attention to is that these regimens are incredibly complicated, um, although these are, these are fairly common when, when looking at different um, uh, sort of oral cancer treatment regimens. So on the top, you have a, a regimen where someone is prescribed um, three different medications. Uh, one is taken, lenalidomide is taken um, every day of the week in the morning, taken two days at lunch, and taken four days at dinner. And then you have uh, Tuesday, which is a big medication day, um, where you have uh, the other medications being taken uh, in the morning and uh, in the evening with uh, some rest days built in. So that's pretty complicated, and I think this speaks to the importance of having tools available for um, cancer patients to help them sort of organize their medication taking. Um, also, as cancer is a disease of, of, of aging, uh, most people who are on these regimens will also be taking medication for other chronic conditions. So again, speaking to the importance of um, addressing adherence not only to cancer therapy, but also more broadly. Thank you. Um, one other point I want to make about this slide is that as um, treatment regimens increase in complexity, um, our measurement approach to understanding adherence needs to um, uh, sort of match that complexity with precision. So, you know, here, uh, you know, in order to really understand what's happening and whether or not someone's adherent or how, how non-adherent and how they're not adherent, it really requires um, the, the sort of detailed assessment of medication taking over the course of the week. When we look at the literature in cancer, we see that adherence to oral therapies, and this includes oral chemotherapies as well as um, endocrine therapies, which have been used for a long time, um, primarily in the context of breast cancer and prostate, we see that adherence ranges from 46 to 100 percent. This was based on one review. Other reviews um, have cited lower estimates, but there's a range. And in cancer, as we see in other conditions, there's really no clinically defined threshold for adequate medication adherence. Um, it depends. It depends on the therapy. And in the case of some of the newer agents, we just don't have those data yet to be able to say, you know, 80% is good enough, 85% is good enough. Um, when you look across the literature, a number of different um, measures, uh, approaches to measurement are used, um, and I've listed some of those here. Again, this is based on a single review, but it's pretty consistent with other things that have been published. Um, so again, we see that adherence is measured with um, a range of different approaches. There's great heterogeneity between studies in this area. Um, we have sort of disparate definitions of what constitutes adherence. So in cancer, even though there's no, even though we sort of lack data on the appropriate clinical threshold, some studies still use 80%. Um, some uh, look at adherence in other ways. Um, there's, in general, a failure to distinguish between different adherence behaviors. Um, there's variability in the timing and frequency of data collection, um, which, which is an issue. We know that adherence decreases over time. Uh, these regimens are, are complex. They look different from day to day. Um, and sort of you know, differences in how different um, studies approach the measurement of adherence. The Oncology Nursing Society has been very active in um, providing tools for providers to support patients in adhering to their oral cancer therapies. So um, this is one tool. Uh, it's their patient assessment checklist. I know that the text is a little small, so I'll just quickly walk you through it. Um, basically, this is a checklist that helps a provider sort of go down the list and address some of those broader contextual factors that we know are important for shaping a person's adherence. So trying to capture on the front end whether or not they know where they're going to fill their prescription, whether or not they can afford the co-pays, whether or not they have questions, whether or not there's something else going on in their life that's going to interfere with their ability to take this medication as prescribed, and then doing what can be done proactively to, um, to sort of you know, manage those different barriers. They also recommend a range of tools, again, to support people in adhering to their medication. So those tools um, 
consistent with the broader literature really range um, from things like um, you know low tech you know daily reminders and pill diaries um, to looking at establishes different routines so sort of tying taking a drug to something that you're doing every day um, pill boxes with multiple compartments so you can sort of you know cluster your medications um, and then uh, sort of electronic reminders so um, smartphone applications um, electronic pill boxes some uh, other things that we've um, other sort of examples of other interventions that we've heard about today. Um, so, as you probably gleaned from our portfolio analysis, the National Institutes of Health does fund research on adherence, and um, I'd say it's a cross-cutting priority area. Um, so this is a, a funding opportunity in cancer specifically. Um, it's, uh, it's looking at the delivery of oral cancer agents, and adherence is a big part of that. Um, this funding opportunity is expiring in January, but I, I bring it up only to say that this is this continues to, to be a research priority, and um, even though this particular funding opportunity will be ending soon, this is an active area um, for us and will continue to be a priority. The Adherence Network uh, that I mentioned a few minutes ago also has a funding opportunity. It's listed here, calling for research grant applications to address uh, adherence to treatment and prevention regimens. So um, I'm happy to talk to people about these two funding opportunities uh, if anyone has questions. Here's a little bit of information about the network. You can see the participating institutes and centers, as well as a link on the bottom, which has, um, which will take you to um, our special interest group page on the NIH website. Um, again, happy to answer any questions about that that people may have. And I'll just end with my last minute um, with a couple of considerations. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, as I think uh, those issues have been mentioned, and just end with some of the healthcare delivery considerations um, that we need to be thinking about. So a lot of tools for supporting adherence have feedback to providers, feedback to the healthcare system, which can be very helpful. Um, but successfully integrating that data that's captured through remote monitoring into clinical practice is complicated, and it raises logistical, legal, and economic considerations that need to be dealt with. So there will be the issue of integrating those data into clinical workflows, sort of figuring out who's responsible for sort of monitoring and acting on those data addressing increases in providers' workload um, and figuring out which providers, again, will be um, responsible. Managing alerts during off-duty hours and issues of liability. Um, importantly, how um, time spent um, responding to alerts and remote monitoring will be reimbursed. Um, and then finally, um, protecting patients' privacy and complying with HIPAA. And that's all, thank you. Great. Uh, thanks to the panelists. This was really helpful. A um, couple general comments to just try to wrap, summarize, and then open up for conversation. Um, Bernard, as always, did a nice job. I think that one slide where you see the different stages and the different measurements is absolutely crucial, and I think that really helps formulate the issue is, is that depends upon the question we're looking at really should reflect what the measurement that we're looking at. Um, I also like this quote that he made, I don't know if he did it purposely or not, but without adherence, there is no precision medicine. And I think that's really uh, really important to acknowledge. The other thing that uh, I think Bernard was alluding to, which I just would want to emphasize, is if we really want to use measurements of adherence in clinical trials, I mean, if we're, the cost of, to bring a new medication to the market and do all the testing and everything is, what is it, approximately 1.2 billion maybe at least, if half the people in those trials are not taking the medication, what are those implications? So I think that it's really becoming important. It's not to say that uh, you know we still need uh, intention to treat methodological, but at least we can do a better understanding of if the intervention or the drug doesn't work, is it because it's not efficacious or is it because people are adherent? And if they're not adherent, that's also important. Maybe there's side effects, but I think we're not, we are not getting that data. It's crucial. The costs of bringing these products to the market are huge, and this is one way to perhaps address those issues. So. Uh, Mike did a nice job of really framing, I think, the reality of what refill data looks like. I just want to add a couple just additional things. One thing that we don't talk about is oversupply. So if we get these refills, uh, they're stockpiling. And actually, we've published a paper that showed that people that stockpile were just as bad 
in terms of outcomes, clinical outcomes, blood pressure, as if they were under adherence. So there's something about individuals that are stockpiling more than 20%. We use a 1.2. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that refill may be things for us to think about, but there is a tendency to just cont continue to develop, and anybody that's gone into somebody's medicine cabinet will see that oftentimes there is accumulation of the medication over time. Um, related to that, um, we also had published a paper in medical care showing self-report versus refill. And we just, this was a student just playing around with the data and did a really cool analysis. The correlation between self-report and refill was 0.19. Both were independently predictive of blood pressure control. I conclude that they're just two measurements of two large constructs that we would call adherence, but they're measuring two different aspects. And yet they were contributing in this model. So I think it's important for us to imagine that maybe it's not one or the other. I think self-report may be more of a symptom. Maybe it's a way of identifying from a screening and then going into more detail. But if a patient tells you they're having trouble with your medication, you sure as bet can sure that there's a problem there. So just something to think more about. Uh, Neha talked a little bit about uh, also the practical aspects of the pharmacy. How do we get those medication, that information? That's not an easy thing. So if we're talking about refill, you know, are we really going to spend 25 minutes calling up the different pharmacy? We've done trials and we can't always get refill data. So um, if you're in a capitated system in the VA, that's great. But now we also have the Mission Act where patients are actually able to go outside the VA and go anywhere else and get those medications. So um, that also brings up who owns the, the, the data, right? So it's not that companies are willing to just hand over their refill data and say, here, would you like it? You can analyze it. It doesn't happen. So these are some of the things that we have to think a little bit more about. Um, I do want to emphasize one other aspect, clinical outcomes. We haven't really talked too much about it. And the problem here is, is that just because you're adherent doesn't mean you're going to get clinical outcomes. And what I would like you to think about is clinical inertia. We have demonstrated this time and time again that if a patient is not if a provider is not prescribing appropriately following guidelines, even if you're adherent, doesn't mean you're going to get the clinical outcomes. So there has to be something, if we're talking about clinical outcomes, we have to think a little bit about uh, adherence is not a direct correlation to clinical outcomes. So that's one other point I would just make. And then uh, the, the last uh, conversation I think really helped solidify this issue, which we haven't talked about. HIPAA, liability, uh, logistical, these are all really important aspects. Um, and um, I just, the whole issue of oncology to me frames one of the challenges we're struggling with and to think about that as another case study to, for us. So those are just a couple summary points on my end to just share. But I just would like, you know, the panel to think a little bit about hearing the diversity and, and thinking about um, how do we, um, I guess, you know, starting from there are different if you're doing research, you may do something different. If you're doing clinical practice, you may be doing different. And I, I think we had two different sides of that. So if you were um, to do clinical practice, what would you recommend? And then maybe uh, if you were to conduct a research, uh, what would be the questions you would want to ask before you're selecting what measures you would want to look at? So it's a two-part, and maybe I made it too complicated. How about we start with the clinical? So. Um, for Neha and Mike, maybe start off there. So if you see a patient, you, Neha, you talked a little bit about this. Uh, imagine that they're on 10 different drugs, right? And so do we create a summary? And this is what, Mike, you were talking about. Do we create a summary measure that says, okay, red, yellow, green, and that summarizes, or do we get into all 10 drugs, or you prioritize and say, I really only want to look at their HIV drug, and all the other things uh, get pushed off to the wayside. So. So what we found is um, there is definitely discordant adherence with a lot of disease states. Um, for the study that we that we had put together a couple of years ago, we did focus on HIV medications, but once we uncovered a lot of the adherence issues with some of those HIV medications, we identified a lot of other medications that also were not being taken as well. What we also found is people had persisted on maybe one of their HIV medications, but the second HIV medication wasn't even in their profile. So I think the discordant adherence was definitely an issue for a lot of patients that we identified. I think it's easier for, from a prescriber standpoint to focus on one and use that as sort of a, a targeting tool um, to be able to do that. But 
I mean, ideally, you'd want it all, right? You'd want right. every single data point that you have. And I guess, Mike, to put you on the spot, as a specialist, as a cardiologist, um, you know, you may be focused in your particular area, but, uh, you know, patients are more than just their blood pressure or their uh, cardiovascular issues. How do, how do you handle all the other issues going on, or do you just focus on that and hope that somebody else picks up all the other things that are going on? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, just to answer your first question, I mean, it seems like we need to have multiple strategies for assessing adherence. I mean, one, you know, is just asking patients, but that should probably be complemented with, you know, looking at refills or um, uh, at pharmacy data. Um, you know, for me, I, I guess I focus on the cardiovascular medications and start there because that may start the conversation of why the patient is not adherent um, because, you know, the reasons may be generalizable across multiple classes of medications. Um, although I agree with Niha, it seems like sometimes patients are selective uh, with their non adherence. You know, they may not like their diuretic because it makes them go to the bathroom all the time, and that's the one they don't take. Mm -hmm. You know. Great. Um, so uh, I'm going to now ask Julie and Bernard their question on more of the research side. But for those of you that have questions for the panel, please uh, step to the mics if you don't mind. Um, we have a little more time, so it would be uh, nice to hear some questions. But um, so I think you both did a nice job of presenting and uh, identifying, and I think it's really helpful also, particularly the portfolio of measurement issues. Um, but um, I guess, uh, how would you approach or suggest if someone comes up to you, I want to do research and adherence, what would you suggest to them or how, what, what, is there kind of like a, a path that they, you could recommend or what, what would you think? I think, I start with the taxonomy. I, I think that it's very important if you'd want to do research. Mm -hmm. the, the first problem, we have in medical practice 20 to 30 percent of the patients who don't even initiate. So if you want to work, if, if that's the problem you want to focus, that's a hard uh, population probably, mm -hmm. and, and that's, you have to work on initiation and find the best measure for initiation. Mm -hmm. For example, I showed a lot of examples for electronic monitoring. Patients who don't initiate will not initiate any electronic method, will not use an app. So you have to find something else to, to solve the problem of initiation. Then if the problem is long-term treatment discontinuation, you have to find a way to identify those patients. And here I join a little bit the, the, the practice because we have to realize that patients who discontinue often disengage from care. So you don't see them in the mm. care process. Mm -hmm. So that's very clear when, when for example, I, I, I start a project with somebody, uh, he, he the, was a physician, whatever, was a center, they keep seeing patients who come back. And this is already, already a high selection right. of patients who are already engaged in care, and, and we are not having the non-persistent patients. And, and John, in the previous, uh, I, think, I think it's John Ujak, he said we have to focus on the patients who need it most. And, and that is very key in adherence research, is how do you identify those patients who have disengaged, are, are, are disengaging, are no more in the care. And then if you have a problem of implementation, I'm thinking you have a drug that has a very uh, narrow therapeutic window. Oncology treatment probably, a lot of them have a narrow therapeutic window. Uh, new anticoagulants have a narrow therapeutic window. In that case, you may really be interested also to have a perfect or a good, be sure if there is a, an appropriate implementation of the dosing regimen then find a measure for the appropriate, uh, for, for measuring implementation. So I, I, I really uh, suggest uh, researchers to think about the method. Janet, do you have anything else? Yeah, I'll just briefly add, um, and, and I've advised people um, who have been applying to the NIH uh, along these lines, that um, it's really, it's, it's critical to, to, to know your population and to sort of have thoroughly developed uh, the conceptual model of what you think is going on. So, um, you know, thinking about, uh, if you recall back to my presentation, and sort of thinking about those multi-level factors that influence whether or not someone's going to be adherent or not. And at a minimum, collecting some data about those factors that are going to be most relevant to the, to the question that you're asking. 
and, and, and what you're looking at um, so that after you have done your study and collected your data, you'll be able to, um, you know, that, that those data will be very important for um, interpreting your findings. Um, also encouraging people, again, to, to think beyond self-report and to think about including um, both if you're going to include a self-reported measure, to also think about how you could um, objectively assess adherence as well. There was a question also about uh, data linkage opportunities. So thinking a little bit also building upon that, um, uh, any thoughts on that or opportunities there or how um, anything that we should be thinking about with regards to data linkage? What do you mean by data linkage? Well, I'm asking to Adam asked this question, so I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> Adam, do you want to clarify? Yeah, sure. So uh, bringing together different data sources um, to improve the data set. So you know, you have one data link uh, to identify the factors, but then there's lots of other uh, situations um, where there's opportunities to get other sources of data and then get a bigger picture, essentially. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, imagine also the example of, um, you know, different health plans with different insurance, and then also that's the pharmacy database, but then there's the claims database um, um, Josh had left with RX Ante, but, you know, there is not typically all the data in one place easily available and ready for you to jump in and do the analyses. Is that kind of, yeah. So any thoughts or is this one of these things that we all know, it's a dirty secret that it's hidden, uh, but, but there's a lot of challenges with using these data and this goes back to the issue of who also owns it and who's willing to share it. Yeah, I, I can talk. Uh, one example, I mean, in the study that I mentioned where we're prospectively enrolling patients for an inherent study using pharmacy refill, um, the barrier for us is really the cost of getting that data because we have to work with a um, pharmacy broker to get that data, mm -hmm. but the, there's a charge every time you query the data per patient, and so if you're trying to do large population-based studies, it become, becomes prohibitive in terms of cost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I'll just add, um, so, I mean, one data linkage that's been used pretty frequently for adherence research is the SEER Medicare data linkage, and, I, you know, we've heard some, some, um, some results that, uh, that were based on, on that linkage here today, um, and that's become um, sort of an even more valuable data source now that some of the Part D data are available um, going back several years. I will say that um, the surveillance research program at the National Cancer Institute has been pursuing a number of data linkages. They're still in um, sort of the, the beta testing phase, um, but specifically pursuing linkages between um, SEER data and pharmacy record data. So um, that will be available probably in the next couple of years and will end up being, um, I, I believe it's envisioned to be a, a sort of a, a publicly available data resource. There's also private Optum Health and others that have private, uh, a whole mixture of things, but those are very, very costly. Uh, but uh, we have questions. Thank you. Um, great panel. Stephen Thomas, again, University of Maryland. First, uh, a thank you, an observation, and a question. To thank you. Thank the organizers for bringing Dr. Pandit and I together in the same room for the first time. <laughs> 35 miles separate us. And so the power to convene is very important, so I'm, I'm glad you have some diversity in, in the room and continue to bring us together. The observation, Dr. Bernard, I can help you find those high-risk patients, man. I work <laughs> on them all the time. We call them neighbors. <laughs> I know where they are, I know where they live, I know where they come back time and time again. We can do this. Now my question, it's very clear that adherence is like hugely, hugely important. And when it's accomplished, it's a win-win for everybody. But who benefits with lack of adherence? Who's benefiting when we have non-adherence? I'm just not convinced that it's nobody. Somebody is benefiting. Somebody, something, some entity benefits from the lack of adherence. Who is that? Payers. Sometimes it's payers, but it also depends upon the vet. Got what, disagreement what is, over here. What's that? Payer pays eventually. 
Yes, right. Well, that's a short term versus long term. It's a short term versus long term. That's right. So short term versus long term. Uh, it's cholesterol. Well, so I think, though, Stephen, you're getting at a point, though, is what, what is the barrier to helping to move this forward, and what would be the incentive to put some more resources to trying to address the problem? Is that um, paraphrasing, or is that where you were hoping to go for? What, what, what I was hoping, hoping to for to? was what just happened. The room lit up. Okay. The room lit up with disagreement. The room lit up with, uh, let's test our assumptions. Let's test our assumptions. And I don't think, I think that's healthy. And we need a space, a safe space where that can happen. And only through that will we find some solutions. <laughs> Bernard, Bernard I, I just wanted to make one comment because uh, who, benef who benefits from non-adherence, it's very different also from the, the system in place. I come from Belgium where healthcare is almost free. And, we are, and France is completely free, and we have the same level of non-adherence that you have here in the States. <laughs> so we have huge issue of non-adherence as well. I think the problem is we don't have the appropriate incentives today. Because if a patient, if a, it, the consultation with a physician is a short consultation. It's seven minutes, it depends on countries, seven, 10 minutes and so. So if you open the door for non-adherence, it will take time because there is not one app, there is not one solution that solves it. And you can not write a script to the patient and say, this is the solution, fix it. No, it, it takes time. And nobody in the healthcare system, physician, pharmacist, nurses have been trained to non-adherence. So it's just, if I open that door, it will cost me time and I'm not sure where I'm going. And, and that's the biggest problem today. The, the, it's, we don't have the appropriate incentives. And it, we need collaboration between the professions, pharmacists, physicians, nurses, social care most probably needs to be in the picture, but there is nothing to make those healthcare professionals to collaborate. And the systems technically are not in place, the incentives are not in place, and if I take a country like Belgium, there is even fight between the professions between pharmacists and physicians, for example. So, so we are not ready for that at the moment. Your honesty is refreshing. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Hi, I'm Laura Downey with Concordance Health Solutions. I also teach at Purdue University. Um, Bernard, I have a question for you about the data that you presented. I've, I've seen the paper that that came from, and I noticed um, that there was a correlation between um, the success in execution and the time to discontinuation. Could you talk a little more about how that played out for your study and where that data came from, perhaps? Yes, so we see a, a strong relationship between how well you, do, you take your medication and how long you persist with treatment. So it's not a one-to-one, -one, but there is a very strong relationship and my assumption is that the better you take your medication, the best the benefit you get from the treatment, and you are satisfied, and you persist with treatment. But that's an assumption. It's not proven. But we have a very strong relationship between how well you do it and how long you do it. So in that sense, did you, did you measure it just based on their... Um, their execution of the daily dosing and yeah. how close they were to time, but you didn't do any kind of uh, evaluation into their whether they were more motivated because they were more, um, you know, successful, or if there was any other underlying factors to that success and execution. No, because the the two publication we I, I guess you mentioned the the, the 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 publication in hypertension where we looked at that but those data were coming from multiple studies with different objectives, so we didn't have that. This was a meta-analysis. So the conclusion is the better you do it on a day-by-day, -day, the longer you persist, and that's why also it's so important, I think, to when you initiate a new treatment, that you have a kind of good start program just to check that the patient initiates treatment, but also that he, has a, an, that he builds in 66 days the appropriate habit. <laughs> Because if the habit is there, you have a much more likelihood that it benefits from treatment and persists with the treatment. 
Could you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Uh, thank you again for the great panel. I love the balance that there is between all the different sectors. My name is Gotham, like Go Thumb. Um, co-founder of Believe, where we're working to prevent opioid abuse and addiction. And so one thing that I wanted to touch on, uh, which everyone, every single person touched on, was clinical outcomes. And it's like, once we have all this adherence data, how does that actually get to the doctor and how do they use it? So in our space, in opioids, we actually see doctors very, very cautious about getting data in the first place because they don't want to be liable because we can give them all this data and it's really nice data and it can give you very accurate understanding of what the patient's doing, mm -hmm. but doctors are saying, no, don't give it to me because if you give it to me, then the DA says that I'm liable if anything happens. And so I was wondering um, if anyone has any stories, anecdotes of attitudes from doctors about giving them adherence patient data, not in the opiate space, but whatever spaces you're working in, and what are the reactions to those? So, so maybe just to clarify, yeah. anecdotes are great, but how about oh, yeah, we starting yeah, with data sure. first? Yeah. <laughs> uh, data is what we're looking for. So anybody on the panel would like to comment or? I, I can tell you when we um, began giving objective data back to prescribers, they loved it. Uh, they knew exactly what to do with one specific number. It, came, it was there in the chart at the time that they were seeing a patient, and it was a number that they understood. Um, currently, it, we've since changed our process and how we do it, and I think it is all about the way that the information is provided to them. As long as it's actionable and they know what action should be taken, it is always come in a good light. Um, we've made some, some big mistakes in the type of information that we have given some of our providers, and that has definitely taken a toll in their perception of what to do with it and how well they received it. Um, we have hit some bumps in the road, especially with our PDMP data, uh, because no one wants to look in there and be like, well, if I look in there, now I actually have to do something about this. Uh, but it definitely has helped us have much more accurate and um, I would say heartfelt conversations with patients if they did have sort of inappropriate PDMP activity. Yeah, yeah we, we see exactly what you mentioned. Physicians have no time, and so they, 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 are, they don't want to get those data, and even worse, they don't want to get those data in real time. The, the, where we have really excellent uh, feedback about the, when you feedback the data is when there is a multidisciplinary team in place. And for example, I'm working in Belgium with a major clinic, cardiology clinic, which is nurse-led clinic. It's a new model. It's led by the nurses. The first contact is with a nurse, and then it's reference to, to the cardiologist when needed, and so, and, and they love it. They love the data, and the cardiologist is at the end and gets the final data. He doesn't have to process, he doesn't, doesn't have to talk to the patient about that. So it's really when you have a coordinated team, a multidisciplinary team in place, that they love to receive those data, in, primarily in the excellent centers. Mike? Yeah, I would agree. I, I think the challenge is, you know, what to do with the data and how much time you have with the patient um, to address the issues of non-adherence, because sometimes it could be pretty straightforward. Sometimes, you know, it's pretty complicated. And I would agree that in places where it works well is when there's a team of people to address it. Um, and, you know, I, I'm both at the VA and the university, and at the VA, I mean, there's, you know, more of a team structure where there's a pharmacist working with you and I think in those settings it's a lot easier to use that data to and then make a plan whereas you know at the university it's really you know there's not a, less of a team and so it's just the individual physician and there are the challenges really the time and then the, co the what the reason for non adherence is um, and, and the ability to be able to deal with it within a short time frame of a visit. So I think also opioid is a different beast in itself, and I think that there's a pendulum has gone back the other way. So there is a sense of um, being um, punished. But I think um, you know this is also quality improvement in some respects. So I think part of it is what people are, we, we typically do red, yellow, green. So if it's green, I leave it alone. Red, um, I know I need to do something, but then 
what do I do? How do I facilitate that? Uh, you need to give people the tools to do something. Just because you can tell them there's a problem doesn't mean that you're going to solve it. But you know, I, th I think the reason why it's important to consider the context, though, is Mike's done some work with PCI. So these are patients come in, they get a procedure, and then um, prescribe them a, um, a drug, uh, and basically find that what about 20% of the people don't even they've just had the procedure in 24 hours. They're still not almost 20% not filling it. But there, in that context, the cardiologists want to know, and the actual the intervention is trying to close that loop so that the patients get those drugs. So I think in that situation where I've just spent the time, I've just done the procedure, I really want the patient to help. So I think there's some variations that we have to figure Because it's a yes out. or no. Great. Um, Ma'am, do you want to introduce yourself? And I think this may be uh, the last question before break. Hi. Adina Knight, I'm from Icuvia. Just curious on the clinical trial data, have you looked at it to see if there are differences in adherence whenever there are either drugs being studied that have a lot of adverse uh, side effects or those that show more clinical benefit versus placebo that the patients can perceive? So if the patient's already feeling better on the drug, do they adhere better than those on placebo? Or if they're having more side effects on the drug, do they adhere worse than those that are on placebo? Yes, and I would say each study is its own story uh, <laughs> because we see a, a lot of different, it's, it's clear the side effects is a driver for non-persistence, that's very clear. Uh, but we have seen, uh, for example, those, those ranging studies, phase two, where you have eight arms and different doses. And we, we see in cardiovascular, in particular, we have seen a study where the highest dose was taking less medication on num in terms of number of tablets at the lowest dose. So they were auto adjusting to the same dose, whatever the, 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 the dose they were randomized to and things like that, where if you don't know the exposure, you, you don't know which dose to pick. So really, uh, each study is its own story and we see huge differences across treatments, so across studies, but also across centers. Uh, adherence across centers is critical and, and you, you, you can put in place management plans of centers, countries, as soon as you, you have those data. So tons of variability, uh, yeah. variables no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's give the, uh, the panel a round of applause. Thanks. Uh, let's take, uh, be back here at quarter two for the last one, so 2.45.
Eight. Quarter to three. Last one, we're almost done. What's that? Yeah, um, can we have the speakers come up? They spelt it out phonetically. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for uh, coming back. Um, this is the last one. So um, the first three sessions are hopefully moving and helping us move to this. This is uh, session four, talking about study designs to evaluate tracking improvements in medication adherence and impact and clinical outcomes. So um, we've talked a little bit about this, so we're all pretty familiar with the traditional RCT, randomized clinical control trial. Uh, and knowing what the benefit, the, the, the pluses and the minuses, um, thinking about the time that's involved to conduct them, the cost that's involved with them, and thinking about are there other, is that the right model that we should be thinking about in terms of validating and uh, testing uh, uh, adherence uh, programs, and how should we also be thinking about uh, the real world setting? Because I think what's important is to consider is there's efficacy, effectiveness, and then what we oftentimes call implementation or whatever the real world is. And we see from particularly when we think about adherence, we see differences in outcomes and, and rates as we move through that continuum. And so, um, so the, the last panel will talk about uh, different methods and examples uh, and talk in the context of different ways we can uh, study this. So uh, why don't I, I'd like to introduce our group. So we have uh, Fred, Fred Senatori, who's the medical officer a Division of Cardiovascular and Renal Products in the Office of New Drugs, CEDAR, uh, FDA. We have Natish Shrouti, who's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School uh, and is also a professor in the Health Policy Management at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, uh, as well as the founding executive director of the Center for Healthcare Delivery Sciences uh, and uh, other various things. But he has a, a lot of, a, I told you, in academia, we're really good about giving appointments. But Nitish is very busy with a lot of roles and responsibilities. So, um, And then we have Michael Surratt, who uh, it's great to have. Uh, I've known him for a long time. Uh, we mentioned earlier he's involved with the Medication Adherence Alliance, but really is from, uh, from NIH, been one of the leaders in working in this area for a long time, helping to move the field uh, forward. So Michael is a senior behavioral scientist at NIMH, Division of AIDS Research National Institute. We have Raul Gondalia, uh, who's a health scientist at Propeller Health. And uh, all the way at the end is George Savage, who's the chief medical officer and co-founder of Proteus uh, Digital Health. So uh, let's give a round of applause and uh, ask Fred to come on up and start the, uh, the dialogue. You might not want to applause after I speak. <laughs> anyway, um, I deliberately have no slides because today I'm on learning mode rather than preaching mode. And I must tell you that whatever I tell you up here is my personal opinion and should not be construed as FDA policy or thoughts for that matter. But I have four thoughts as a prelude to the rest of our esteemed panel. The first is what was already eloquently stated. Adherence is critical to health care, and I think it's part and parcel of our service to the public health. Not only must we bring safe and effective drugs to the market, I think we should get heavily involved with medication adherence. The problems of non-adherence, that is the side effects of medications, dosing regimen, the complexity of the medication standards, the affordability, socioeconomic status, education, racial and ethnic disparities are all embedded in every realm of the ecological model. And that model involves the patient, him, him or herself, with biases and behaviors, the patient-doctor relationship and trust, um, community access, and society at large. The issues that embrace medication adherence issues are many times beyond the scope of our regulatory authority. So what do we do from the a perspective of the FDA. That brings me to my second of four thoughts. What we would like to learn from this meeting is if a company approaches us and wants a medication adherence claim, 
what do we tell them? What do they have to do to get a medication adherence claim? And that leads me to my third and provocative thought. I thought of several regulatory strategies, requirements, and pathways that I think should be food for discussion amongst our panel and amongst you what, during open discussion. For example, should we require a sponsor to formulate an adherence plan as part of the NDA uh, that would be analogous to a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy? Should we attempt to create an incentive for adherence similar to the pediatric initiative Right now, we don't have the power to do that. That would require an act of Congress. When adherence goes up, does outcome go up? That is one question we'd like to answer. Should we require a sponsor to demonstrate that improved adherence will actually lead to improved outcome? One possible regulatory pathway is the accelerated approval strategy for adherence claim. So the sponsor would come to us and present a proposal to improve adherence by a certain percentage. And that percentage improvement in adherence should reasonably be likely to predict what improvement in clinical outcome would occur. And that would involve performing a clinical trial as a commitment to actually demonstrate what the adherence improvement will show. That might be too costly, but that's a food for thought for discussion. And finally, as far as uh, potential thinking strategies, is to design a clinical trial simply to evaluate an intervention aimed at improving adherence versus standard of care. Um, everyone has said, everyone knows, and it's been said several times, that what gets a drug to the market, what gets a drug approved, is at least 80% compliance in the uh, clinical trial. And I use the word compliance as it relates to a clinical trial because that's not adherence. Adherence is from the patient in the real world. And we all know that the real world adherence is approximately 50%. So designing a trial to improve adherence from 50% to 80% and getting the outcome back to what it was in the pivotal trial that caused the approval to begin with might be something worth pursuing. And this leads to my fourth and final point, the potential clinical designs. As has already been eloquently stated, randomized clinical trials are problematic. Um, they are rigid. Um, they are monitored very well, patients are subsidized, and patients pro most likely will comply with the protocol and take the drugs as prescribed. Adherence is embedded in the real world, not the pivotal trial world for, for approval. Trials evaluated adherence need to be embedded in the real world with the design aimed at incorporating a standard of care paradigm. So one would think of developing a real-world adherence trial, comparing an intervention versus standard of care, and powered the trial for an improvement of adherence caused by the intervention compared to that standard of care. This could be a cluster design trial based upon regional variations in standard of care. Careful consideration should be focused on ensuring that adherence in the real world is not, mis not mistaken for compliance in a trial. The trial should mimic what actually takes place in the real world. How to measure adherence and how to validate that measurement is an issue that has already been discussed. And consideration should also be focused on ensuring that if you do a trial, for example, with a fancy gadget, that people could afford that gadget uh, or be given that gadget. If you're going to have people in a trial that possess these gadgets to begin with, you might be excluding the very patients where adherence is the most problematic. And finally, most of all, we need to address the ethnic and racial disparities that are intrinsically tied to adherence in order to ensure that adherence, adherence means something, that people who don't adhere to the drugs are not because they don't want to adhere, but maybe because they can't. So that concludes my presentation, and I'm looking forward to hearing from my esteemed uh, panel here. Thank you. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So I have a relatively basic uh, uh, point to make in the next sort of seven or eight minutes, which is really just uh, picking up on Fred's last point, that we come to research and, uh, and regulatory approval in a very specific way, and that's through a sort of a cascade of studies um, that lead to, uh, in the case of a therapeutic and, uh, for example, a prescription drug, 
uh, getting FDA approval, uh, and that these are a series of increasingly large uh, and, uh, and increasingly focused questions uh, through the traditional phases of research uh, that at the end of which uh, the FDA asserts that something is safe and effective for use. Um, and this sort of lens is really a, an appropriate lens for that sort of question. But there's a separate question when thinking about the real use of therapeutics of any kind, or diagnostics for that matter, um, which is really how can we achieve maximal value? Since, since simply asserting that something is safe and effective uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it achieves maximal value. Uh, and instead, there's a second parallel pathway uh, of things that need to happen um, in order for something to achieve maximal value. Um, and so if we begin from left to right on this slide on the second row, you know, if we begin from the approval process, um, we need to know how things uh, compare favorably to each other. Many therapeutics are approved uh, in comparison to placebo. As a practitioner, uh, I will, for example, when treating a patient with diabetes, I'm generally not making a decision between placebo and active therapy. I'm making a decision between two active therapies or sometimes between an active therapy and a lifestyle intervention or a surgical procedure um, in some rare cases. And, and so we need to know that, um, and that sort of effectiveness uh, in writ large. Um, we, in some cases, need to know whether things represent good value for money. Uh, not widely used in the U.S. healthcare system, uh, but certainly in some jurisdictions, the idea that you know, we, if we have comparative options in terms of effectiveness and safety, we may also have comparative options in terms of cost, and rolling all three of those things together leads to the societally most efficient process. And that at the end of those two boxes, the orange and the, and the first blue box, we sort of have identified optimal therapy, which is different than the, whether a therapy is safe and effective for use. Um, but then after that is the implementation problem. We need to make sure um, that in the case of drugs, things are prescribed appropriately and then adhered to over the long term. And so the sorts of questions that we're asking in the second, in the bottom row are profoundly different than the kinds of questions that we're asking in the top row. And as a consequence, the traditional way that we study this, um, I think, should also be different. Um, so the traditional approach uh, is asking a question like, does it work? Is it safe and effective? Um, and uh, and the, the type of trial that we use to do that um, is sometimes called an explanatory trial or an efficacy trial. Um, and uh, by definition, it's a trial that is undertaken in an idealized setting to give the initiative under evaluation its best chance to dem demonstrate a beneficial effect. Um, and so all the choices that are made in those trials are, are in many cases very defensible um, and appropriate. Uh, but they are sort of answering a question of under optimal circumstances, does it work? And if it doesn't work in those circumstances, then it may not work at all. And that's sort of the, the presumption which is very different than if you're asking the second cascade of, uh, where am I pointing? There, uh, let's go forward again. The second cascade of things, so as in moving from safe and effective to maximal value, in that case, we are asking a different question. We're asking the question, can we ensure use? Um, which is really an effectiveness or pragmatic question. I personally don't like the term pragmatic, uh, but the, the, that's sort of the nomenclature that's been around for now 40 or 50 years. And the purpose of, a, of an effectiveness trial is, or an effectiveness trial by definition, is one that is undertaken in the real world and with usual care and is intended to help support a decision on whether to deliver an intervention. So the question itself is different, and therefore the designs uh, should also be different. Um, so what makes a trial pragmatic? Well, there's lots of sort of criteria. This is a very busy slide. I'm just going to sort of talk you through it if you're interested. This is sort of the, a, a framework uh, that many people refer to, refer to. It's called the PRACI framework, and this is a version, the second version of it, so-called PRACI2. And there are a number of characteristics or choices that get made in trial design, which makes something more pragmatic um, than not. And so, for example, who's included? Right, so we've heard about racial and ethnic disparities, people with multimorbidity, um, people who are non-adherent um, by definition. And in, in a pragmatic trial or an effectiveness trial, we'd include anybody um, who may potentially be eligible for the therapy under interest, as opposed to only those who, for internally valid reasons, um, may be excluded. For example, those with renal impairment. Um, and so who gets included is sort of criteria number one. Um, what gets done to include them? 
So in clinical trials, there's all kinds of extra effort. Fred made mention of this, all the extra attention, the financial incentives, um, the daily calls from study coordinators, or if not daily, then certainly regular, the study-specific visits, all of which are appropriate, uh, but which are co-interventions as far as adherence goes. Um, and so how much of that would be actually done in the real world? Along those same lines, how, much, how flexible is the delivery of the intervention? If I take my warfarin when I take my warfarin and I get my INR checked when I get my INR checked, which is regrettably what happens in clinical care in many settings, um, that's a little different than a trial which is uh, comparing warfarin in a highly sort of regulated environment, for example, to a DOAC. And so for those reasons, there are reasons to favor more naturalistic um, uh, uh, adherence-oriented or flexibility-oriented design features. Um, the last two concepts I want to talk about, which we've touched on a little bit, are one is sort of what outcomes we care about and what the primary analysis is. Um, and so in a, uh, the distinction in an explanatory trial is, in some cases, not all, but you know, regulatory approval can be achieved based on surrogate markers. There are lots of good examples of when that sort of process has been reversed and, and stepped back. But uh, we, you can still get regulatory approval for lots of things on that basis. Whereas in a real world setting or in a pragmatic setting, we really care about um, not the primary outcomes that are directly relevant to patients. Um, and so that sort of may be adherence, but in principle, as we've heard multiple times, I don't feel better when I'm adherent specifically. Um, and, uh, and so there's a, a choice to be made about what we're measuring. Um, there are numerous examples, and including from my own work, um, many of the trials that we have run, in which we have seen improvements in adherence. In some cases, in levels that we thought were clinically meaningful, 5%, 10%, um, but with no result in change in clinical outcomes, um, sort of leading to questions about which outcomes we should really be measuring. Um, last and perhaps most importantly is the primary analysis. And the lens here is really one of intention to treat, but in a different way than you may think of this otherwise. Um, and so uh, in traditional trials, you know, for, at least for effectiveness uh, or outcomes or efficacy outcomes, we will do intention to treat anyone randomized, we'll get analyzed. But here, the unit of analysis really needs to be anyone randomized to an adherence strategy, including those who don't take it. So for example, a trial, NHLBI funded trial we ran and published last year called Stick To It, we randomized people to this multi-component technologically enabled intervention kind of pharmacist led. Um, and the intervention itself is really not that important, but we knew that about half of people would not accept the intervention. Um, and uh, yet we randomized and then offered people the intervention and we compared all those people who were offered to an identical group of people who were randomized, in this case cluster randomized, and who, um, and who were never offered the intervention. And in that case, we get, an, uh, we get a measure of uh, treatment effect that is what we would expect in another treatment setting. In this case, it was in a large ACO. Um, and so I think even from that perspective of how the analysis gets done is critically different than you might expect in a traditional efficacy study. Um, there's one other, uh, this is actually, sorry, before I move on to one other concept, there are, this is an, exa an example of how efficacy and um, pragmatic trials may visually look different. Um, so on the right, um, is an efficacy study, one of the classic efficacy studies we have in cardiometabolic disease, the NASIT trial. For those of us who are clinicians and old enough to remember this, this was the trial that proved to us that endarterectomy, removing plaque from the arteries in the neck, um, reduced rates of recurrent stroke for people who had had a stroke. Um, and this trial was highly, uh, highly regulated. So to be a surgeon in the trial, you had to have your charts audited and you've had to be a high volume provider it was only done at some academic centers. There was a huge laundry list of inclusion and exclusion criteria, all of which were highly appropriate um, in that context. Um, but nevertheless, um, they, so it was highly efficacy oriented and by the framework of the PRACI criteria, they are all clustering towards the central E or explanatory. As opposed to the trial on the left, which is a directly observed therapy trial for tuberculosis treatment, in which there was much more flexibility in terms of who was included, where the settings were done, what was given to them, and so you get things which are towards the periphery. So just as a visual difference between these two concepts. Um, so the last idea that I want to leave to you is that there is, uh, we've talked a little bit about data today, and I'm just going to sort of piggyback on that for my last slide, um, which is that, you know, trials are expensive in part because they're, they're hugely burdensome in terms of finding patients and then collecting outcomes. 
And in the space of figuring out how we can improve quality for interventions that are all, we already know to exist, uh, uh, or that sort of is at odds with the goals of implementation. Um, and so traditional trials um, will, um, will use strict inclusion criteria applied to subjects actively recruited from clinical care settings and use detailed case report forms to collect outcomes. So most of the large trials that are published sort of follow this mold. Pragmatic trials begin to move us along, and they will use more generalizable, as we've sort of talked about, inclusion and exclusion criteria, very few, um, and uh, use often simple uh, uh, perspective data collection forms. So for example, the Women's Health Initiative uses a one-page data collection form. The, there is sort of the, the final step in the pathway is that these very same data sources, and most of our trials kind of follow this um, vein, use limited criteria applied to patients identified using routinely collected data. So that cluster randomized NHLBI funded trial that I mentioned a few minutes ago, we used electronic health record data merged with claims data to identify patients who were um, poorly adherent and had, were not meeting disease targets for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. And that merge set identified our population of interest. And then we have ed evaluated both clinical outcomes uh, and, it, and adherence related outcomes using routinely collected data, in this case, two different sources. Um, so the very last uh, comment that I'll make, and then I, I will uh, turn over to uh, the other speakers, is that in principle, you know, I've sort of set up this dichotomy, right? That there is efficacy kind of stuff and there's effectiveness or implementation oriented studies. Um, but in principle, and I think Fred was, was hinting at this, there is no reason to not imagine that you couldn't do these things at the same time. Um, and so imagine running a traditional efficacy-oriented parallel group randomized control trial, a, a, a therapy that has an adherence claim, while also running an effectiveness trial at the same time. Um, and uh, so you could imagine, and there are a wide variety of study designs that some of my colleagues and I have been kicking around, which you could imagine doing some of these things at the same time. So it need not be that we need to wait for efficacy in order to study implementation. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be with you today, and I offer my great thanks to the organizers at Duke, Margolis, as well as to Hayden uh, for convening us today and also for leading the field forward. Really appreciate it. Uh, so my name is Mike Sterrett. I work at the NIMH Division of AIDS Research. We're the component of NIMH that focuses on HIV AIDS, and I'm also pleased to co-lead the NIH Adherence Network alongside my colleague Janet Damore. Um, I think that uh, for my talk today, it's really very complementary to what Natish has just told us. I think we're really reading from the same page. And that is that when it comes to trials that are testing adherence interventions, we want to find this sweet spot, this happy middle ground between real world relevance and rigor in terms of our, our study design. And, and I'm happy to think with you about that today. Um, so, uh, you know, at the NIH, we're really about science, and science is about accumulating evidence. And when it comes to the evidence in the space of adherence interventions, the fact is, is that we have been subject to some criticism in the past. And this is this uh, well-read and, and widely circulated Cochrane Collaboration Report from several years ago, which assembled the evidence base around adherence interventions. They looked at more than 180 trials that had tested adherence interventions, a whole variety of different ones from a variety of different areas of uh, medicine. And, uh, collectively uh, decide, uh, evaluated them to actually have pretty weak evidence overall. Uh, they found that many of these trials are compromised by a variety of biases. So for example, the ones that they really call out in these trials are an over-reliance on self-reported measures, which are subject to uh, self-presentational concerns. Uh, earlier this morning, we heard Marie Brown talk about how people don't always want to uh, you know, be honest about their lack of adherence. Um, and then the other thing is that many of these trials actually have inadequate statistical power. They don't have sufficient numbers of participants in them to actually find an effect, at one that would be statistically significant on either an intervention uh, adherence outcome or alternatively a health outcome. So uh, among 18, only about 10% of these trials that they decided were low bias did they find that uh, there was an impact on both the behavior as well as clinical outcomes. And in many ways, this report was an invitation for us to do better, to do more rigorous science and to find better ways to have real impact. 
Uh, relatedly, and more recently, uh, here's a meta-analysis uh, that was published in JAMA. Uh, this was a summary of trials that were testing adherence-related uh, text message interventions, text message interventions to improve medication adherence. And it did find favorable outcomes. Uh, text message interventions in this published research were, you know, indicated that people were much more likely to adhere to their medicines if they were receiving some kind of text message message-based intervention program. But the thing is, is that there was this strong caveat to this meta-analysis, and that's you know, shown here. It's just that the results should be interpreted with caution given the short duration of trials. Many of these trials did not last more than three months. And in the context of a chronic illness where people are dealing with medications on a day-to-day -day basis, that's really not a very long interval. And again, a reliance on self-reported medication adherence measures, ones that are subject to bias and to misreporting. But it's not just the quality of the science, it's also the speed of the science. And Hayden has thoughtfully and importantly pointed us to this, that it just takes far too long for our traditional trials to really produce real movement, real impact on uh, clinical practice and for our proven interventions to ultimately enter into uh, clinical care. Uh, so we, there is something that we need to do, not just about the quality of the science, but also the speed of the science. And, and I wanna suggest that there are some ways that we can do this. Uh, so one of those ways would be to pursue, just as Natish has mentioned, to think more about doing pragmatic trials. Pra pragmatic trials are trials that are designed to balance these two things, the need for scientific rigor, but also having real-world relevance. Uh, and this is a commentary that appeared in PLOS Medicine uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, led by Elvin Gang. And here they kind of chart two axes. Uh, one is the degree of rigor in a clinical trial, and the other is its relevance to real-world practice contexts and you could be high or low on either. A pragmatic trial would combine high methodologic rigor along with real world relevance. Uh, these other kinds of trials uh, you know, fall a little bit short of having that mark. Uh, a pedantic trial, for example, would be very rigorous, but it's unlikely to have real world impact. It might be a Cadillac intervention, something that is just unlikely to ever be implemented in real world practice, for example. So we wanna hit the sweet spot, which is the pragmatic box. Uh, and uh, Natisha has already gone through the PRECI uh, 2 criteria, which are illustrated here. That's one helpful way for us to kind of organize our trials and to think about how we can make them uh, either, uh, you know, very explanatory, you know, highly rigorous, or to broaden them out and to have kind of a large real-world relevance. I think what I want to suggest is that between that kind of broad scope or that narrow focus, we want to kind of find, again, that sweet spot, that middle ground that, that is in between the two. Uh, and uh, I think one area where we have done that is in the HIV uh, space, and that's the space that I've been working in for some time now. Uh, so in the context of HIV AIDS, we're very fortunate to have very effective medicines. We have HIV combination antiretroviral treatment, uh, which is literally life-saving. Uh, and then more recently, we now have HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. This is a prophylactic regimen where one pill a day can keep HIV away. Uh, and in both cases, uh, the populations who use these medicines tend to be highly marginalized. Uh, we're talking about individuals who uh, represent racial and ethnic minority communities, uh, gay men, uh, transgender women, uh, sex workers, uh, groups that are subject to not only the stigma of HIV, but also stigma, discrimination, and racism, which affects their communities and themselves. And many of these populations, because of that stigma, because of that social context, also experience a heavy comorbidity burden. They have disproportionately high rates of mental disorders or of substance abuse disorders. So these are challenging populations to work with on the adherence space. Non-adherence is very common, and we do see racial and ethnic, as well as age disparities in medication use. Uh, and these have been longstanding and persistent. Uh, despite these many challenges, we're very fortunate to say that there are evidence-based interventions to support HIV treatment adherence. And this is just one example which some might be interested to explore further, but um, there's one agency here in the United States which has uh, a charge to evaluate adherence interventions before they get recommended to others, and that's the CDC, actually. Uh, the CDC uh, does a regular review and has assembled a compendium of evidence-based adherence interventions that relate to HIV treatment. Uh, and that's this medication adherence chapter that you see here. And if you're interested, you can go online and you can look up the criteria that they use to gauge whether or not an intervention is a proven intervention, whether it's an evidence-based intervention. Uh, and I won't go into those in detail here, 
I, I will say that some of the criteria are pretty heady. Uh, you know, they, they really ask a lot of these interventions, but uh, as we stand here today, uh, there are 20 interventions that meet their criteria for being good for addressing HIV treatment medication adherence. So what is it that um, we can get right in this space, that HIV has gotten right? Um, well, I think that many of these trials, not everyone, but most, have been able to strike a balance, strike a balance, again, between real-world relevance and rigor. Uh, and so one way that they tend to be more pragmatic in their nature is uh, thinking about how they work in real-world care settings. Most of these intervention trials have really done, been done in HIV treatment clinics, places where people are receiving care. Uh, also, many of these trials have relatively limited exclusion criteria. Um, they might exclude just a handful of people who experience, uh, you know, um, uh, challenges uh, to their participation in the study of one sort or another, but they really allow for many participants who have a variety of comorbidities, you know, degrees of uh, uh, depression, depressive symptoms, for example. Uh, frequently in these trials, these HIV treatment adherence trials, the comparator is usual care, so they're comparing it to what people are receiving in their regular clinical care. Some of these trials allow for tailored intervention delivery, and I'll give you a couple of examples of those in a minute. And the other thing is that these are really an attention to treat analysis, which is rated as a pragmatic approach. You know, assuming, you know, looking at how uh, the, the trial is, uh, uh, how well it does when you include everyone in it, uh, not just those who took it up. Um, ooh. So uh, how does it balance the pragmatic aspects with uh, rigor? Um, well, some of the ways that we've added rigor to these trials is by uh, doing one of two things. One is that some of the trials do only enroll people who are just starting their therapy. Uh, but another is by only enrolling those individuals whose non-adherence have de prior demonstrated non-adherence or poor clinical outcomes. And this is because earlier on, we had ceiling effects. We would enroll people, but we couldn't demonstrate that an intervention improved adherence because people had all met a certain ceiling level. And so if we enroll people who have a problem and then we randomize them to different conditions, we have the chance to see whether those two different conditions produce differentials on their adherence over time. The trials uh, will be well-powered either on a behavioral outcome like medication adherence or on a clinical outcome, in this case, it's viral load. Uh, I, they do use more frequent and more objective measures of methods of assessment. That might be medication, electronic monitors. It might be measures of uh, drug exposure. It could be viral load. Uh, but they tend to do that more frequently than they would do in regular care, and that's to help gauge the, the validity of the results. Um, also, they'll employ clinically meaningful follow-up periods, you know, six months, 12 months, enough time where we could see real impact on viral load if that was possible. And also, they will tend to examine intervention dosage and mechanisms of behavior change. Janet mentioned this earlier, that we want to see not just that something worked, but we want to see that it's engaging targets, that if we think that it's going to build social support or if it's going to improve motivation to adherence, it should change those mediational factors and not just the actual behavioral outcome. Um, Do I think it stopped. Ah, good. Okay. Well, uh, you know, so I'll just tell you about, maybe I'll just tell you one of these trials. You know, so this was uh, the Welltel HIV treatment adherence trial, and it's actually almost a decade old now, but it probably was the, one of the first adherence interventions to ever be published in The Lancet. And the reason why is because it was one of the first adherence interventions that used a mobile health approach and then demonstrated impact on biologic outcomes, in this case, HIV viral load. And the thing that's great about this trial is that it is uh, highly patient-centered. Uh, what happened was it was conducted in Kenya, and uh, individuals who were starting HIV treatment were randomized to one of two conditions, either usual care or a single once a week text message. That weekly text message asked individuals, how are you? Uh, and the people who were in the intervention arm were instructed to reply with either fine or problem. And if they indicated in response to that text message that there was a problem, a nurse called them and then talked about whatever that issue was with them on the phone. And that could be a whole variety of challenges that they were experiencing with their medications or with their health care. At the end of one year, we found that there was higher levels of viral suppression among those individuals who received this once weekly text message and, uh, and had this dialogue with their uh, providers. People who received that kind of intervention saw it as a communication channel. Even if they weren't having a problem, they felt like it was a chance to have an outlet if there ever was a problem for them to engage with their providers. Um, and so that was very encouraging. 
Uh, more recently, a similar approach has been applied here domestically in the United States to the ca case of HIV pre-exposure or prophylaxis or PrEP. And so this is a trial that was published uh, last year in clinical infectious diseases. And uh, I'll skip it for the moment because of uh, time, but uh, what it was able to demonstrate is that by using this interactive communication through text messaging, they were able to demonstrate higher drug levels, higher levels of protective uh, PrEP medication among individuals who received those messages. Um, I'll just conclude then by mentioning a few different trends that we see in our work, both in HIV and then across our more uh, broader work at NIH. Um, the uh, investigators here behind the uh, meeting were thinking about our trial design. And it is interesting, I mean, when we see applications to, at NIH and we make our awards, I mean, it's true, you know, individual level RCTs still dominate. They still are the singular and main way that people evaluate and develop their evidence. Uh, and many of us are trying to advance alternatives to that, you know, that might help us to move more quickly or to work at larger levels. When we're looking at larger levels of influence, if we're doing an intervention in a clinic uh, or in a healthcare system, then we really need to think about the ability to do large-scale cluster randomized trials. And we do have projects like that that are advancing. Now, this morning, I did hear that uh, there is reluctance to engage in randomization when you're working at those larger levels. And, and there, we, we recently, we're seeing uh, this variation, which is called stepped wedge trials, which is very interesting. You know, if an innovation is going to be rolled out to a, a set of clinics or across a set of healthcare systems, it's an opportunity to not do that everywhere all at once, but to randomize those different components to start at different times. You know, uh, component A starts in January, component B starts in June, and, and you roll it out sequentially across a set of randomized levels. And those, that kind of design, this stepped wedge design, allows you to make for some comparisons both within and between the different uh, uh, clinics or, or organizations that are implementing the new innovation, the new uh, intervention. So step wedge trials has gotten some attention for us. And then there's other approaches that many of us are calling for, but we have yet to really see in our evidence base or to see in our research awards. Uh, one of them is dose-finding trials for adherence interventions. This kind of flips the paradigm. It doesn't ask whether an adherence intervention works or not, but it asks how much of it is necessary in order for it to work. Uh, and we don't have too much NIH research that's following that kind of model yet. Uh, but for example, you could ask not whether a fourth session counseling intervention changes people's adherence and improves their viral load, but you could ask how many uh, counseling sessions is required in order for, let's say, 80% of individuals to reach viral suppression. Last thing is these trial designs, which are coming to us from really areas of technologic research. Uh, and uh, those are things like uh, CBIT, that's the continuous evaluation of evolving behavioral intervention tech technologies, micro-randomized designs, uh, and N of 1 designs. I I'd be happy to talk more about these uh, in the discussion period, but, but these are alternatives to the classic RCT model that involve doing clever types of randomization, uh, randomizing different components of a combination intervention to see which one produces better effect. Uh, an N of 1 design is not a case study. You actually randomize and use double-blinded design to assign a set of interventions to an individual and to have them engage in those different individual interventions over time to see how it influences their adherence. Uh, and there's a variety of other approaches. And, and there's several of us, many of us at the NIH Adherence Network who are calling for more work in these kinds of designs, which are very frontier, very promising, but, but have yet to enter our regular award practice. So I'll just conclude there that our goal is really to maintain real-world relevance without sacrificing rigor. There's a variety of methodologic considerations we can do to achieve that balance. And while these individual level RCTs do continue to dominate our work, uh, we do think that designs are diversifying and, and we invite uh, your efforts to continue uh, to follow on that path. So thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, second to last presenter. Uh, so hope you all are still paying attention. Um, I am Rahul Gandalia. I am a health science, health research scientist at Propeller Health, and I'm going to be talking about our electronic medication monitors and how that relates to medication adherence, as we've been talking about today. Um, so 
COPD and asthma are leading causes of morbidity and mortality throughout the U.S. and abroad, and this is going to be a larger issue as the, as the population ages. Um, but this burden can be uh, diminished or at least lessened in some way by improving the treatment and management of these diseases. Part of that includes improving adherence to daily inhaled medications. And for example, inhaled corticosteroids, uh, long-acting beta agonists, and, and, and some others. Um, and as we've talked about earlier today, um, adherence in practice is low. And in respiratory health, it could range from 10 to 40 percent, depending on what population that we're looking at. And it's often difficult to assess adherence, not only at the research level, but also at the clinical level. Uh, but there are novel methods to try to do this, and this includes the electronic medication monitors. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, propeller, propeller health, uh, what, it, what that means in, uh, in terms of respiratory health and improving adherence. So propeller is a connected health platform, so it includes Bluetooth-enabled sensors that attach onto patients' existing inhalers um, that track uh, rescue medication usage, but also controller medication usage, so we could calculate adherence. Uh, this data is uh, transferred to, via Bluetooth to a smartphone, a patient smartphone or caregiver smartphone. If the user does not have a smartphone, there's also data hubs that could be plugged into the wall where this data can be transferred. And then this information is not only shared with the patient via a patient-facing mobile application, uh, but it could sh be shared with the patient's uh, provider via monthly reports. Um, and there's also opportunities for uh, the provider to engage in a provider-facing portal uh, so they could track their patients' uh, medication, uh, rescue medication use as well as controller medication adherence. This is uh, a little bit of what the patient-facing uh, app looks like. Um, so it takes a multifaceted approach to remind patients to take their daily medications while also including uh, educational aspects uh, into, into this as well. So patients could look at their, uh, their weekly and monthly adherence um, uh, uh, adherence uh, over time. Uh, there is some gamific gamification aspects to the mobile app to try to help improve adherence over time with patients. Uh, and then there's also reminders. These are in-app reminders or email reminders uh, to take the, app, uh, take the controller medication at, the, uh, as a de at a designated time. Um, and the sensors themselves include uh, uh, an, an, auto, an audible reminder uh, uh, at certain times as well. So we've talked a little bit about uh, the study's design considerations uh, and the tension between eff efficacy and effectiveness, and that's really a function of uh, lots of different characteristics in a study design, but really uh, uh, I want to highlight here the population that is being studied, uh, the generalizability, the transportability of that, the setting in which the study is being done, um, and uh, the study design designs around that. For electronic medication monitors, uh, and something that we've dealt with is defining the intervention as well. What is the intervention? So we have some examples here uh, to the left, the sensor with a mobile application with, with healthcare provider involvement versus just a patient-facing patient, patient component, which is the mobile app and the sensor. And then what are we comparing those to? Just, uh, uh, an inhaler with a sensor on it without any feedback um, or usual care, so just an inhaler in general. And we also need to think about how we're calculating adherence uh, with the data that we have. So with, if the uh, study participants are using sensors, then we could, object, we could objectively monitor this data um, in, in real time and calculate adherence by the number of puffs taken divided by the number of puffs that are prescribed. If our comparison group, however, is usual care, then we have to look at some other approaches as, as have been described in, in other panels, uh, including prescription and dispensing records from EMRs or self-report, et cetera. And I want to talk through some of the studies, some of the earlier studies that we've done and talk about some of the lessons learned that we had. Um, so first, uh, in the purple, uh, this is an observational study that was done in the real world. Um, investigators included patients uh, uh, via, via mail and asked whether or not they wanted to be included in this study. Uh, and they could opt in or out of using the propeller health sensors here. And this is the sensor only. Um, so, uh, there's no uh, healthcare provider involvement, and there was no uh, mobile application or feedback in that way. The duration of this study was six months, um, and because the control arm was uh, 
uh, did not have a sensor involved. We, uh, they used uh, prescription uh, uh, dispensing, or sorry, medication dispensings to assess adherence. Uh, and what we saw was that the intervention group had higher, higher mean dispensings over that six month period. So just including a sensor, or uh, adding a sensor to their controller medications, that in and of itself improved adherence over a certain amount of time. <laughs> Uh, the, the second, the second uh, uh, study that I want to go over is a randomized control trial that was done in an integrated health system. Um, in this case, the patients were randomized to either receive the propeller app, uh, a sensor, as well as uh, sharing that data with a healthcare provider versus uh, the other arm that had a sensor only. And um, this, was, this was a small study, but uh, what the investigators observed was, uh, again, high, higher adherence in the intervention group versus the, versus the controller group here. Um, but uh, arguably, it didn't, it, uh, the adherence still in the intervention group is lower than the 80% threshold that has been discussed earlier today, um, but, but it, there's still an increase in adherence. And finally, I want to go over another randomized control trial that uh, some investigators have looked at. And this was a multi-center RCT. It had very, a very rigorous protocol, um, and it had five arms. And I'm only showing uh, three of those arms here today. So the control experience was just including the medication uh, sensor, uh, and it was compared to sensor, versus sensor with app and sensor with app and healthcare provider input. This was a six-month study as well, and uh, the outcome was... Uh, uh, inhaled corticosteroid lava adherence. Um, what we saw here was very high adherence even in the controller group. So this is 69% adherence uh, in that group. Uh, and we were actually surprised to see still improved adherence in the two other arms that, that were statistically significant um, and slightly higher adherence uh, with, uh, with healthcare provider involvement. But the high adherence that we're seeing here is uh, kind of reflective of what we often see in some trial designs and that may not really reflect what's happening in the real world. And it's common in respiratory health studies in general uh, to have these efficacy studies that don't translate to effectiveness. Um, and to get to effectiveness, uh, we, we need to think about the target population and, and some of these aspects that are laid out here and that other panelists have talked about. So what if the uh, intervention that we have uh, is, uh, is efficacious and actually is effective in terms of improving adherence if it's not really improving clinical outcomes. Um, there have been many null studies uh, in the respiratory health field that found null associations between improved adherence and reduced exacerbations um, as defined by ED visits or hospitalizations. Um, but not all of these studies, of course. But the ones that, the ones that we tend to see that are null are oftentimes not powered uh, to, to what they could be, um, and they have different aspects of the study design that, uh, that I think could be improved. And this includes the selection of the patient population, um, not only the size of the samples, uh, but also the, the, the panel of, of patients. Uh, these could be relatively low-risk patients, maybe people that aren't, at, aren't really at high risk of experience and exacerbation during the study duration. Um, they may already include patients that are already adherent uh, to their medications to some extent. There's oftentimes inadequate follow-up. Um, so if the outcome here is an exacerbation uh, or hospitalization ED visit, um, six months may not be long enough depending on what population is being studied. Um, so, so that's another thing uh, that's important to consider. And finally, the exposure measurement error. So if the, the more exposure measurement error there is, so the more noise there, are, there is around the adherence measure, um, the, less, uh, the less power there is to, uh, to estimate an association with, with, uh, with, a, with an outcome. Um, so this includes the error that we have in self-report, but also error from uh, prescription, uh, 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 prescriptions and dispensings, et cetera. So effectiveness in these types of studies also needs to be considered, and there's several different uh, mechanisms to do that. Um, but cluster randomization could be an option. Um, it, it, it's not always perfect, but um, I think it's a very interesting approach that one could take to, to, to look at effectiveness. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't want to delve into that too much at the moment, but um, in, this, in, in this situation, uh, clusters of patients, uh, for example, a practice is randomized to either usual care or an, or an intervention. And I want to highlight 
uh, one specific study that's planned with some of our research partners that is a cluster randomized trial. Um, and the treatment here is usual care versus offering the propeller health uh, sensors with the mobile application. The, long, uh, the duration of the study is one year, which uh, I, th I think is good for trying to evaluate the outcome, which is treatment failure. And this is defined as an exacerbation, an escalation of the medication, uh, or mortality. Uh, and secondary outcomes here is adherence. Um, and we want to, sometimes randomized cluster trials uh, are not as well powered as individual level RCTs. So it's important to uh, choose a patient population uh, that, that will help power the study itself. And this one is uh, at least 1,000 patients with, C, uh, with COPD from over 150 different clinics. And these patients specifically are going to have a history of exacerbation uh, in the prior year or two years um, and, and have poor adherence as documented through the EMR. Thanks. Um, and here's some takeaways, and I think this is uh, what some of the other panelists has also mentioned. Um, and it may seem obvious, but it's really important to have a study question and to have a clear goal uh, that, that is going to define what kind of study is, is going to be uh, implemented. And specifically with electronic medication monitors, it needs to be a well-defined intervention and a well-defined comparator that's going to be relevant for the real world. Population selection is extremely important. Uh, as well as the study duration. Um, so, so, so I guess kind of in conclusion, um, these factors and others uh, and the level of rigor, rigor and effectiveness is really going to be defined by how the study is, study is designed. And uh, I also have an acknowledgement section, and I want to specifically call out the patients that are using Propeller that have kind of helped form what the, what the intervention, what the app looks like right now. Uh, having patient insight into whatever we want patients to use, I think, is critical in trying to make a product uh, that is going to be helpful to, to those patients. Um, as, as people have said before, if, if we have a medication that, that works, but no, no one's taking the medication, what's really the point? I think the same thing goes for, for an intervention such as this. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is George Savage. I'm the co-founder and chief medical officer at Proteus Digital Health. I first want to thank the organizers of the Margolis Center for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous, so bear with me because uh, it's a daunting prospect to uh, follow so many very impressive speakers uh, on such an important topic. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can, uh, realizing that I'm the only thing that stands between you and, uh, and, and wrapping up. Um, when you think about how to uh, study adherence and how do we demonstrate improved adherence, it's important uh, to first think about exactly what is the problem we're trying to solve as product designers. And I start with a very simple feedback mechanism, which is how I think pharmacotherapy works. And medicine really came into its own about a century ago in the hospital environment when this was the loop. Uh, physicians diagnose, they prescribe, nurses administer treatment and record how the patient is doing. Uh, they get together with the doctors on rounds and what have you, and you have a joint assessment and discussion. That leads to a revision of the diagnosis, since uh, we quite often don't get it quite right initially. And then uh, we feed back around that, and uh, hopefully uh, the result is a happy patient who's cured and, and winds up going home. Um, we've adopted the same model, though, in ambulatory pharmacotherapy, and we really haven't thought very much about the product. And uh, I should first start by noting that it, this is pretty common. Innovators in most technical fields tend to innovate and create products for themselves first and foremost. So if you think about how approval works for a product, doctors and other scientists, uh, nurses, what have you, they develop a product. They prove that it it's safe, they prove that it's effective, and if the patient is in a bed in the hospital, that's fine, because the patient is a bystander in this therapeutic loop. Uh, you can be awake, you can be unconscious, but the drug's gonna do its thing and the team is gonna do their work for you. What we've done, though, effectively in ambulatory pharmacotherapy is we've implicitly assigned the patient the role of nurse. And no one has quite made this explicit, but we've just kind of done it. Um, the patient is responsible for administering treatment and for recording in memory somehow their response so that when they see the doctor once every six months and they're asked, how are you feeling, are there any problems, they can give an answer that may or may not be accurate. 
One of the uh, intrinsic issues here, though, is that there's a presumption of a closed loop when it's actually an open loop. When I'm a doctor and I'm listening to a patient talk to me, I think I know what's going on, but I really may not know uh, what's actually happening. What the result is, is this product that fails more than 50% of the time. And we in medicine quite often defensively tend to blame the end user for the fact that the product doesn't work. You're not a good patient. Uh, if only you would listen to me, things would be fine. And something we need to understand is that a whole product, rather than an incomplete product, has to work for people who aren't like us. Uh, a lot of people in this room are probably on the obsessive compulsive side of the spectrum. That's why we're good at medicine and science. Uh, a lot of our patients aren't. That makes the world an interesting place. But we really need to design products for this because uh, it, where I come from in Silicon Valley, you wouldn't get away with blaming uh, half of your users if they couldn't succeed with your product. Now, they used to do this in Silicon Valley, too, if you remember the old days of early computers, but they got smart. They stopped having engineers design products for other engineers, and they, they, they reframed a, a, a computer and called it a phone, which it isn't, and uh, made it very accessible to people who were very unlike the designers. And I believe that we have to do that for uh, medical products as well. And how do we do that? Well, we start with all the best safety and efficacy information for approved products that show what they can be. Uh, but one way to do that is to close the feedback loop again by creating an electronic, if you will, a virtual nurse. And our hypothesis at Proteus was that if you build the feedback into the product directly, uh, you could ameliorate some of these problems because you'd have accurate information going to the physician and also going back to the patient, showing what should be going on. You'd have an accurate picture of what's happening. And perhaps uh, this would help uh, with the situation. And so what we do is we have an edible sensor. It gets co-encapsulated with medicine of interest at the pharmacy. Uh, there's a patch that a patient wears uh, through their daily activities that records activities of life, their heart rate, other physical parameters, but most importantly, the ID code of every pill they swallow, every medicine. This connects to a smartphone, this goes to the cloud, and the notion now, and it connects to EMRs and that kind of thing, is that now the patient can have a sense of what's happening. You get behavioral cues and feedback on whether you're doing a good job or not. The physician gets accurate data about what's really happening rather than what I assume is happening, which can lead to better decision making. And you start to have the feedback loop in place, which is frankly, how, how people in the world learn how to do anything. If you think about school, we would never give our students a textbook in September and say, I'll see you in December for a final exam. That wouldn't work very well. We wouldn't be surprised if the failure rate exceeded 50% maybe. Uh, we don't do that at most of our places of work. We have regular meetings with our manager. And so what we need, first and foremost, as a start with our patients is feedback that's granular, that's actionable, that's linked to what we want to improve. However, it's not enough to say, you know, you get adherence up, because as many scientists here have pointed out, uh, what we really want are outcomes, so you focus on that. So where do you start? Uh, where I would advocate you start, first of all, with your technology is, is it accurate and is it usable by the individual patient? Uh, we have many such studies. This is one from a month ago, a randomized control trial uh, conducted by Sarah Brown and colleagues at the UCSD and Orange County and San Diego County Public Health in TB. And uh, the design was that uh, uh, directly observed therapy was compared to what she calls wirelessly observed therapy, which is Proteus technology. Uh, you first look for concordance, then you randomize patients to either usual care, DOT, or Proteus. Uh, the, the conclusion was, of course, that um, Proteus is equivalent to DOT, 99.3% of all doses verified in the direct comparison, but superior uh, in actual practice because your cell phone doesn't take day, nights and weekends off and doesn't have logistics problems and so on and so forth. And the patients preferred the product. And this is, again, back to product design. One of the things we as physicians need to avoid doing in these interventions is assigning our patients homework and creating um, uh, opportunities for them to do things for us that they would perceive as such. Because people are busy, they don't really want to do that, and so try to have a light burden. Um, where do we go next? We believe in starting in a very controlled setting, uh, randomized uh, trials if possible, and then move to real world evidence. Uh, but we believe very critically in starting with patients who are failing. And 
When you're trying to see what a medicine can do, you try to make certain that the patients are likely to adhere, so you tend to go for different demographic groups and people who are in a good social setting and that kind of thing. So in this study, what we did was take patients who had failed at least two medicines over the prior uh, six months uh, for their hypertension and type 2 diabetes, put them back on the same medicines, uh, and then 12 weeks later saw how they did. Uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the end result was 98% of the patients on digital versions of the medicines were in complete control of their blood pressure, 51% with usual care. The adherence was good. The patchware was good, which is an important component. But the demographics were significant, 22% psychiatric comorbidities, very low income, uh, et cetera. We then moved into uh, real-world evidence. Uh, this data here at the top was presented at AHA last month. Uh, this is a real-world evidence in... Um, five different health centers for the same kind of patients. So, and we're trying to address some of the defects of a clinical tri trial, notably durability. Uh, a 12 week intervention, well, so what? If somebody has hypertension, that's chronic. That goes on for years and years. How can we be sure that we formed a habit? Do patients need to be on these expensive digital medicines forever? The answer is no. Uh, we found, as you see here, that if you enroll uh, patients who, who obviously have a range of inclusion, exclusion criteria, a broader range than in a trial, uh, we saw a decided effect over the intervention period that persisted uh, up to a year so far in, um, in follow-up, and the same held true with type 2 diabetes. Again, these are the same medicines they'd been failing before, so there was no initial change. However, this being feedback and not disease management, we didn't prescribe a particular approach to managing your patient. We simply provided the doctor and the patient with feedback, and then they could do what they needed to do. Um, we then followed the same kind of approach in hepatitis C. Uh, we first started with a two-center pilot in 28 uh, patients and enrolled primarily homeless patients, active IV drug abusers, patients with recent psychiatric admissions, all the people who would normally be excluded from therapy today, even though the, the Liver Society and others have recommended that all patients be treated. Uh, the sad fact is that many Medicaid budget directors are really worried about uh, making sure that money isn't wasted on these expensive therapies. Uh, we then followed up on that successful pilot with this data that was presented last month uh, in Boston. Uh, 18 centers, 288 patients, all of them uh, who would normally be denied uh, therapy, significant homeless and active substance abuse population. We got 99.5% uh, SVR12, and again, all the metrics of adherence are good as well. Uh, the next step right now is in a month, we're starting a value-based contract with the state Medicaid uh, uh, agency to do the same thing in their patient population. And this is something to highlight about digital. If it's really working, you should be able to make your real-world evidence line up with your business models so that you get paid when the patient does well, and that way people are getting um, uh, value for money. I move on here. This is uh, a view of what you can do with real-time data from a dashboard perspective. Uh, this is pooled data from several ongoing studies in HIV and PrEP, uh, many funded by the NIH. Uh, you can see a wealth of data showing the number of patients enrolled, uh, average adherence to medicines. The aggregate adherence is quite high, but as Bernard was explaining before, that can hide a multitude of individual variations in terms of patients. Uh, something to focus on is uh, if you look at the middle lower graph, uh, this helps to improve labor productivity because what we find is that clinical pharmacists and physicians can do a better job when they can drill down on individuals who are having problems because while our average adherence here is quite high, you can see in that scatter diagram on the lower level in the middle, there are some individuals, about 10 or 12, who are having subpar adherence. And if you drill into that and look at their pattern, you now can have a directed, valuable conversation with that patient and, and not really bother the patients who are already doing well uh, on their own without you. And then uh, I, I'll leave you with this final thing. These products don't work if patients don't like them. And again, remember that these patients and these interventions, this is not you. These are people who are very different from either a healthy 20-something reporter who is uh, looking at this kind of thing or for many people in the medical world or PhDs in Palo Alto who have a very stable family situation and high income. These are people who are failing in the current situation right now. They often feel lost. They don't really remember or understand what the doctors and nurses are trying to tell them. They really benefit from this kind of feedback and they really appreciate it. So we have very high scores and we see this across these kinds of studies because if you design this the right way and you use it uh, with the right people, uh, you, you get better results and people like it. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. All right. 
Um, let's uh, give a round of applause to our panelists. So um, just some parting comments and then we can open up for discussion. So some general thoughts based upon the speakers that I just want to highlight. Um, I think one thing we need to do is understand the difference between statistically meaningful and clinically meaningful. And I don't think we have a good understanding of what clinical meaningfulness may be. And that's something that we need to. And it may re be relevant for different conditions, but uh, that also relates to power. So I think the dirty little secret is, is that we calculate power and then we do our study, and uh, the study is conducted over the next five years based upon assumptions on what those power calculations are. And we don't go back and check those power calculations rarely, or we don't adjust them in real time. And so that's something that we should be thinking about um, because it's, in some ways, it's a little bit of a guessing game. I do want to emphasize implementation science. So we've alluded to this, and this is not effectiveness. Implementation science is a science. Uh, NHLBI has funded uh, K-12 training grants, so we have fortunate to have one of those. And really focusing on how do you translate F effectiveness into the real world? And things like thinking about feasibility, applicability, penetration. So it's not just simply what the clinical outcome is. And the questions aren't yes or no, does it work? The questions that we're asking actually are where does it work and why? What are the contexts? And it changes the dialogue and the conversation in some ways. So it's not to say it's a dichotomy between an effectiveness and implementation science. What I would argue is implementation science has to be part of any trial. And so the way to envision this is how many of you who have ever done research would involve the statistician at the back end of your study, once all the data is collected, and ask them to go and do the analyses? It doesn't work. You have to have the statistician involved from the very beginning to help collect the data. What is it? How is it being collected? Is it appropriate being collected? Is it clean? Is it uh, usable? Health economics. It's very difficult to have the health economist at the very end without any input on how the study is developed and answered. So I would argue that as we really want to think about from a scientific perspective and move more into kind of the real world situation, even if you're doing a true traditional RCT, you need to have the implementation scientists from the very beginning to the end because what's happening is, is you have the trial, you publish it, or you finish it, and then you say, here, do you want it? Will you use it? But if I'm not involved, I'm not a stakeholder, I have not provided any input into that program, I'm not likely to pick it up and use it. So I think in terms of methodologically, we need to think about how can we change that 17 year that Michael presented to something shorter. I'm not necessarily, I think we can get into specific methodology that could be uh, more than an RCT. There's some really, uh, Michael alluded to, but there's most and there's some really fascinating study designs, including step wedge design that can be done uh, and used. Um, and, you know, that comes to my next point. There, there is a perfect study. The perfect study is based upon how much money I have available. And so, you know, the reality is we have limits. So I have to usually work within those limits of what those funding mechanisms are uh, and then try to figure out what the perfect study may be. The other point I would just make is we are rewarding the easiest uh, study designs and the enrollment of individuals. There is no incentive to go out and get the hardest people um, to enroll in the study. And so the generalizability of our studies already are limited. And what I'm talking about is, you know, imagine from an external validity perspective, who are we enrolling? We are enrolling typically well-income, well-educated, high-income individuals. We are not spending the time and energy nor the funding to go out and get the harder people to reach. The mo model is incentivized not to go after those individuals. So, um, and then the last two points I would just make, stakeholder engagement. Absolutely, again, crucial throughout the whole process. How do I develop the study? How do I get the involvement of the enrollment, the inclusion criteria through the interpretation and the actually implementation of the intervention as well as to the outcome assessment? And what I mean by that is stakeholder engagement. What is that? Well, who am I enrolling? Are they involved in some way? Who's the interventionist? Who's going to use this? Am I involving somebody that's maybe from the community? There's multiple levels, but if we're not involved in the stakeholders, the reality is, is that this, again, is going to be something that's going to be published and put in a nice publication, 
and nobody's going to read it. it will, people will read it, but it will not be implemented. Okay? And the, you know, when you look at a publication in JAMA, Lancet, New England Journal, there is no way that anybody can take that paper and reproduce that study and do the same intervention. There's only 3,500 words. My protocols are two to 300 or 400 pages. There's no way that anybody could take that publication and implement that. The last point is real-time data. Well, we haven't talked too much about this, but if I'm waiting years for CMS to give me the refill data, or I'm looking to try to track down uh, data from a PBM or a pharmacy, that's not very useful. So it's really trying to think about, can we get these data quicker, more efficiently, and use those in real time? Those are, I think, some things uh, just to point out. All right, that's, I'll get it off my soapbox, but those are some points I just, uh, as a uh, participant, wanted to just uh, allude to. We have a great uh, panel here. So let me, uh, maybe for those of you who are interested, uh, start walking up to the microphone. Uh, I'm going to give a couple softballs to them. But uh, please, this is your opportunity. We, we have some time. So if you have questions, please walk up to the microphone. Um, so you all presented uh, variations on it. Uh, on, and so um, I, I guess if you had the opportunity, um, what recommendations would you make or process of how we should be thinking about conducting and analyzing and evaluating medication adherence? And so not to say that there's one solution, but is there a process or something that we're missing that from your discussions and hearing everything else so far since you're the last panel you get to kind of summarize, but any parting thoughts or suggestions that we're just really missing that really um, resonates for you? For me, it was implementation science, so I'll just open it up to you all. So maybe I'll, I'll go first. Um, so uh, I think one thing to distinguish, we've talked a, a bunch of times today, and, and other uh, participants have sort of made mention of the idea of well, we focused on people who are not adherent. We want to focus on those who are in need. Um, and that sort of concept, I think, resonates very well with me. But I, what I think what we need to distinguish is what we don't really care about is whether you're adherent today, mm -hmm. we care about whether you're going to be non-adherent tomorrow. Um, and because adherence, as we have also discussed, is dynamic. So for example, we use a method um, called trajectory modeling, where we put people into bins of behavior. And some people are, you know, when they initiate a medication, they're good uh, for a long time. Other people are good for a while and dribble away. Other people stop right away. Other people, you know, dribble away and something happens and they return to God. They're back to sort of taking their medications. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, if I'm sort of uh, recruiting a cohort of people and I sort of say that I'm going to only I'm going to enrich it with people who are not adherent today, well, some of those people will be adherent tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and so what our real sort of, uh, I think, focus as one answer to your question, Hayden, is, you know, making sure we're thoughtful about the patient population. Um, and so stuff like Josh uh, Benner was talking about this morning and using predicting future non-adherence mm -hmm. is what we are really interested in. Great. Thanks, Natish. Other thoughts? Um, I, I would just like to um, comment that the real critical thing for me is outcomes versus uh, just an adherence number. Mm -hmm. and, and then the second thing is it's very hard to standardize uh, around an adherence uh, implementation, and it's because of the different methods we're talking about. When you think about a randomized controlled trial on efficacy, you're trying to show what a drug could do, and what I think about the drug makes has nothing to do with it. But when you're then switch to trying to motivate people, well, motivating people is what, what you, will motivate you will annoy me and vice versa, and so you have to make room for all, a lot of different strategies that look more like the world of Facebook and what have you. Um, I have uh, two suggestions, and this is, again, food for thought because I'm on learning mode. Uh, the first is designing a trial for adherence when the drug is already on the market. Mm. Um, I envision a randomized trial, two arms, intervention versus no intervention, where the primary endpoint would be the adherence rate. The hypothesis would be that the intervention, the intervention is better than no intervention in terms of enhancing adherence. Um, I would imagine that the adherence rate should increase by 30% if you assume that the baseline adherence is 50% in the mm -hmm. real world and you want to go up to at least 80%. Mm -hmm. uh, how to measure the adherence is an issue. 
Um, you can do something as simple as pill count or measure the pharmacokinetics or the, the actual drug level. Um, you can do a chip tracking strategy or uh, prescription refills. Um, this would be like a pragmatic trial, and I'm always cautious when I use the word real-world trial, pragmatic trial, because I've heard so many different definitions. I don't know what they mean anymore. But I would, know, I would not monitor, meaning if you monitor the study, then it's, a, it's going to be a randomized clinical trial, and you're going to be falling into the trap of compliance rather than adherence. Mm -hmm. um, there should be no other confounders that could affect the intervention, like people who talk to each other, uh, the pharmacy calling the uh, patient to take their drug when the intervention is not that. Uh, the intervention should be affordable. Um, you can't have, um, can't dangle a nice strategy and then not have them have that available to them in the real world. The data should meet the evidentiary standard uh, pursuant to the Code of Federal Regulations. You know, in other words, the trial has to be maybe less rigorous, but it can't be completely sloppy. Um, the strengths and weaknesses of such an intervention, um, it, it is a randomized trial. And there's one thing I found out in my own research. Patient engagement is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. When you look, when you recruit patients who are li liable not to be adherent, like the, what I call the enrichment uh, strategy, patients who are li likely not to be adherent, you randomize them, you recruit them, they're likely to be adherent. I think you just made that comment a few seconds ago. The weakness of this is any trial that you have, there is always an element of compliance. In other words, just by virtue of being in the trial, you run the risk of not measuring real adherence in the real world. Now, the second trial design, and I apologize for belaboring this, this is for a drug that's not in the market, like a new chemical entity. So you want to have an adherence claim in addition to efficacy. You have drug versus control versus drug, three arms. Drug versus control, it's a standard randomized trial, and I'm going to ask Dr. Temple to comment on this. The third arm is drug in the real-world setting. So the difference is you have your standard monitoring between drug and control, but at that third arm, you do real-world sort of things, and you look at the difference between the efficacy in the drug arm that there was no it wasn't part of the RCT, but more like real-world versus the efficacy in the RCT arm. And in the event that you see a disparate result, the trial, the drug was efficacious in the arm where you did actual monitoring and good compliance, but in the real world where you didn't really monitor and you basically didn't do much to enforce your protocol, you find a very low adherence rate, then what do you do? Do we approve the drug based on its efficacy, or do we approve it with a adherence risk mitigation strategy, so to speak? So essentially, those are my points. So just to build on that, one, one issue that I think fundamentally we need to maybe think a little bit about is when we talk about RCT on the individual level, clearly we have to consent, right, which changes the whole dynamic of who's in the study. Could you envision a cluster randomized trial where so a clinic is randomized and it's part of QI and there's no direct enrollment and consenting of the individual? Um, obviously, IRB central in, in this, but it's part of usual care, so this issue of the monitoring and all, but that may also, would that increase the generalizability, and do you see that that's an acceptable way of perhaps addressing or thinking about it? Well, with the trials that I just described, where there's drug versus control in a cluster, in a cluster format, where you might not need informed consent, there will be a bunch of sites where you give the control that's already out there and that's not going to look at adherence to the drug. It'll look at adherence to the control. So I'm just speaking off the top of my head. I, uh, same I here. Same I here. haven't <laughs> thought about this. But if you want to look at a adherence to a drug and use a cluster design where informed consent may not be necessary, that drug should be on the market. Absolutely. And it should be used routinely. Absolutely. And so maybe in that respect, you might consider you don't really need to consent the patient if there's no difference between the trial versus their standard of care. Right. They're already on the medication. Now you're just adding that. Yeah. Natish, what were you going to add? You know, I was just going to add that, so, you know, the trials we run rarely get patient-level yeah. consent. Um, and, uh, and that's not because we're sort of uh, nasty or evil researchers. <laughs> it's because we often make the case that uh, this is minimal risk research. Right. 
and it would be, you know, to use the sort of federal standard, impracticable to get consent. It basically undermines the intervention under study. If I have to consent the control group um, and, consen and, and consent all of the intervention group, then I, I end up with an efficacy study, yeah. um, when, which is exactly, of course, the case that we're making. Now, to be honest, you're probably one of the few that are doing studies with 10, 20, 30,000 people, so, but I, I think that's something for us to think of as well. Uh, Dr. Temple, what would you like to share with us? <coughs> well, maybe introduce yourself since oh, everybody Bob Temple knows is, who you are. Uh, from FDA. <clears throat> Only people have sort of discussed about this. I think it's a critical concept that you really want to, at least in the early studies, include people who have been having trouble adhering, uh, yeah, what, what someone else referred to as an enrichment design. Uh, in some of the early uh, discussions, there were cases where compliance was like at 80, 90 percent, and of course they couldn't show anything. That's hardly surprising. So the early trials, I would think, you generally want to have people who are poor compliers. You might then expand it later to a, to a different population to learn mm -hmm. more. But that was the thing I wanted to emphasize. I, I don't. We have had a lot of discussions of cluster randomized trials, and if the intervention is part of normal behavior, you probably can uh, not get consent. But I'm not sure it's going to be so easy to get the poor compliers into a cluster randomized trial, because that usually means you're, randomi you're randomizing whole institutions. So I don't know if you can still do the enrichment uh, uh, part if you do that. So maybe I could just speak to that. Say, I'll use that same poster child example. The trial was called Stick to It, um, appropriately so. And we identified non-adherers based on claims data. Then we, cl and the, w people who were poorly controlled based on EMR metrics of disease control, we cluster randomized sites, as in clinic level, um, to receive this enhanced bundle of interventions or not. How did, how did you get all the people in the site to be poor compliers? if you randomize the whole site. Oh, so we, we identified within each of the sites, we only reached out to patients. So the analysis was and comparing the sites. targeted people in each in the control and the intervention sites. Um, so rather than the entire yeah. site. Sounds okay. Yeah, and we did the same thing in our cluster randomized uh, cardiometabolic syndrome study, I should. Great, thanks. Yeah, hi, I'm curious and intrigued by the proposition that you raised, Fred, about uh, an uh, a drug or that is currently on the market. In particular, that you would kind of, in order to control properly, you would have to make sure that they're not doing the extra stuff. And, and I'm thinking back to the GRACE study in HIV, where for so long we had very little data on female uh, participants, uh, very little data on people of color. And so the study was looking at you had to enroll a certain number of women before you could even enroll a male participant. Um, and what we found is that overall in the study, um, retention in the study was relatively low. But if you went out to the non-traditional sites that we had to expand to in order to get enough women, what you found is that they did a lot better than the traditional sites. And the reason they did is because they did the extra stuff. And one of the uh, stories that they told is that one of the uh, researchers actually went out to deliver the medicines on Christmas Eve to one of the participants. And, and so I just wonder, in those kinds of circumstances, we really want to reward those clinics that are doing more with less, because that is the real world in some way when it's done well. And yet at the same time, I totally understand the need to be controlled. So how do you, how do you work with that? Well, I can say is wow. And <laughs> the one thing that stood out to me and please forgive me for having this as the one thing that stood out, <laughs> is that when you have an intervention that permits someone to deliver the medication to the patient's home on Christmas Eve, if that becomes the intervention that caused an enhanced adherence, then somehow that should be the practice. <laughs> and that's not gonna be the practice in the real world. And so, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> um, one, one thing I just wanted to point out is one of the potentials of digital is to allow the extra stuff to happen and to be targeted effectively. Uh, the example, the hepatitis C study I showed before, that was a study design where if the patient missed their dose at 8 a.m. by noon, they'd likely get a phone call. That was the design, and that's a very unforgiving regimen. It's $500 a pill, and so they still had the opportunity to realize, oh, yeah, I forgot to take my pill, take their pill, and have very high adherence. So that was baked in. You could never just call every patient 
every day and find out what they did, but if you have the targeted information that shows that these three patients missed their dose today, well, I can call them. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up with your question. Something else caught my mind. That is, um, you went out to, for women, and what I'm going to refer to as the underrepresented populations in generalized clinical trials. Women are not generally included because they have, quote, pregnancy potential. And um, in every clinical trial that I've ever reviewed, 1% African American. And so when you go out to a population that generally is ignored, there's a good chance that they're going to be much more uh, robust in their compliance of a protocol, and hopefully that translates to greater adherence in the real world. Yeah, that I can attest to. For our population in North Carolina, we've done five trials across different conditions, and if we enroll more than 40% African American, we guarantee we'll show an effect because they're the ones who are more likely to engage. And when we plot it by race, we see whites generally stay the same. African Americans consistently do better, and that's why, for me, the uh, uh, you know, the way we structure our hypotheses is, you know, it's an aggregate, and hopefully we get enough of a certain group of individuals that's going to pull it in the right direction, but yeah. Bernard. Yes, I have a question. Uh, what I found very misleading is that we talk several times about percent adherence. You mentioned a trial should have, we should randomize, compare two groups, and have at least a 30% improvement in adherence over what time period? Because if adherence includes persistence, persistence is a time to event, uh, a 30% improvement over three months, six months, one year is totally different. So we need to specify that. And I think we heard, we, we saw a lot of improvement in percent adherence. Uh, the two last speakers you mentioned that. Uh, we had presentation before, but adherence was not defined. Was it a median? Was it a mean? because those distributions are highly skewed. So if you present a median or a mean, it will be a huge difference in percent adherence. Or was it proportion of patients who did reach 80%? So this is extremely confusing. Confusing for research, but confusing for the healthcare provider. The healthcare provider now will get a measure of adherence from Propeller, from uh, Proteus, from Ardex, from many, many, there are 3,600 apps who are defining adherence differently. And then you have a little asterisk saying, for those who are on using the app, you know, <laughs> that means they are measuring implementation. Mm -hmm. Or people who have initiated, and, and I highly recommend that when we talk about adherence and what we expect, we expect that an intervention improves initiation by 10%, implementation by 5 and persistence at one year by 10 That will be a recommendation and expectation. The number has just out, out of my head. Eh? <laughs> but, but we should say it in those words. And because an improvement of 30% adherence means, in my view, very little. So, so Fred did this off the top of his head, so, but I think, uh, which is commendable that he could do it off the top of his head, but I think, Bernard, your point, I think that anybody who's done any reviews or systematic or meta-analyses in the field know how messy this place is. And the reality is maybe one action item moving forward would be is consistently moving that you're using the same terminology so we're comparing apples to apples. It may be that you're using a different outcome, but I know what you mean and what that is. And so that may be, if anything, something that we as a field, because consist we, when we go and look at the literature, you can't review it now. You just can't because there's just too many different terminology and different um, operationalization, what a word. Um, so any last, we have John. Would you, hey, Hayden, thank you so much. I, I wanted to give you a shout out for talking about implementation, something close to my heart. My name is John Museus. I work with the Adherence Measurement Institute. And um, when you were talking about implementation, I, I, it's really just a comment, but it just had to do with the fact that when you're designing, when anyone's designing a program, whether it's for a clinical trial or uh, a commercial specialty product where you're trying to implement electronic monitoring or measurement, you typically have to go through some type of trade-off analysis as it relates to getting data real time. So, you know, typically it's like a choice of a three-legged stool. You, you get cost, you have uh, low patient burden, and um, real-time data. So you, you typically can pick two out of the three, but you can't get all three. Mm -hmm. 
But as it relates to getting data instantaneously, you know, it, it, you know, do you mean it by a day or a week? But traditionally, you don't need data instantaneously because where the power comes in with the intervention is looking at data over time, where you can see the important trends, where you can in, be very specific back to the patient. So are you having a problem with your evening dose? Do you have a problem every Thursday? Do you sleep on the weekends? I mean, what is the specific element? And then you can be very sophisticated with your intervention. And that power doesn't necessarily come through getting it real time. So just thought I'd throw that Thanks out. For and Michael, I also wanted to shout out to you for saying thank you for talking about short duration of trials where sometimes when you're trying to understand a, an intervention, you don't get to the point where somebody's wearing out. Because you know, anything with time-based reminders, you know, patients don't take their medicine on time. They take it on habit. So if, you, if you're pushing a time to them, it, it traditionally wears out. Thanks. Thanks, John. Okay, so with that, uh, many thanks for uh, the final panelists. Uh, many thanks to you all for participating and staying through the whole time. Um, so let's give the panelists a round of applause. So as they transition off, I'd like to invite John uh, Katow, uh, Deputy Director of the Office of Medical Policy Initiative from the CEDAR FDA, and Marta Vysinska uh, for closing remarks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope everyone agrees this has been an informative, engaging, and uh, very productive workshop. Uh, we started out by saying how much of a problem, how much of a public impact it, adherence, non-adherence is, and I think we've established that. Uh, I'll keep my comments at a very high level, uh, but first, uh, to be a workshop, the problems are usually complicated. I would think we all agree medication adherence is particularly complex. And similarly, the challenges are formidable, but especially cutting across so many different uh, uh, settings and stakeholders, um, we have our work cut out for us. But if I could generally use the sessions to hit some high points, we were talking about barriers in session one, and what came out, one theme was the centrality of the patient. That non-adherence affects different patients disproportionately, so there's a tension between the population level and the individual level. Uh, we want to know about race and ethnicity, but at the end of the day, any one person's non-adherence is going to be very specific, and it isn't attributable to race, per se, as we know, or ethnicity. Uh, so we should consider, uh, one way to put it is we con should consider biography as well as biology. In this era of personalized medicine, precision medicine, uh, all the omics are very appealing, and a lot of funding goes in that direction, but what we're talking about here is the understudied aspect of a person's, quote-unquote, biography. I think we should keep that in mind. Session two, a lot to talk about. Uh, certainly tools and technology, two Ts, came up early on. To that, we could add a third T, trust. Uh, perhaps this is something that needs to start at the medical education level. The FDA is uh, invested in this field, but we can't control everything, but we certainly can take stock of how that element of trust is involved in any study that might come our way, uh, since it can affect the results. Uh, perhaps more obvious would be another T, the fourth T, time. Uh, when we're talking about these trials, uh, it's not acceptable at, in terms of basic state of the science to say that, well, we did a study of adherence. One of the key features has to be the duration and how does that duration match to the condition. We didn't talk much. We don't really worry as much, say, about a seven-day course of antibiotics unless we're the ones with the infection, perhaps, uh, but that adherence is different from chronic disease. Uh, we should consider, uh, so that's the issue of durability. Uh, I did hear, I think it was in this session, but the sessions blended together, which makes sense. There is some low-hanging fruit. If we're hearing about synchronizing refills, uh, transitions of care being a problem, that was true 30 years ago when I was in training. Why is it that we're still dealing with the problem of someone being discharged, coming into the hospital, leaving the hospital? That needs attention. Uh, in terms of methods, some notes I jotted down. Well, one is we should consider conceptual models. Uh, one of which was thoroughly discussed. We should apply that as the dialogue just uh, exemplified a few minutes ago so that we just don't say, oh, it's adherence. We have to specify the question, apply it to a specific context. 
uh, we have to be clear. Uh, uh, for example, uh, again, to borrow from medicine, if we're a nephrologist, we would never be caught confusing acidosis and acidemia. So why are we not uh, similarly paying attention to keeping the difference, uh, keeping clear the difference between initiation, uh, persistence, et cetera? That's one thing that we should do. And what lessons learned? If studies are done, this has been true for clinical research for decades, right? We learn from, we stand on the shoulders of others. If something went wrong, we learn from that, a new user design in a different context. Let's start keeping track of these issues uh, that have gone awry. And perhaps we should also uh, dispel some myths. If I understand correctly with the issue of uh, forgiveness, et cetera, 80% shouldn't be tossed around as casually as we seem to toss it around. So let's do better ourselves. Session four, a lot to talk about. I'll keep my uh, comments short since I'm about halfway through the time that we're allotted here. I want to give time to Marta. But what I uh, thought some take home messages were, one, let's use the Cochrane as an example. The state of the science isn't that good. I know that's about five years old, but I don't think things have changed dramatically since then. So we should pay attention to methodologic issues. If anyone aspiring to do a study would take into account all the things they heard today, one could argue that the quality of research in, uh, in adherence, medication adherence, would go up tremendously. Uh, one might also argue that, at least early on, it, there were great suggestions, we don't have time to get into it, but maybe being agnostic to what the best study design is, is uh, arguably a good way forward. It doesn't mean to put your head in the sand and say anything goes, but rather let's not decide in advance. But some of the common themes that should be explained and, and, uh, and discussed if one's doing the study or writing it up would be who are the patients? Not only are they non-adherent or not, but upstream, who are they? Are they representative of the broad population? We talked about what the comparison arm should be and when does the intervention itself change the question that's being answered. We talked about analysis. Is intention to treat the right way to go? If it is, how are we defining intention to treat? And then outcomes. We didn't have a lot of time to get into the difference between adherence per se as an outcome. And if we say that, I have to qualify what am I talking about, uh, but or the other bin of, of clinical outcomes. And arguably, there's room for both studies to look at both outcomes. Uh, we also have device drug considerations, which we didn't get into a lot of details. Implementation science was promoted. Uh, and also ethical issues and when cluster randomized trials come up. So someone said each study is its own story. That's true, but we should learn collectively from all of these lessons. Uh, and really, I would say that uh, please stay tuned for a summary of this workshop, as well as the webinar will be available uh, for viewing. Uh, but this workshop is arguably a necessary but not a sufficient way forward. If five years from now people look back and say, well, that was nice, like some another seminar will say, do you remember five years ago, if they do, that we had the discussion, we have to do better. It's going to take collaborative effort. We will take this back to White Oak and digest it and be ready to move forward in this space. Uh, but I would just say that uh, I'll end my comments by first thanking Duke Margolis wholeheartedly for putting on such a great program. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank all the speakers, all the attendees, those viewing this on the web, thank you for your interest. And last, I want to point out, if I might sneak this in, a wonderful team in the Office of Medical Policy, it clustered at one table, please stand up real quick, uh, for helping on the FDA side. Uh, but again, the FDA is committed as part of our overall mission to improve the public health. This is such an important aspect. We're not leaving this space, and we look forward to continued communication, and in some cases, collaboration. Thank you very much. I guess what John didn't know is that I was going to do the thank you, so I'll do them uh, really quickly for the second time. No worries. I will actually have everybody's name, actually. Um, so I wanted to thank the speakers and the panelists. I also wanted to say great thanks to Hayden Bosworth for leading the um, discussions today. Thank you. So the FDA was really critical to putting this on together. Uh, wanted to uh, express uh, our gratitude to John Concato and Philip, uh, Philip uh, Budashevitz for their leadership and the rest of the team, including Quinn Tran, uh, Mignon Sly, um, Mathilda uh, Fienking, um, Stephanie Omokaro, Dorothy West, and Dad Don, and then also the FDA working group that helped put together the meeting materials. So thank you. And <laughs> And also the meeting wouldn't be, have been possible without the tireless efforts and valuable input um, of uh, the Duke Margolis team. 
Uh, I wanted to thank Adam Kretsch, Adam Aiden, uh, Isha Sharma, Haley Sullivan, Sarah Subsiri, and Elizabeth Murphy. So the print materials uh, that you've received today can also be found on the Duke Margolis website. And uh, more generally, uh, you can stay connected with us either through our website or through the social media accounts on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter. And thank you again, safe travels, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.